This is Audible. The Last Resort, Adrian's March, Part 2, Adrian's Undead Diary, Book 10. Written by Chris Philbrook. Narrated by James Anderson Foster. December 2013. December 3rd, 2013. I am a weary man. I thought the meeting with the NVC people would bolster my mood, but it didn't. I don't know what could have raised my spirits today after our funeral service for Angela yesterday and the setback Annie experienced. I don't know why Angela's death is hitting me so hard. She and I rarely spent time together at length, and I wouldn't describe her as a close friend, but still, I'm just gutted right now. I think it's Danny and seeing the effect her death had on him. Amanda, too, I suppose. Most of our losses during the time of the undead came right in front of the people who would have been told after the fact. We watched our loved ones die. There was no knock on the door and bad news session that followed a death. If there were any, they were few and far between. I don't know. We're still cremating people as a matter of tradition. We build a Viking funeral pyre and rest the deceased on top of it. We gather, say a few kind words usually, and then we send them off to the great afterlife riding the flames we set. It's a different experience now when someone dies versus before 2010. Back then, we had no idea there was an afterlife. No idea there really was a god, such as it is. And funerals existed to comfort the living, a ritual of grief. Something Michelle has studied at length in her time abroad. She can go on for days about how different cultures deal with grief. Amanda and Michelle spoke at Angela's service in the falling snow yesterday with the entirety of Bastion watching. I think we spared only the guards in the towers and the men and women at the gates. Kevin took one of those jobs. I don't think he could bear to watch the service. I don't think he could bear to watch Danny or Amanda cry. He's got a horse in the family race now. Amanda spoke of how amazing her sister was, how smart, strong, resilient, kind, and thoughtful she was, and everyone cried. I wept. She told us about how they both fell off their bikes when they were about ten years old and how she couldn't walk home, so... Angela carried her, carried her with her own skinned knees and tear-streaked face, and then patched her up when they got back. That's a lot of what Angela was about, to think she was that person so long ago and remained as that person right to the end, right to her end. Michelle spoke next, and she said beautiful things. She always says such beautiful things. I don't know what I did to deserve her. She talked of the great services we perform for one another for the sake of love and humanity. She talked of all the things that Angela did during the time since the end began. I don't know how she learned about all of it. She had to have talked to people and found it all out to speak so eloquently and specifically. Michelle talked about how we know that there is another side and that there is some place or some kind of existence to go to and how Angela persists on, though not physically beside us as she had. She gave Danny and Amanda peace, I think, for a time, for now. Loss is like a boomerang, though. Just when you think you've thrown it off for good, it fucking comes right back and hits you in the softest of spots. The faces of the people, man, the faces. I could feel what they felt. The red eyes, the tears, the handkerchiefs wiping, the running noses, the fierce, long hugs, and the glances of lovers that suddenly realize that what they have isn't forever, no matter how hard they love one another. The pain everyone suffered yesterday was real. I knew then that it would be so much worse if we faced off against the NVC. I kept coming back to that thought the whole time, all day. The idea that dozens of us would die or be maimed in a fight against them. A fight we would be hard-pressed to win, I might add, meaning all those deaths and injuries would be, could be, for naught. We could be wiped out entirely, leaving nothing but bloodstains and lost hope behind. 
and for what? What would that battle achieve for us, for the world moving forward? Most people don't have the stomach for a big fight. I see that now. I physically see it. We might have mustered the will for a battle six months ago, but we can't today. Won't, maybe. That fire in the pit of our stomachs has smoldered to nothing more than ash, and now all we want is safety, fat babies, and full bellies. No one wants anyone to die. But life somehow manages to move on, sort of. On the way to the factory today, we left Bastion in a larger, more intimidating convoy. Instead of two pickup trucks, we went out with two Humvees and the HEMTT. Full crew, including people in the turrets with the saws at all times. Cold be damned. We were not going to be popped like last time and lose a crew member without striking back hard and fast. We don't want to go looking for fights, but we want to be able to end them if we happen into one. My people were more nervous than I'd seen in a long time, but they came with and did their jobs. The NVC people were waiting for us at the factory. Like us, they had come in a heavier set with two of their APCs and a deuce-and-a-half truck. We hadn't seen the truck yet, so that adds another military vehicle to their capability. One more problem to solve in a fight. They had 25 infantry spread out amongst all their vehicles. Anyway, Colonel Thorpe stood in the inch or two of snow we had with a laughing Hector, and the two seemed to be getting along well. With Thorpe were two other uniformed officers, one male, one female. Thorpe introduced them to me as Major Tina Ackworth, military surgeon and their chief doctor, and Captain Roberto Vega, promoted unit lieutenant from before that day. Tina hadn't started at all as a member of the Guard. She'd been a doctor at Brockton, Massachusetts Hospital, and managed to link up with them before they left for Calendar Mountain. During regular times, military doctors are all officers, so she earned a battlefield commission and got her rank and a uniform that's one size too big. Roberto is a dark-skinned native Puerto Rican who was in the unit before it all went down. Strong Spanish accent, pockmarked face from adolescent acne, and a good sense of humor. He and Hector seemed to get along like wildfire in Spanish, which I do not speak. Shitface McDick for brains with his silly winter hat wasn't present. I liked that. The three officers were part of the nine-member council of the Northern Valley Cooperative. The nine members, all military officers, which I didn't like, vote on matters pertaining to their territory and populace. They each attempt to represent a different aspect of the community. Tina, for example, votes based on the medical needs and health requirements of the people. Thorpe is their resident diplomat, and he votes on matters of social engagement. Others vote as they see fit, based on whatever their responsibilities are, and no member carries more weight than another, regardless of what their rank actually is. Sitting over it all is a nebulous character named General Tim Mizaki. Not Miyazaki, which would have instantly made me think he was this awesome dude who was related to the awesome dude who made cool anime movies. Mizaki is actually Air Force, not Army or Guard, but he happens to be the ranking guy, so he's in charge. He was vacationing out this way with his family that summer and hasn't been home since. He's originally from Seattle. Not much else came my way about him other than the generic kind of stuff military dudes say about their higher-ranking military dudes. Well, specifically, what officers say about their higher-ops. Non-coms shit all over their officers at every given opportunity and seek out opportunities like it's their day job. Officers say lots of nice things because they have to, when they have to. Hard to gauge whether or not Mizaki is a POS or not. We'll get there eventually. Patrick and Kevin got along as you'd expect, and the overall mood of the meet was good. Our guys mingled with their guys, everyone seemed pleasant, and they even brought us a few gifts to show us goodwill. Thorpe said they would have brought us fresh food from their harvest, but he didn't want us to think that they might have poisoned it or anything, so he brought about fifty cans of decent food. Beans, corn, green beans, ghetto regular, not premium French style. One can of brown bread and a few little containers of spices and seasonings. He also brought a few packs of cigarettes and a five-gallon drum of their biodiesel for us to play around with. 
Blake's in the garage right now fooling with it like a mad scientist. Not that we'll have biodiesel ever. I accepted their gifts happily and apologized for not bringing something of our own. I told them next time I'd bring a jar or two of honey, which got them pretty stoked. They don't have any hives, and that single mention turned the entire conversation onto how can we trade for a hive or two. They didn't think about asking for a keeper, which I got a laugh out of later on with Ollie. If they think they're getting Ollie and Melissa off of us to tend bees, that's worth going to war for. I'll flatten a convent if anything happens to Ollie or Melissa. So we parted as the sun started to dip low and the clouds turned dark to the west. We managed to beat the snow by ten minutes when we arrived here, and it's coming down thick as porridge right now. Two inches already, and no sign of it letting up. Makes me wish for a weatherman. Not that they were all that accurate to begin with. So we are meeting them again on December 7th, and the plan is to join up at the factory and drive north for a visit to Calendar Mountain. I got my wish. The next couple of days we're meeting to plan on who to bring and how to go about it. They could make a high-value snatch on me while I'm there. Hell, if they grabbed Kevin or Michelle or either of our PJs, we'd be up Shit's Creek, so we have to be careful in the event that they try something fishy with us. I also need to bring people that represent a cross-section of our population so as to show my people I want their genuine opinions. I also need photographic memories to draw up maps after the fact, and people who can throw mad lead for me if they try any funny stuff. I figure I can fill that shopping list with less than twenty people, right? I'm watching you, Jinx Fairy. I'm watching you. Not much else coming up soon. We're heading there in four days, then we'll have until the twentieth for our next Maria meeting. Our task here at Bastion is to wrap everything up for the winter that's happening outside. The last of the harvest has to be done, if it hasn't already. Ollie's on top of that shit like stink under my balls. And we need to get chains on tires, plows on trucks, and get the snowmobiles up and running. Most of that list of shit to do falls to Martin and Blake. They're never bored here. Abby just tapped on the door of Michelle and I's bedroom, she asked me if I'd be willing to sit down for a talk about the meeting today and the fire at the biodiesel house for her newsletter. More on the fire convo in a bit. I told her I would. That made her happy. I got to kiss little Gavin on the forehead, and that made me happier. Babies are definitely a mood improver, when they're not screaming like a tornado siren in the middle of a baby feces tornado. Abby is still acting different around me. When she talks to me, it's almost like she's always bothering me or distracting me from doing something more important than talking to her. Like she's a, a burden on me. Strange. Oh, I forgot Annie's biodiesel system experienced its first live test, and it failed hard. Like, failed with fire and smoke. I don't know what went wrong, but it took three fire extinguishers to put it out, and set back our fuel production indefinitely. She said she'd need new parts and months of work to rebuild it. She's heartbroken. Poor woman feels like she's let us down because it didn't work. She's in the fight still, though, and we'll get there. There's no rush, and she has plenty of time. Michelle has just set up some board game called Small World. She's been playing with the kids at school during the day and has become obsessed with it. I guess you use a fake fantasy map to build your fake fantasy civilization doing fake war. She's convinced I'll love it. She isn't wrong about much. I'm gonna grab a big fat cup of water and join her for a round of nerdery. I think that'll complete my mood transition from melancholy to positive. Worst case, I let her steamroll me and make the play for pity sex. Adrian Steve Goes to the City, June 2010 Steve's lunch boiled on the electric stove in the kitchen. A box of macaroni roiled in the hot water as the milk and butter sat waiting on the counter. Optional slices of American cheese were stacked on top of each other beside the milk. The discarded box had fallen off the heaped trash and sat on the floor. Steve stroked the stubble on his chin and watched out the big window of his front room, 
as the chaos unfolded in the parking lot of his apartment complex. Paula, in 2B across the lot, had just thundered her way out the front door of her building with both her little shits tucked under her arms. The bratty boy kicked and screamed the whole way, but the kind and quiet little girl hung limp, watching her panic-stricken mother deal with her brother and whatever it was that caused the panic. Paula threw the boy in the back seat of her Ultima as she sat the girl down on her feet. The mother punted the duty of buckling the boy to the daughter, and she dashed back up the few steps and into the center door of her apartment building. Well, shit, Paula, what's got her feathers all ruffled? Steve muttered to the spider plant hanging beside the window. He walked over to the window that flanked the central window and lifted the bottom up. He leaned over and pressed his face against the screen. When Paula appeared, he yelled, Hey, Paula, everything okay? She stopped, overstuffed backpacks and suitcases swinging in her hands like a set of idiot's pendulums, counting off moronic moments. She looked around for the source of his voice. It's Steve in 1C, up over here. Are you cool? You need a hand or something? Jesus, Steve, get the fuck out of here. Get busy. The world is ending. She resumed walking to the trunk of her car. She dropped the idiot bags and went into her jeans pocket for the keys. World ending? I just woke up, dude. What are you talking about? Zombies, dude. They're in the city. People are dying and coming back to life, she said, tossing the baggage in the trunk on top of the flat spare tire. For real? Like in the movies? She nodded as she slammed the trunk shut. Are they eating people too? Is it viral? Did a satellite fall from orbit? Do you have to hit him in the head, or can you just shoot him again? What am I dealing with here? I don't know if it's viral, and I haven't heard anything about a satellite. They're only overseas so far, I think, but it's getting worse, and the news is saying it's happening here now. I ain't sitting around and waiting for it to get worse. Tom's mom and dad got a home up north near Calendar Mountain, and we're locking up tight. I'm meeting him there. He at work? Yeah, the foreman is sending everyone home for the day and shutting the work site down. What a nice guy, she mused, pulling the driver's door open. Steve, be careful. Don't smoke too much weed. Stay sharp. This is scary stuff. Aim for the head. Stop yelling at your sister. Okay, Paula. You tell Tom I said what's up, okay? I will. Get a gun, Steve. I don't need one. I have crazy skills with the bow staff. I bet you do. Paula sat down in the car and started it and drove away with her demon boy and angel girl. Steve shut the window and returned to the kitchen to drain his overcooked pasta. He stepped on the empty box on the way. The more I think about it, Steve said to his hanging spider plant as he sat down his colorful glass pipe, the better this is for me. The plant said nothing in return. Steve picked up his other bowl, the one half-filled with macaroni and cheese, and scooped up a spoon of lunch. The pasta and powdered white cheddar was thick like glue. It had sat on the coffee table for hours now. I don't have to work that shit third shift job at the school anymore. That's good. I mean, Adrian's cool, but I need to make a better life for me and you. Again, the spider plant kept its counsel. I mean, I work hard to maintain this lifestyle, and man, I don't have shit. I got a car payment on a Diamante that needs a tie rod, and new tires, and an apartment I don't own, school loans I can't afford, and weed still isn't legal. The plant moved slightly, but... That might have been Steve's imagination. Hell, even my parents have it better than me, and they drive rusty pickups and buy generic pasta sauce. I don't have a fucking girlfriend. Steve leaned over and grabbed his laptop. He spun up a web browser and looked at the news. The sluggish internet forced him to take another hit from the pipe, but when the big news sites loaded, it wasn't good. The general public was in a spiral of panic. Grocery stores, department stores, hardware stores, any stores. All bad places to be or near. He watched looting, murder, riots, and worse, shaking his head the whole time. No one could take a fair share peacefully, and the police couldn't protect everyone from everyone. The world would end in front of the automatic doors of a retail chain. An advertisement for the newest model of four-door Mercedes-Benz slowed the load of a video, and Steve stared at the graceful black car. It took corner after corner, sleek, agile. It looked like money, like success, like freedom. 
Fuck it. Steve stood up and headed to the bedroom to pack his things. He watched the commercial on his laptop screen as he went. After pinning a handwritten note to his front door, Steve got into the Diamante that needed new tires and a tie rod and headed west towards the city. He had two backpacks filled with clothes, food, and water, and in the passenger seat next to him sat the silent yet wise spider plant. He had buckled it in. Dude, what the fuck? Steve asked yet another driver that passed a solid yellow line heading in the other direction. The maniac nearly ran him off the road into the ditch as they screamed away from the city. Not halfway there, he began passing multiple car accidents where the asshole drivers didn't make it back across the line in time. Three head-on collisions plus eight cars ran off the road into houses or trees showed him two ugly realities. The first reality was that scared people are stupid. They do stupid things, so stupid that it gets other people who are just as scared killed. The second reality was that when people died, they really were coming back to life. Steve slowed his Diamante to a crawl so he could navigate the wreckage of the accidents in the suburbs, and initially he paid attention to the debris littering the streets, but once a bloodied man wearing a torn open dress shirt revealing a steering wheel lodged in his ribs savagely attacked his window, he gave up looking at debris. He looked for the roaming and dangerous dead. Others didn't look, and he watched many of them perish on his way to the dealership. It's going to be all right, Steve said to the plant, his hands gripping the steering wheel tight. This will be under control in no time. A few days of wild, out-of-control, virus-induced violence and disaster, then everything is good. Again, the plant failed to confirm or deny Steve's assertions. Let's get that car. Stay safe here in the car, eyes and ears open. What's Adrian's thing? Head on a swivel? You got it, Chubbs McUse to be in the army. Head on a swivel. Steve took the turn at the intersection that would take him around the edge of the city towards the airport and the mall where the car dealerships were. He was thankful for the wider roads. Driving the urban bypass that skirted the city took almost 20 minutes longer than the typical 20 minutes it normally did. More accidents and actual traffic slowed him down. Steve grabbed the exit that led to the strip that had the sprawling Mall Gateway Galleria, as well as a host of other retail establishments. Beyond the mall, on a road headed away from the downtown direction, was Steve's ultimate destination. The car dealerships. Specifically, the Mercedes dealership with its sleek, agile black sedans that looked and felt like freedom. He putted along doing the speed limit, occasionally passing through an intersection while the light was red. He looked both ways, of course, then drove carefully, looking again for crossing traffic. He couldn't tell if he was giving other people permission to do it or if he was just another person who decided that traffic laws were the first to get ignored. Either way, when people slowed down and showed a modicum of intelligence and caution, he saw no accidents. He heard a few in his wake, but he didn't look in the mirror. Best if he didn't see. Steve parked his car in the dead center of the dealership's open lot. If it could be described as such, the parking lot of Murdo Mercedes-Benz was empty. The only cars left at the business were the ones with price tags in the window. No one who worked at the dealership remained. The hour had reached dinner time, and with the sun setting and city descending into chaos, some thoughtful manager had made the generous decision to send everyone home. That, or everyone said peace out and walked, Steve said as he closed the door to his car. He took a step back and opened the rear door. Before leaning into the back seat, he looked in all directions and gauged how long it'd take someone, a dead someone especially, to cross the open distance. Ten seconds, maybe five if they hustled, he said to himself. One arm went into the back seat to the floor and grabbed the aluminum baseball bat he'd grabbed from the front yard of his building. Despite being an avid snowboarder, Steve didn't do sports, but the neighbor's kids sure as shit did. He spun the bat like he knew how to kill someone with it and nearly threw it through the windshield of his own car. It clanged on the warm asphalt and let anyone in a 50-yard radius know he'd arrived. He ducked down and searched in every direction for zombies. None. He stood and walked towards the front glass facade of the building. 
Inside, he saw numerous ultra-modern glass desks, surrounded by plush leather and velour chairs. Piles of unfinished paperwork turned the transparent tables opaque. He pressed his face against the window to see inside the dark room, leaving an oily smudge where his forehead touched. Nobody. What are the odds there's an armed guard in there? I'm going with zero. No armed guard is going to be protecting some rich asshole's car dealership today. Doesn't make sense. He'd be home taking care of his own business or at the Target cleaning out the baby formula. And you know no Mercedes dealership keeps guard dogs. No way they'd let Fido piss on these rugs. Steve looked around the parking lot one more time, then turned back to the window and swung the bat. The plush chairs were very comfortable. Steve took a seat in a chair at the front of the showroom. He pulled it over from one of the glass business desks to a safe central spot. He made sure he was nowhere near the smashed window or any other entrance to the room, and he took a seat with the bat in hand. He waited ten minutes, listening to distant gunshots from stores down the road, for any zombies to wander his way or crawl out of the restroom, but nothing came. Chaos may have raged a few miles away, but no one wanted a Benz. Gotta say, I'm a little disappointed, people, Steve said as he got to his feet. These are high-quality, durable, long-lasting, and fuel-efficient automobiles. They're perfect for the apocalypse. Or at least for the post-apocalyptic survivor who wants to travel in style. At the very least, they're perfect for me. He spun his bat again and headed back towards the business office. He passed into the small area at the back of the sales floor that was divided up by chest-high cubicles. He flicked the lights on and searched. Keys. Where are the keys kept in this place? He pulled out desk drawer after desk drawer but found nothing. He migrated over to another office and searched it. He then searched a third office and hit pay dirt. Recessed on the back wall was a locked case covered in steel grate and inside were several dozen virgin Mercedes-Benz keys. Yeah, bitch, give me that, Steve said. He sat the aluminum bat on the desk and grabbed the handle of the storage case. It refused to budge. He leaned on it hard, and his 160 pounds did nothing to move it. He picked up the bat and swung it at the handle. Other than a loud metallic clang, the hit did nothing to the handle or the grate. He swung a second time, then a third. His bat had dented, but the grate and handle were still pristine. Cunt. Steve looked around the room once more, looking for a key that'd get him inside to the other keys. He searched the desk drawers for the magical key and found paper clips and a letter opener. He tried to pry the door open with the letter opener and snapped the fragile miniature sword in half. Time for a crowbar, or an impact driver. Where's the service department? Four doors later, Steve found the hallway that led to the mechanic's inner sanctum. Down an office hallway and rows of taupe filing cabinets, Steve found a door marked with two placards. One said, Employees Only, and the other said, Heavy Equipment in Use. After thinking about his dick and chuckling, Steve pulled the handle and walked into the cavernous garage. The lights were turned off, save for one round fluorescent overhead. He was greeted by an ear-ringing metal bang off the heavy door he just walked through. Something heavy and made of steel hit the concrete floor near his vans, and he ducked. What the fuck, dude? he yelled out. Toby is in here. He's dead. Careful, a female voice yelled out. Steve's blood went to ice, and his asshole contracted. He gripped his bat with both hands and looked around the garage. He scanned under the few cars on lifts and over and around the toolboxes and saw nothing. No dead people, no living women. Where the fuck are you? Where the fuck is dead Toby? Up over here. Toby's beneath me, but he's heading towards you, the female said. Light switch is on the wall behind you. He turned and looked at the wall. He smacked the white plastic square upward and the other lights hanging from the ceiling flared to life. Steve then looked over and up as instructed. Sitting ten feet up on the hood of one of the cars on a hydraulic lift was a female mechanic. She wore coveralls and had grease and blood smeared head to toe. Her hair was tucked up in a bun and was as red as a plum tomato. The slim and short girl waved at Steve, then 
pointed down at the floor of the garage. Dead Toby Kane. Like plum tomato hair girl, Toby had been a mechanic. He wore the same work clothes she did and had a bloody name tag that probably said Toby, though Steve couldn't read it across the room. Toby had one arm left. The other mangled limb hung from his shoulder, but could have been a sleeve filled with hamburger. The shredded flesh and fabric swung like Paula's bags, limp and useless. He trailed skids of thick blood where he dragged his feet. His pale eyes had fixed on Steve, though they looked through his skin to the flesh just as much as at him. It wasn't until the monster that Toby had become snarled and lifted his one good arm up that Steve knew he was in danger. Toby would try and kill him if Steve let him get close enough. Hit him in the head, she yelled. That usually works in the movies. I know, I just... I ain't never hit a person in the head with a bat before, Steve said, standing straight and adjusting his grip on the bat. I'm fucking nervous. Have you hit anyone in the head with something else? Do you need a wrench or a pry bar? Look around, find something you're comfortable with, she suggested. Steve looked up at her and laughed. Toby continued to cross the center of the garage in his direction. The sound of the girl's voice did nothing to distract the zombie. All that mattered to it was Steve, and Steve infuriated the dead man. It staggered forward, each step coming a little faster than the last. Yell at him, Steve said to the woman on the elevated car. Roar, she yelled half-heartedly, adding a wave of her hands. The zombie almost looked back, but did stop its forward progress for a second. He can't see you. Yell louder. Roar, she screamed and added the wave again. Toby stopped, double dead in his tracks, and turned to face the screen. Emboldened, Steve pounced. Using all the strength he could muster, he took three steps forward and swung the bat. His aim was true, and he put the barrel of the bat right on the side of poor dead Toby's ear. Unlike every other time he'd hit something with the bat, this impact sounded wet and non-metallic. Toby staggered several feet to the side and bumped into a red metal tool chest on wheels. His weight pushed the object away on squeaky wheels, but bludgeoned dead Toby didn't go down. He turned and, with great physical effort, faced Steve. His lips pulled back reflexively and bared bloody teeth. He moved toward Steve once more. Steve lifted the bat over his head and smashed it downward on the crown of Toby's head. The blow sent the zombie down to its knees, hard onto the oil-stained concrete. The sound of kneecaps popping in half echoed in the large room. Dead Toby looked up at Steve, one eye socket dislodged from its normal location in his skull, sitting lower than the other. A dent was apparent in the top of his head below his bloody nest of brown hair. He didn't bleed. Steve swung the bat down again and connected with dead Toby's head flush in the dent. This time the skull gave way and the bat found the soft brain beneath. Toby let out a strange death rattle from the bowels of his lungs and went to the floor beside his cracked kneecaps. Steve had killed him. Fuck yeah, man. Nice job. You totally saved my ass, the woman on top of the car said. She went to the side of the car and began to climb down using the door's interior for handholds. Steve went to her and helped her down. You crawled up there to get away from him? Climbed. You crawl under things, climb on top of them, she said with a wink. Whatever, nice job. How'd he die? Got his arm sheared off by a lathe. Sleeve got caught, I bet. We put a tourniquet on him, but it wasn't enough. No ambulance came. He came too after he bled out and started chasing us around the garage. The boss locked the door after he thought we were all out, but I wasn't. I had to climb up top to stay alive. Fuckers left me alone with him. He couldn't have come at a better time. She gave him an impulsive hug, then pulled away, blushing red like her hair. Hey, it's cool. Doing my part, Steve said, blushing as well. What are you doing here, anyway? No offense, but you don't look quite like one of our customers. Plus, it's today, she said. Yeah, I came to steal a car. Seemed like the thing to do with zombies being real and all. No shit? Yeah, I saw an ad for one of the new Benz sedans and figured, if the world was ending, I should joyride in style. I was no shitting the zombie thing, but I like the way you think, stranger, she said. Plus, you swing a mean bat. Or Toby. 
Yeah, that's a bitch. Poor Toby. They stood there long enough to make the situation more awkward than it had any right to be. Steve looked around, then at his feet, then flicked some of poor dead Toby off the bat onto the floor. The girl from the top of the car coughed a few times, looked at the ceiling, and wiped some of Toby's blood off her hands onto her coveralls. She obscured her name tag. Um, what's your name? Steve asked. Gina. I'm Gina. She stuck a hand out. Steve shook it. She had small hands, but a firm handshake. I'm Steve. It's nice to meet you. Can you, uh, do you know what you're doing? Got a family to get to, uh, a boyfriend? Got a plan? Y you need a ride? She laughed. No, my family is all out of state. I don't know what to do. Uh, a boyfriend or a girlfriend? You know, I'm a modern guy. I, I can get behind that. She laughed again. No, no boy or girlfriend. Meeting men isn't something I'm good at. Guys are often intimidated by a girl who can shoot a gun and change her own oil. Dude, I think that's hot as hell. You're badass. I'd meet you any day. She looked him up and down and grinned. I accept your date offer. What? I didn't... Oh, I get it. Cool shit. You want to steal a Benz? I can't get into the key cage. Fucking thing's locked up tight as hell. Yeah, we'd need a tow truck and a chain to get into Don's key cage. Fuck that. Let's take the BMW. BMW? Why? Steve looked around, confused. We just took a year-old BMW in trade. I did the intake on it. It's pristine. Fine like wine. Keys are on the service desk right over there. Just as nice as any of our inventory. But I came here for a Benz, Steve said, disappointed. But you're gonna leave here with a BMW and a sassy redhead. I'd say you're ahead. All right, but we gotta get my spider plant out of my car out front. You brought your plant? She asked him. Yeah, his name's George. He's been a good friend. You smoke a lot of weed, don't you? You know, I've been told I should cut back. I'm thinking about it. Cut back tomorrow. I hope you got some in your car. It's been that kind of day. You know it. She laughed. Cool, cool. Hey, are there a lot of zombies out there? How bad are we talking about? Are they runners or shamblers? Steve sighed. I mean, it ain't good. People driving like dipsticks and crashing, no cops or paramedics around. Looting and fighting, people getting killed over bottled water. I don't know how it spreads, but it's spreading. We'll have to be careful. Oh, they're shamblers so far. All right, go get your plant, bring your bat, grab a few bags of popcorn from the break room, and then maybe we'll find some beer and figure this all out. All right, Gina. All right, Steve. Steve went to get his spider plant and some popcorn. He smiled the whole way and felt awfully free. December 4th, 2013 Short moment here, but I just met with Abby. She's still being weird, and I don't like it. We met over one of our few remaining cups of coffee in the hydroponics gardens. I needed some greenery read life in my life, and I wanted to say hi to my sister Becca. Becca's been working hard with her boyfriend in the garden, keeping us as buried as they can bury us in fresh produce. Right now, they're working hard on tomatoes, cucumbers, peas, and turnips, as well as strawberries and raspberries. Winter should yield us a delicious little dinner plate. I should also add that we have a reasonable garden for marijuana. Medicinally, it's very useful for many ailments, and we grow enough in the hydro system for people to use as such. We're avoiding growing so much that it becomes recreational, but time will tell on that. When I say that, I mean, eventually we'll stumble onto someone's recreational crop, and that'll be the end of us trying to pretend like we control the consumption of weed around here. Abby and I sat in what used to be the gym teacher's office, just off the main hydroponics facility. With just Becca and Ryan in the building, we left the door open, and let ourselves be distracted by the smell and sound of the water moving and the earthiness of the plants growing. All around us were three ring binders filled with notes my sister made about planting dates, germination, crop yields, and more. She's really good at this. I won't go into all the detail, but Abby took notes and asked me questions about how the main meeting went with the NVC people. She asked initially about the nuts and bolts of the exchange, 
who said what, the gifts, the plan moving forward. But then she shifted gears and started to ask me hypotheticals and how I felt and what I thought at the time. She kept asking me what I was feeling as the meeting went down. I mean, I told her the truth, and I told her how I kept thinking about Angela's death and Angela's funeral and seeing all the people broken up and hurt. I kept thinking the whole time about how dangerous these meetings really were, how much was at stake, how there's no routine meeting. She took notes the whole time, and when I asked her why she needed to know what I was thinking, she told me it had to do with making sure the people knew more than just the surface of what was done. She felt it important that they knew what I was thinking and feeling so they could empathize, so they could see the why. I guess she's right. People rarely make decisions based on rationality or logic, despite what we think we do. Most of the time, we're doing what we want to do or reacting to some kind of situation emotionally and then backfilling the logic to make us feel better. If what we do seems to come from a place of emotion rather than abstract logic, maybe people will feel better about it. Or maybe they'll get pissed no matter what, and Michelle, Kevin, and I will be lambasted in the public eye as we make mistake after mistake. Though, to be fair, Michelle is pretty well loved by the public here, and she could probably throw a baby in the river and still be welcome to dinner after. Kevin and I, not so much. Fucked if I know. All right, I've got shit to do. The interior of the barn needs work, and I'm on that crew today. I've been slacking hard with the Abbey meeting and now writing this. There's still a few hours of daylight left, and even though we're working inside the barn, the light helps us see. After the sun goes down, we're on lamps and flashlights, and we hate to expend resources to do shit when we don't have to. She also asked me what I was doing with the people who shot Angela. They're still under lock and key down at the maintenance garage. I didn't have an answer for her. I still don't. I need to talk to people to figure that out, assuming they haven't already figured it out without me. I'd rather that. I don't want more weight on me if I can avoid it, and I don't want to make an angry decision. I'm off to hammer nails, pegs, and maybe Michelle later if I'm lucky. Oh, and uh, Small World was fun. I'm going to play again tonight. I'm hoping for spirit ghouls on turn one. Adrian December 5th, 2013 This one's gonna be angry. I woke up to gunshots this morning, faint, distant little pops from a long way away. As you might expect, I launched out of bed, leaving a scared shitless Michelle behind, and immediately started to rally up our full defensive muster. I don't know where Otis was, maybe he was hiding already. Kevin called the emergency off and said I had to come down to maintenance as soon as I got dressed. I knew something bad had happened, so I did as I had to and trudged my way down through the near foot of snow that accumulated last night. Our grounds team hadn't started to plow or shovel yet. In the field near the maintenance facility, I could see a small group of men and women standing in a circle looking down at the ground. I recognized Kevin, Amanda, Eddie, and Danny Jr., and I knew what happened. On the ground, in a row, were the people we'd taken into custody the other day. The people in the group that had shot Angela. They had been executed by my people. One shot to the back of the head each. My people stood over them, and I hate to say this, but they looked satisfied. Danny Jr. more than the rest. What happened? I asked when I finally got close enough. They tried to run. We had to shoot them, Kevin offered up with zero shits. Dude, their hands are still tied behind their backs, and look at the footprints. They head to here, walking side by side. Don't fucking play with me. What happened? Amanda answered. We were taking too long to figure out what to do with them. So we had a trial, and they were found guilty. They got the death penalty. Dead eyes, Mr. Journal. Dead eyes. We felt it best that you weren't a part of the decision, Eddie said in his Texas accent. Clean conscience. Fuck you all, I said. You just fucking murdered them. Do you even know if any of them were the actual trigger puller or if they were innocent? Come on. Adrian, it doesn't matter. 
they shot at other people for no reason and killed someone. You can't, I mean, we can't just allow folks to shoot and kill for nothing. There has to be some kind of order, Kevin said. How does killing them help us? I asked him. Are we going to parade their dead bodies into town and hang them on Main Street with a sign that says, Mess with us and we'll fucking shoot you, huh? Killing them like this satisfies one thing. Your fucking thirst for vengeance. Say it. Just be honest and admit you wanted to settle the score. Don't hide behind some bullshit moral code. I wanted to kill them. Yeah. Amanda answered for him. They killed my sister and they deserved to die. How could we ever trust them? How could we set them free, Adrian? We couldn't risk them coming back here to get their own payback. It'd never be safe again with them alive. That's when Danny Jr. walked away. Which one of you killed them? Who pulled the trigger? No, don't tell me. It doesn't matter. I sighed and walked in a circle. I had to control my temper. I had to fucking set a precedent. We're the better people, remember? We're the ones who are the fucking heroes, right? We don't do this. We don't execute people. Maybe you don't, little Danny Jr. yelled out over his shoulder. But I do. Callous words from the Ginger Reaper. Not a nickname I'll use again if I can avoid it. How do I hold my friends responsible for this? How will I trust? My own people now. Adrian. December 8th, 2013. Didn't get back here until very late last night, so I'm writing this morning. Weather, coupled with driving at night, has been a real biatch, if you know what I mean. The state and local DOT have been slacking. Like I said the other day, the team we brought to Calendar Mountain had to be balanced across several facets. We met a couple of days ago in a fairly large gathering in Hall E to discuss who could go, who should go, and who had to go. That meetup was a big one, with us bringing in the Nordic twin husband and wife Agnes and Anders, plus Adam from Texas, who also lives in Spring Meadows with his son, as well as Mike and Patty representing MGR, and Hector and Celeste from the factory. Representing here, we had Michelle, Kevin, myself, Abby, Fletcher, Annie and Melissa, but not Ollie, who drew dad duty for their kids. That cross-section gave all our locations a voice. The meeting went on for hours and hours. Long story short, we decided that one person from each location should go. Mike went from MGR, Celeste from the factory, Adam from Spring Meadows. From here, we decided to send me, Kevin, and Ethan. Ethan strictly for medical emergencies, over Fletcher because Fletcher can't shoot like a special operations kid. That made six. We wanted ten bodies to fill two Humvees. To fill out the remainder of the ten, we chose the new guy David and Texas Rich, as they are new faces with fresh ideas, and they can handle themselves a bit. Rich has trigger time aplenty, and David seems like a cool cucumber to me. He also hunted back in Texas, so he can shoot straight. I think. I have a good feeling about them both. In other news, I also asked Mallory to come from MGR. Mal volunteered to cut hair while we were there, and, as we all know, people talk to their hairdressers. It's a nice gesture from us at a minimum, and if she hears anything while we were there, then that's the bonus round. One arm as it is, she's still a tough bitch. Michelle, oddly, was cool with us bringing my ex along. She doesn't do the jealousy thing. The final person we wanted to bring was someone with a good memory and trigger time. The obvious choice was girl genius Abby, but Patty, Mike, and I all immediately forbid that. New mom, and with us already sending Mike, the family had too much at risk in the visit. Mike particularly fought against her going. He's so in love with Patty and his new stepdaughter and his new grandkid. It's silly to see such a tough guy be so soft on family. I love it. I asked for Quan. Demolitions guys are pretty sharp. But Kevin maintained we'd be leaving Bastion too light on defenses and with too soft a QRF. I then mentioned Danny, but realized he's too fragile for the trip. I don't think I can trust him, especially in a tense environment. He's still only 16 or 17, I forget. 
let's not overstate how if I were to invite him on such a big trip, it could be interpreted to be me saying all is well after his execution antics. Can't have that. Then Michelle suggested little Sylvia. Sylvia was just twelve when we rescued her from the woods, and she's a year older now and no longer feral. She's as sharp as they come, wiser than most adults, and we all know she had some kind of strong connection with the other side. Yeah, she's young, but... She's a good candidate. Ultimately, she became number ten. At the last second, Annie made the case that she should go. Initially, everyone looked at her like she'd grown a ponytail out of her forehead, but when she explained that the chance of getting a look at their biodiesel facility could help our facility, we conceded, and she became passenger number eleven. Our QRF staged itself ten miles north of the factory, off the interstate, and kept a twenty-mile buffer from our six. If we called for help, they'd be a half hour away. A little silly, really, considering what they'd be walking into, but everyone agreed to be ready no matter what. We could always call a close rescue off. We left Bastion before dawn and met the NVC convoy and the rest of the group outside the factory. Thorpe was our handholder again, and with his one APC and two Humvees, he led us north under the cover of his civilian bird above. Strange little feeling that aroused, moving in Humvees behind armor with a helicopter above us, triggers some deep, dark memories of patrols in Iraq. Granted, moving through a string of abandoned American towns during the onset of winter couldn't be more different than the Middle East, but the memories still came back. They weren't all good memories, either. I could see Kevin's mind drifting off as we drove, and I knew he shared the same thoughts. You can't forget some things. Try as hard as you like, you just can't. I felt bad for Ethan and Mike who rode in the saw turrets. They froze their balls off exposed to the weather for three hours, but they wore the warmest clothes we could find, plus body armor and hats and helmets, so they survived. The urge to tell them to spray a burst at the helo as it flew over us, though. Man, we could have downed it. Maybe not for good, but long enough to raise havoc on the convoy and then get the fuck out of Dodge. The opening strike of a war. I'm glad we didn't. The approach to the NVC headquarters is east on state routes to the city, then north on the interstate, then off an exit just as the mountains begin. You cut east, then north into a steep river valley with ski resorts on both sides of the road. There's a fast-moving river on the right east side of the town road. I think it was Main Street. I'll check with the crew when we meet and debrief. We saw lights on in most of the condo complexes, lanterns, likely, though some had the crispness that comes from electricity, and that went on for miles. They've restored a lot of power to the area. That's impressive. You can see the peak of Calendar Mountain before you get there. It's taller than all the other mountains in the valley by a quarter, and is streaked with twenty-plus white smears of ski slopes. At the top you can see where the lifts terminate, and there's a four-season tower above that. The tower was lit when we left there, meaning they can probably see vehicles moving on the interstate before they get off the exit. I can't confirm that, but I have to assume it. They also have guard posts at the highway exits and along the roads leading up to the resort itself, as well as the off-site condo complexes they monitor and protect. All of the posts radioed to someone as we drove by, so they kept close watch on us. Sneaking up via the standard highway approach won't work, unless we use NVGs and drive lights out in the darkest times of night in our war wagon Prius. The resort itself is the closest thing to a perfect medieval fortress I've seen that wasn't actually a medieval fortress. It sits at the base of a 5,000-foot mountain behind a river that has a single four-lane bridge crossing it. There's a single approach to the mountain unless you hike the miles and miles over the river around and over the mountain. They've also built log walls similar to ours on the sides and top of the mountain to prevent foot traffic from undead and a hamper living encroachment. The bridge is a tactical nightmare. They had access to more building materials than we did for our bridge, and it shows. They've constructed dual pairs of two-story concrete towers on both ends of the bridge. Each of the four towers is topped by gun emplacements with multiple guards. All of the towers can see each other. The front gate on the roadside is protected by jersey barriers, so ramming it won't work. 
We need to drive carefully around the barriers to even get a straight shot at the steel doors they made. If you fuck that angle up, you'll bust the guardrail and go over into the drink. Between the two sets of towers, they have the four lanes of the bridge blocked off with jersey barriers into a zigzag approach. Standard stuff, really, but it prevents any vehicle from having a straight shot again. No ramming the inner gate down, and certainly not with how much time the four towers would have to light you up as you wound your way through their jersey barrier maze. A frontal assault would be a nightmare unless you could take out all four of the towers more or less simultaneously. We don't have enough explosives or AT-4s to do that. That also doesn't solve the riddle of the helicopter that'd be flying over you, perforating you from on high. And that's just the front door. Inside and centered to the bridge is a parking lot. Two ski lodges flank the massive parking lot, and beyond those are luxury condos, maintenance facilities, garages, multiple ski lifts, and even a gondola that heads up to the top of the mountain. In all, the facility probably covers 200 acres along the river and up the mountain. It's massive, almost as big as Alpa in territory covered, but it has far more in the way of structures. In condos alone, it has to have 200 units. By comparison, at Bastion, we have five dorms with about 20 bedrooms each. Each condo at the NVC has two to four bedrooms each. Do the math. It's a city. Thorpe pulled us into the center parking lot where they keep most of their vehicles parked, yesterday at least, and we were welcomed by a 30 or 40 person strong greeting party. I was introduced to a ton of people, but focused on just a few names and faces. Most important was General Mizaki, now to be known as King Shit of Turd Hill, North. Mizaki is Asian, as his last name might indicate, Mr. Journal. He's about 5'6", maybe 5'8", and keeps his dark hair short. He'd grown out a short beard, for the season, he said he relaxed grooming standards, and he wore his uniform a little looser than I expected him to. He looked sharp, but not like an asshole, if you know what I mean. He and I walked side by side towards the closer of the two ski lodges. He asked me what we would like to tour and assured me that the entire place was open to us. I replied by asking him where the biodiesel facility was, where they kept their ammunition, and which of the condo complexes housed the majority of their military personnel. He replied with a smile that there might be a few places that might not be the best idea for me to visit just yet. That caught a laugh out of everyone in earshot and set us off on the right foot. True to his word, he allowed us to go where we wanted, with few limits. Other than splitting off Mallory, Sylvia, and Mike to cut hair and be social, and leaving Ethan back with the vehicles in a rotation, we kept our group together to avoid being split up further and taken apart, and they allowed it. They didn't confiscate our weapons either, or ask us to observe any strange rules. We were guests, truly. I can describe a ski resort if you like. They had two full resort lodges at Calendar Mountain, massive kitchens, restaurants, bars with stages for performances, huge freezers and walk-in fridges, ski equipment and clothing stores with local kitschy shit made in China, as well as high-end Columbia and North Face gear. They have so much winter clothing in storage, it's amazing. They sent us home with ten full winter outfits for kids, three snowsuits as well, which brought me back to dark days and made my ass pucker. Michelle is still sorting the clothes out for distribution. They also have three medical clinics, each fully stocked for almost any emergency. Ski resorts were able to handle major medical incidents, and this was a big resort. Tina had refurbished and built up one clinic into a surgical suite, and they've relocated x-ray gear, same as we did. Tina talked about wanting to move an MRI unit to the resort soon. They're fully autonomous when it comes to care. They have about 3,000 residents, according to Mazaki. In the condos inside the NBC protective inner cordon, he said they have about 1,500 souls. The remainder are in the town nearby under their extended protection. These people pay Calendar Mountain and the NBC a protection fee in the form of labor or donated goods. That fee gets them exchanged food, think they bring in canned beans and swap that for canned artichokes or whatever, a share of the collective crops, it gets them medical service from Major Dr. Tina Ackworth and her team, as well as access to shared resources like tools, 
civilian vehicles, and perhaps most importantly, a steady supply of some biodiesel. Even though I didn't get access to their fuel production facility, Annie will be sad about that for weeks, I got a huge chunk of learning done to me about it. Prior to the shitstorm of zombies that circled the drain of our planet for nearly two years, Calendar Mountain Resort switched over to biodiesel. It allowed them to recycle their food waste products to a degree and gave them a reason to use some of their non-ski land. It saved them millions over the years, I bet. That ability alone is why the men and women of the now NVC took the mountain as their own. Had I been aware of the fuel facility myself, I might have fought him for it. I will not pretend to be a chemist or someone who understands the transmogrification of animal fats and vegetables into vehicle go-juice, but I did learn about the process. In layman's terms, they have a massive amount of soybeans growing. Those soybeans are mixed, scientifically, I'm assured, with animal fat products, chicken fat in their case, and after adding industrial chemicals like alcohols and stuff in a mad scientist process, I imagine lightning and bolts and necks are involved, they get biodiesel. The return isn't massive, but it's enough to make a real difference. Annie knew most of this, and she played dumb while there. Good for her. I guess any diesel engine can switch to 20% biodiesel with no modifications. Higher percentages than that require different fuel filters and hosing, as the biodiesel can break certain rubbers and plastics down. In the case of the NVC, Mizaki said all of the ski resort's diesel vehicles were altered for 100% bio, and all of their non-tank diesel rigs were too. The APCs and most of the civilian vehicles they were using were operating on the 20% mixture. Home heating oil is diesel, and apparently that can run on the 20% too, as can most generators. Some of their generators can run on 100% bio too, which explains why they have so much power at all times of the day. Enough power, in fact, that the entirety of the resort has electricity, aside from outbuildings they don't use as well as most of the buildings in the town during certain hours of the day or night. I know 20% doesn't sound like a big extension of resources, but it's huge. Big picture, it allows them to refurbish and rejuvenate older fuel as well, so they're extending the life of shit that's not burning well to boot. It's hard to put a number on that, but I can say for certain that it helps them control their AO like a boss and it helps them to offer unparalleled comfort. They have as much hot and or fresh water as they want, and it gives them the ability to travel in force at will. Did I mention they have a stable with a score of horses, plus 80 head of cattle, 60 sheep, multiple local chicken egg farms with something like 500 chickens and two dozen goats for milk and meat? To say they're ahead of us in almost every way. Uh. Mazaki eventually sat us decision-makers down after a four-hour trek around their facility. We ate in an employee break room that had been turned into an officer's mess. A nicer table had been brought in, as well as nice chairs. Cigars were on the table, as were bottles of good booze. Mazaki told us to help ourselves, and several of us did. Kevin walked out of there with a pocket full of cigars, and I know he stole more shit. Kevin likes to steal shit. It's part of his unending charm. We've been talking to some regional forces, Mazaki explained. Other groups, just like us in New York, Maryland, and elsewhere. Our radios are getting official or semi-official traffic from as far away as the Midwest. We are winning, Mr. Ring. We're doing so much better. Is there a national plan you're privy to? Rebuild? Regroup? Nothing yet. It's too fractured. Groups split on party lines or previous loyalties. It's working itself out, but it's slow. We're angling to be a part of the bigger, new United States, a decision-making entity on the world stage. We'd love to have you be a part of our family. Thank you for the offer. What would the next step be? Celeste answered him. I was pissed she spoke instead of me, but she has every right to. I need to learn to be okay with not always being in charge. Well, as a gesture of good faith, we brought you all here and gave you more or less full access. I think a basic expectation would be to tour your facility and see what assets we would be acquiring. I don't like the word acquiring, General, Kevin said back to him. 
They wouldn't be your assets to use at will. You could call on us to help with our stuff, but it's our stuff. It'll never fully be yours, neither will our people. Of course, of course, Mazaki said. I think you understand my meaning. We'd love to move forward on this. Really, I'd love to bury the hatchet on our misalignment and adopt the people we've been hearing about into our family. Look, I'll be honest. We've been dreading running into your group for some time now. Refugees from the South that have run afoul of you still have bad dreams about gunfights they had with your shooters. Your reputation is a frightening one, and that's not taking the spiritual nonsense into account. We get that a lot, I said. It's the tattoos. We also hear that this place is one step away from a Siberian gulag general. Appearances can be deceiving from afar, and rumors don't help with peacemaking. I'm glad we came, and I did like what I saw. My people need to confer in private about how to move forward, but this was a tremendous step. Give us a week to think it over? Tell you what, take until after the holidays. I don't feel the need for us to rush this in the least. I'm sure you're all getting ready for the winter and the celebrations as we are. We've already established pleasant diplomatic relations, and as the saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day. Let's plan on meeting at your factory again on, say, January 3rd of the new year. We all looked at each other and agreed that was a good idea. After eating a pretty lavish meal of lamb and fresh vegetables on Mazaki's dime, we cleared out with no escort and headed back to the factory. We stayed there for an hour to make sure we weren't being followed by ground or helicopter, and then we hoofed it back here while everyone else scattered back to their respective homes. On the ride back, Mal and Sylvia said that they learned a lot from the people who got their hair cuts. True to Mazaki's word, the people there are a bit afraid of us. Some of their soldiers are recruits that have joined since the end of the world, and they're not army regulars. Some of them have run afoul of us during our patrols, or they were within earshot when we were pounding someone to snot, and they know we're not to be fucked with. We're a small nest, but we're still hornets, I suppose. Most folks spoke well to Mallory and Sylvia of their life at Calendar Mountain, but that might mean the only people they allowed to see Mallory were plants. Who knows? North Korea is best Korea, after all. Sylvia did say that most of the people there did ask at some point about the big three, Michelle, Kevin, and me. She said most had heard of us by name and that most wanted to meet one or all of us if the opportunity arose. Dreams seemed to be how they'd heard of us. That or they'd met people who independently had dreamed of one or more of us, dead relatives and friends on the other side talking us up. Weird. So we're going to take a few days to mull this over, then do another big meeting about it for Christmas and Hanukkah to save on trips and gas, and we'll go back to them on the 3rd with an answer as to whether or not we want them to visit us. Maybe we slow roll it out and have them tour one place at a time. I don't know. I'm tired and excited and scared. Talk to you in a few, Mr. Journal. Adrian December 13th, 2003 All is well here at Bastion, Mr. Journal. We're getting ready for the Christmas and Hanukkah celebrations. I say Hanukkah with two Ks, but it might be Hanukkah with one K, and it might be Hanukkah, too. I don't get it. Eight crazy days and nights later. It doesn't help that I think we have, like, two Jews on campus. Maybe we have more, but I have no idea. I don't ask people what their religion of choice is. I judge them based on how they treat me and the ones I love. People are still down to celebrate the holiday, though, and that makes me happy. Slight disturbance in the force, though, today, putting everyone on pause. Blake and Kim had their second baby. Now Adrian Gilbert has a little sister to grow up with. So exciting. They named the little girl after Kim's missing older sister, Josephine Rose Miller. Bald as a cue ball and fat as a marshmallow. The kid kind of has old man face, though. Not a cute baby like Abby and Hal's baby, Gavin. That kid has good looks to go along with his stellar name. 
Joro, as I've decided to call her, will need to age a bit before I label her as cute. You will not hear me say these words aloud, ever. Anyway, I'm working on making Michelle a Christmas present. I'm learning how to make scrimshaw on the side. I'm trying to carve her a bookmark from a piece of antler that I've had since way back when. The straight part I've carved down into a flat blade shape to slide in between the pages, and next up is some fine scroll work and engraving. It's already pretty by my standards. I think she'll like it. She likes homemade stuff. Well, back to work, Mr. Journal. All quiet on the Western Front. Adrian December 17, 2013 Maria's people connected with us today via radio and canceled our December 20th meeting. Apparently, they're dealing with the holidays and a vicious stomach ailment that's having its way with them. People sure do get sick a lot now. We offered help, and they said thanks, but they'd be okay. We're waiting on them to schedule another meeting at their leisure. Funny, when word got around that the meet had been postponed, thank you, Abby's newsletter, the new guy David and his wife Jennifer tracked me down and expressed great worry. They said many good things about Maria's people, and I suddenly realized I never pried David for info on Maria's troop. His entire family had been inside their place, met most of their people, too, and I could have gotten some prime intelligence had I just asked them. Turns out I didn't talk to them about it, and no one else asked them either. I guess that means I trust Maria and her group? Maybe I'm just a shit strategist. Anyway, I told David if Maria's group wanted help, they could ask for what we offered them, medical assistance, if you're curious, and we'd be there for them as soon as we could. We also had to be careful not to spread disease and illness. Medical resources are limited nowadays. Winter is upon us. Snow is thick on the ground and the cold hath arrived. Fuck it in the anus. It sucks to be outside for longer than half an hour, and we have a lot of jobs that require a lot more outside time than that. Stoves are kept burning, generators purr as often as we can run them, and the kids are shoveling like the indentured servants they are. If you skip thinking too hard about it, life's pretty damn good. Adrian December 27, 2013 Merry two days after Christmas, Mr. Journal. Michelle loved her bookmark. I worked so hard on it. Scroll work, etching, staining to create depth. It's perfect. She loves sun motifs, and I based my designs on that. I'm so proud of it. I'm so happy she loved it. I also made her breakfast and coffee in bed. Sour cream pancakes, motherfucker, and let's not forget that I've been sandbagging that pound of coffee for a year, and I even stitched together a new cat toy for Otis. He's currently eating it apart, leaping and meowing like a mad cat upstairs. It's hilarious. Michelle found and made me a full iPod with all the music I love on it. She went through my music collection here on the laptop and then tracked down CDs all across campus of other stuff and loaded it all up. Must have taken forever. I've got hours and hours of new stuff to listen to. Things I never would have listened to before I'll now try while I'm working. I'm so excited. I have no idea where she found the time to do it all. She's so friggin' sneaky for such an upstanding person. She also had our tracker teams that forage in the wilds of the world find me a new pair of winter boots in my size, which is no mean feat. I take a size 13 and a half, and somehow, somewhere, they found a pair of Timberlands that fit me, my size even. I've been wearing a size 14 boot this past month, and I've got crazy blisters on my toes as a result. It's been like throwing the boot away and walking around with a shoebox strapped on. No longer. And in news that makes Adrian uncomfortable, Michelle and I received at least 30 gifts from people across campus. A ton of homemade food, pumpkin pie, blueberry pie, pecan pie, fresh cider and cider vinegar, casseroles, cookies, maple syrup, canned relish, pickles, you name it. And some clothes came our way. Really sweet. We woke up to a pile of presents just outside Hall E. Oh, and the cards. Fifty homemade cards, some in crayon from kids, others well-written by adults, others poorly written by adults. 
Bud and Donna from Texas wrote us a sweet thank you letter reminding us that because of what we did, they were able to keep loving one another. Amanda gave us a card apologizing for how she'd been since her sister passed and thanking me for taking care of her sister not only when she was alive, but after, too. The list goes on and on. Fifty cards, I shit you not. I hate the attention, but you sleep in the bed you make, cracker bits and all. Well, I came here originally to say that we meet tomorrow at the factory to discuss what our plan is for the NVC. So that's that. I'll check in after. By the way, Baby Gavin is great, and Baby Joe Rowe is too. A little cuter today. Adrian December 29th, 2013 Cutting it a little close, eh? We've got the meeting with the NVC in just, uh, five days, and we only sat down yesterday to hash out how we wanted to go. I'd say the meeting was spirited and lively, but that implies there was cordial and friendly things said. The meeting was hostile, downright angry at times, and not very conducive to diplomatic relations amongst our own people, let alone strangers. I hate to say this, but our alliance of locations fractured yesterday without doubt. I don't think it broke, but we need some supports to survive this. I don't know where those supports are going to come from. Cutting to the chase of it, our locations are of their own mind on what to do. We want our people to have an opinion, so long as it's the one I have. I'd laugh at my own joke, but seriously, I wanted everyone to do what I hoped. From furthest to closest geographically, here's the rundown. Spring Meadow is still undecided about joining up and is like 50% against letting the NVC tour their gated community. They've got it good there, and their alliance with us has been a bountiful one since the jump. Inviting a new player into our mix strikes Anders and Agnes as a bad idea. The potential resources to be gained don't outweigh the risks as they see it. The caveat is they are willing to go with the majority, so they aren't left out. Notably, Adam from Texas thinks it's a bad idea, period. Team AAA is on the fence, leaning south, away from the NVC. Right about then in the meeting, the wheels came off. Hector revealed that he made a trip north to visit the NVC with Celeste more than a week ago without telling anyone about it. When the NVC made a city patrol near the factory, they stopped by, and Roberto Vega and he made a plan for them to visit. A very animated, and I should say attacked, Hector defended his choice to go. He wasn't brought north when we went before, didn't think his opinion had been listened to adequately, and felt that his ass was on the line. The factory is the closest to the NVC of our locations, and theoretically the first to be attacked in a confrontation. He has formed a solid friendship with this Vega dude over their few meetings, and he's already made his choice. Celeste was so impressed by Thorpe and the visit north, she's already made up her mind as well. As in, regardless of what MGR, Spring Meadow, and we decide to do, the factory and all its inhabitants, supplies, and gear have decided to opt in on joining the NVC. They've already told them that when we meet on the third there, they are welcome to tour and they want paperwork ready to solidify the alliance. Needless to say, that was a fat load of shit right square on the bowl of corn chips, and it sent the whole meeting into a tizzy. I don't think I've heard that many swears in a two-hour period ever. Ever, man, and that's saying something, if you consider the people I call friends. If you overlook their ability to make a decision for themselves, their departure from our group splits us geographically. Spring Meadow is beyond the factory. Also, we installed a repeater tower for our radios there, which will fall into the hands of the NVC. Hector and Celeste assure us that they have no plan to betray us, but that was rebutted by a very pissed Patty with the question of, what will you do when and if they declare war on us? Hector said they'd abstain from any engagements, and not one of us thought that'd work. If they allied up and then didn't do what was needed when they were called on, 
They'd be treated as traitors and they'd be right in the mix as an enemy of the NVC. They picked a side and they'll have to step up for it if called on. No dice, bitches. Oddly enough, I didn't get that angry. I knew this was coming. I don't know how, but I knew it. When I saw Victor talking to Vega, I had this sick feeling in the pit of my gut that those two were going to be something. I was right. I say that knowing nothing about Vega that's negative. Thus far, he's been a legit good guy. Hasn't given me a single reason to think he's a douche other than he puts head to pillow within a mile of Captain Pasta, who I loathe. I should add that I do not believe that Pasta will redeem himself like Captain Snowpants did. Lieutenant Daniels turned out to be a stand-up guy for the Westfield people. I wish he'd survived, but he didn't. Good people tend to die nowadays at a pretty fast clip. Lots of feelings of betrayal aimed at Hector and Celeste. MGR is with Bastion, period. Mike and Patty spoke with resolute firmness on that. Everyone living in the apartment building slash fortress, as well as the homes and businesses that we've recovered at its feet the last year, are all ex-Bastionites. They live and die as we do, and just might before it's all over. Here's the kicker. We here at the Brain Trust are like 75% leaning towards allying with the NVC. Kevin's against it on principle, but Michelle and I are for. I know, right? Me for it? You want to know why? I can't stomach another war. I just can't. I don't want to risk everything we've achieved here and lose more friends and family. I know we might need to give up some autonomy, read a little autonomy, to maintain peace, and for now, for once, I'm okay with that. I've also been listening to the people here the last month, really listening. Like I said, since Angela's death, people have lost their will to fight. They want peace. No more fighting. We did enough of that when the dead were here, and we want to be done with it now that the living are left to our own devices. The NVC has been good to us, kind, calm, and reasonable at every turn, with the exception of pasta. But I think we can deal with pasta. So, what should have been a three-hour meeting turned into a six-hour meeting, and that turned into an overnight stay at the factory. Michelle and I sat on a thin mattress talking about the whole affair most of the night in the room they gave to us. Exhausting to think that hard about anything for that long. The only thing I've put more thought into was my dick as a teenager, and that didn't seem nearly as hard, pun intended. Then again, well, I'll skip the excess of dick jokes. But we emerged with a plan. On the third, we meet with the NVC, and the factory departs our family, figuratively, to join them after a tour. They go with gritted teeth, but our blessing. I say that knowing I'll have to leave Kevin behind that day, because he's itching to knock Hector's teeth down his throat, and he will if I let him get too close. That kind of Kevin is the other kind of family man some might experience. After that, we will have them tour Spring Meadow on or about the 7th. If that goes well, we'll have them tour MGR on or about the 15th. If that goes well, we'll invite them here to tour home base sometime soon after that. If nothing fishy has arisen and they're willing to entertain some kind of way to handle pasta, we're in. But, Mr. Journal, pasta has to go. I don't trust him as far as he could throw me. I don't want him near my people, and I certainly don't want to be associated with that asshat. He's poison. I'm sure that plan will get tossed out the window as events and feelings change. There are lots of moving parts to this, and the more complicated the machine, the more likely a failure in the system. <sighs> All of this is for peace. All of this is to save the lives of my friends and family. All of this is to give my people a better chance at waking up and being happy one more day, ten more days, ten more years. What would I give up to ensure that my people get that? A future. And really, are we giving anything up with this? I don't think so. At least... I think we can work a deal where we don't give anything important up. 
We just check in with another group periodically, and when and if they need help, we offer it. In return, they do the same. We get to help more people. Seems win-win. Adrian The Only Easy Day, Late September, 2010 We won't last long like this, Thomas said, his dirty lips pressed to the Afghan dirt below. Another mortar shell had just crashed into the center of the base and exploded, sending shrapnel into the air with flesh-rending anger. The base's wooden and sandbagged construction had taken a pounding in the hour the mortars had fallen, but it had protected all the souls inside thus far. Their luck couldn't withstand much more. The base had gone strangely quiet since the round exploded. Glenn looked up from the shallow depression he'd carved out of the hard-packed earth with his knife and nodded. Open for suggestions. Thomas licked his lips and immediately regretted it. The taste was foul. We need to move on those mortars. We'll never clear out these fucking undead outside unless we can stand up. The undead aren't the issue, it's these fucking mortar rounds. When we agree on that, what do you think their endgame is? The zombies will never get inside this base, even with these mortars dropping. Think they'll adjust fire and try to blast the doors open to make a hole? Glenn's mind pondered the possibilities. Thomas's mind was faster. No, they probably already tried that, or at least could have. Ellum said earlier that these pricks have been zeroed in for a long time. Thomas looked up and over to where the ramshackle base entrance was. He could see the telltale impact marks on the earth from mortar rounds that had fallen earlier in time. A week ago, maybe more. No, they tried that. They need to get that whole entrance bashed open, suicide bomber style. Glenn's color drained. A big-ass Mercedes truck right up the asses of all these corpses would be just what the ragheads needed. Fuck me. Fuck all of us. We have maybe half an hour. Thomas turned to where Staff Sergeant Ellum lay in the dirt perhaps ten paces away and just out of earshot. Ellum, are they at the walls yet? The dark-skinned Marine veteran lifted his head fearlessly, looking for the men who had previously been on watch in the towers. They were in cover, and Ellum left up, running over to the ladders. He quickly scaled half a dozen rungs and looked out over the flat terrain in front of the firebase. He slid down the railing just as a crack and a whiz sent a bullet through the space his chest had just occupied. The Marine either ignored the bullet or didn't hear it. Forty meters for the front edge, sixty for the back of the pack. Fuck! Maybe less than half an hour. How are we going to get through their shooters to set up shots on their mortars? Thomas asked Glenn. To Hollywood to suggest that we need a large distraction? Do you have any bikini-clad bimbos or a platoon of clowns we can send out the side door to draw attention? Glenn laughed at his own joke. What about calling in the Chinook to lay down some air support for us? We've got a sore bird, Tommy. They got miniguns. Thomas shook his head. We can't risk the chopper getting hit. If it goes down, we're all fucking Dunsky. Do we have any smoke? Thomas asked. Glenn shucked his rock off and fished out two smoke grenades. He sat them on the ground. Two purple, all I could get from Kandahar before we left. Supplies are running low, as you can imagine. The buzzing whistle of another incoming mortar round broke the moment, and both seals put their faces into the dirt. With another tremendous explosion, the mortar round impacted the earth inside the base's walls, rattling teeth, rib cages, and the patience of the marines. Somewhere in the base, one of the young men started to cry out for his mother. Thomas's heart skipped a few beats as he heard the Marine's friends come to his aid, calming him. There could be no panic right now. Ellum, you guys have any smoke grenades? A tire or two we could set on fire. We need cover to move on these motherfuckers. Thomas yelled as bits of dust and dirt continued to fall down. Yeah, we've got a few torn-up Humvee tires we could toss over the wall. We might have one or two smoke grenades, too. Good. Get the tires lit and tossed over the wall in the direction of the shooters that are trying to suppress us. We'll toss our smoke all over the place and try to fool them. We've got one chance at this. Let's make it count and let's do it fast. The three men got to their feet and got busy before more steel rain fell from the sky. Long strips of heavy vehicle tire were set aflame with some of the gasoline and diesel still remaining at the firebase. 
They gave off billowing streams of black, lung-putrefying smoke very quickly and were tossed over the ten-foot wall by pairs of Marines. The flapping, burning rubber flipped end over end, scattering burning motes and white smoke. They landed outside the wall and continued to burn, creating the first piece of the smoke screen the SEALs would need to make this nightmare end. It took ten seconds for the insurgents manning the mortars to answer the activity. The sixteen souls inside the base heard the round whistling in, and they scattered inside sandbag emplacements and behind as much solid material as they could find. Prayers were abundant. The mortar round exploded a few meters shorter than the previous impacts had, exploding a stack of empty wooden crates and sending shards of wood in every direction like thrown daggers. Two men screamed out in pain as their flesh succumbed to the missiles. Thomas took control and screamed orders out before anyone could think to do anything other than what he wanted and what they needed. You two, help those men. The rest of you, light the rest of the tires and get them over the fucking wall now. The two Marines that Thomas pointed to immediately went to help their brethren who had been hurt by the mortar's impact. The other warriors returned to the base of the Hesco barrier wall and got more strips of the thick rubber set aflame and thrown over the wall. They weren't getting them very far outside the wall, but they'd still serve their purpose. Glenn helped with the last scrap of burning tire, then turned to Thomas. Give it a minute or two to get smoking real good. Thomas nodded, and the two men started to strip off their body armor. Elam stood nearby, issuing some instructions to his men before he turned his attention to the seals. His confusion was clear on his face. Aren't you planning on going over the wall? Why are you taking your armor off? Glenn answered him simply. Sergeant, this is all about speed. We need to get up, get over, and get fucking moving as fast as we possibly can. Right now, that smoke is our armor. All this heavy-ass shit is just going to slow us down. We're dead if we move too slow and get shot, so we might as well move a little faster and remove the risk of being too slow. Elam shook his head at the sailor's insanity and walked away. Thomas and Glenn simply smiled at one another. War was life and death, and sometimes you had to get very close to death to ensure living. It took the warriors only a minute or two to strip down to just their basic battle dress, magazine pouches, and weapons. They were stripped bare and looked very out of place in the middle of an unfolding battle. The two men were completely comfortable. We hit the crest at full tilt. Try to get an angle on the prick on the crest that's shooting at us. I think there's just one shooter. We pop his cap, then move on the mortars. Thomas suggested the course of action as he pulled out the two smoke grenades and handed one to his best friend. Speed kills. The two men pulled the pins on the smoke grenades and went to opposite ends of the firebase. As they tossed the grenades over the wall, they simultaneously yelled, Smoke out! The dark green cylinders popped loudly as they fell down outside the base's perimeter wall, emitting a thick and bright purple smoke that obscured vision. The two seals met in the rear center of the base where Sergeant Elam awaited. Thomas spoke urgently. We're going over the east wall and heading due north as fast as we can run to cover to get an angle on the assholes suppressing us. We're dropping them and then moving on to the mortars. If we die, you radio for the Chinook and let them know what's up. Hopefully they can sort this out if we can't. Elam nodded. I'm not too worried. You guys seem like you're carrying cast iron balls. Glenn smirked. Well, I'm leaning towards aluminum right now. We gotta be light and fast. Good luck. Elam said, extending his hand to be shaken by the Navy warriors. The two men took it and shook it firmly. Let's do this, Thomas said. The two men slung their weapons over their shoulders and tightened their Nomex gloves as they climbed atop a series of crates the Marines had stacked hastily. Thomas was first to put his hands atop the Hesco wall and, with startling ease, he pulled his body up and onto the thick sand-filled wall. He sat and scoured the landscape over the smoke for the shooter's position, but laid flat and rolled to the edge of the wall quickly. If he could see over the smoke, then the shooter could see him as well. He gave the ground outside the wall a glance to ensure it was clear of threats and dropped off the side. He was alone with no wall between him and the horde for a few moments while Glenn ascended the wall and joined him. He felt oddly exposed. A second later, the men were together, their weapons were shouldered loosely, and they jogged to the edge of the base. 
Thomas spied a series of large stones that poked through the ascending earth to the culmination of the valley's low edge. To their west, through the tire smoke, tinged with the purple from their smoke grenade, they could see the dozens of undead locals as they shambled forward towards the front of the base. He wiped a thick bead of sweat from his brow and looked to Glenn. See him? Going. Glenn bolted first. Thomas watched as his legs pumped powerfully, propelling him over the rough terrain with confidence and ease. He envied his friend's two healthy legs. Thomas waited for three heartbeats to pass before he too bolted. If the shooter could see Glenn, they'd be directing their eyes at his very fast movement, buying a few seconds' distraction for the slower Thomas to get behind one of the sandy boulders and into hard cover. He went. His calf strained and squealed in pain, but he pushed through it, ignoring it, challenging it to be as strong as the rest of him. He looked forward only, searching for the person possibly shooting at him meant slowing down. He dove and rolled behind the third stone, two boulders past Glenn. He'd run perhaps a hundred meters. Anything? Thomas asked as his breath returned quickly, assessing their next move. No shots in our direction. Thomas nodded. That wasn't necessarily good news. It might just mean the shooter was waiting for them to bolt from their now obvious place of hiding. The seal rolled onto his stomach and put his M110 rifle out at the base of the rock he hid behind. There was a natural cleft in the stone that gave him just enough space to get barrel and optics through. Peering through the smoke with his enhanced scope was a challenge. The vast power of the military optics brought the billowing black and purple into his brain vibrantly. He could see beyond it, but the fire's product made seeing anything in detail impossible. He scanned left to right at the top of the ridge where he suspected the shooter to be, to no avail. He could see nothing through the scope that would give him a shot. He hoped the smoke did the same for their stalker. Let's move. I can't get any shots here. I'll go first, then you move up halfway after I get set up. Maybe you'll draw a shot and give me a location to shoot at. Glenn nodded. You got it. Thomas readied his body in a low crouch behind the boulder. He listened intently to the strangely silent situation unfolding around him. He could hear the crackle of the burning tires near the base and the oddly subdued din of dragging feet in the sand over it. It sounded like gravel being slowly rubbed on plywood. He sprang. He found the rock he was going to run to and aimed at it, legs pistoning him forward, his hurt leg still complaining loudly. No more than twenty meters into his sprint, he heard the gun report of the shooter and felt the round rip through the air a few feet in front of his chest. The shooter had him in their sights. Thomas pushed harder. His leg transitioned from complaining loudly to screaming for mercy, but he ignored it. There would be far worse to bear should he fail to get to cover before the shooter got their mark on him. Thomas leapt over a series of stones the size of soccer balls and heard another shot. This one buzzed close enough for his chest to vibrate, and he knew he had seconds before the next round ripped through his unarmed torso. He landed on the ground and pushed even harder, reaching down into a reservoir of adrenaline reserved only for the worst of the worst. He covered another ten meters and launched his body into a flat-out dive to get into cover behind the stone just as a third shot ripped the sky open. Thomas felt the round impact his body, sending him into a barrel roll as he flew through the air into cover. Instead of landing on his stomach, he crashed to the ground on his back, the air in his lungs violently ejected. Thomas focused on his diaphragm and empty lungs and fought panic. He kept his body flat on the ground so as not to get shot again and felt his stomach where the round had hit him. He expected hot, wet blood and the ropey intestines that were surely opened to the air by the shot, but he found no blood. His hands searched around for pain or wetness as Glenn hollered out to him, but he found nothing. Then his fingers found the impact site. Two of his magazine pouches had been torn free by the round. He'd avoided being disemboweled by no more than inches. He laughed as Glenn continued to scream to get his attention. Finally, Thomas heard Glenn in his ear over their comms. Are you okay? I saw you get hit, Glenn asked, panic in his tone. Thomas smiled and thumbed the transmitter. Magazine pouch has caught the round for me. I'm fine. Give me a second to get my breath back and we'll smoke this prick out. Careful, though. He's a good shot. Roger that. Scared me on that, man. I can't afford this shit. 
tell me about it, Thomas said as he rolled onto his stomach and angled his body to get into a shooting position. He immediately didn't like the spot he was in. If the shooter was aiming at him the moment he put his barrel around the stone, he'd be shot in the face. Glenn, you're going to have to draw him out for me to get shots off. I'm in a less than ideal place. Yeah, you got it. Ten seconds and I go. Sounds good. Thomas, Glenn yelled, to your right. Thomas rolled and looked up to his right. Looming above him was the falling figure of a long-dead Afghan local, rage in his undead face. Tommy lifted his hands up and caught the falling weight of the zombie as it plummeted. Dirty, blood-soaked hands scratched at his chest, digging furrows in his chest straight through the fabric of his BDU with dirty, blood-tinged nails. He felt pain as scarlet stains began to spread. The zombie's broken teeth snapped together as the weight of his dead flesh pressed down on Thomas. The seal was desperate, and Glenn couldn't move to come help him. Tommy's body was at a ninety-degree angle to the zombie attempting to devour his flesh. He used his good leg to spin his body in line with the zombie in the gravel, scratching his back nearly as bad as chest, but allowing him to bring a bent leg underneath, preventing the zombie from being able to fall completely on him. He got his right hand free and unsheathed his combat knife from its spot on his calf. As he fought the scratching and clawing arms of the dead Afghan, he spun the blade in his palm so that it was down-facing and slammed it with every ounce of strength he could muster into the ear of the dead man. It sunk in the depth of his index finger, and with a few twitches the zombie's assault came to an end. Dark black blood oozed out of the puncture hole and dripped onto Thomas, and he heaved the body to the side. Are you good? Glenn asked over the comms. Thomas yanked the blade out with a grunt and gingerly touched the scratches on his chest that were sure to catch infection and scar. Yeah, I'm good. Give me a minute to set up. Tommy looked around to ensure no more undead could sneak up on him, and he readied his M110 to fire on the man who'd been trying to kill him just a minute before. When he was prepared, he squelched for Glenn. Glenn moved like the Olympic triathlete he was. Thomas knew that back home in Coronado, for fun, Glenn participated in triathlons. He was perennially a high finisher in competitions in Hawaii, Florida, and Utah. He was in peak physical condition at all times, and his body showed it. Glenn immediately came under fire, and Thomas edged sideways behind the stone to look for the shooter. He used his naked eye to scan the world as he waited for another shot. His position had given him space from the tire smoke and the low-hanging wall of purple smoke from their grenade, and he searched as he waited for another shot. His ears heard the crack and his eyes saw the minute flash. A small puff of dust rose from the ground and he leaned down to the scope of his rifle as his hand flicked the safety to fire. His body was a concert of coordinated action. As he readied his weapon to fire, his hands and shoulder guided it to point at the spot where he'd seen the shot. By the time his eye and cheek met the rifle, it was already within a meter of where the enemy shooter was hidden. He had but a second, perhaps two, to guess the range, windage, and then put the crosshairs where a bullet would hurt. He couldn't fail Glenn. His keen vision worked in his favor for this race. Thomas and his brothers were blessed with their father's eagle-like vision, and he saw something that was out of color, a strip of fabric perhaps, a sleeve of a brown that didn't belong. He knew the shot wouldn't kill, but it would certainly make return fire impossible. He stroked the trigger gently, hoping his gut was right on the shot placement. The rifle kicked back into his shoulder and loudly sent a metal jacketed round across the valley floor, sailing high above the heads of the undead. Thomas could see them hesitate as they heard the dueling sniper fire, unsure of where to go to kill. He watched as his round hit low, kicking up a storm of stone and sand into the space where he had wanted the bullet to go. The target, the shooter, reacted to the sudden face full of dirt and rock. They lifted their head from their concealed rifle and gave Thomas a profile to fire at. His brain worked the mathematics of the shot as his finger did the heavy lifting. He adjusted his firing location up and sent the second round, and before the sniper could lower his head, Thomas's round exploded it. The vibrant red of the dead sniper's blood stood out starkly against the stone he'd been taking cover near. The seal took tremendous satisfaction as the body of the Afghan shooter fell down behind the now harmless rifle. 
He sat very still, waiting for an unseen partner to take up the weapon, but none did. Their shooter was dead. Glenn skidded into cover in a ditch in the earth about five meters from where Thomas had just taken his shots. He grinned from his back at his warrior brother. Get him? Copy that. One severe case of lead poisoning. Glenn nodded. I wish I could shoot like you. I wish I could shoot like my brother Adrian. If he'd gone to sniper school, brother, they would be telling stories about him. He sounds cool, man. Maybe someday we'll make it back and find him and my wife, Glenn mused. If anyone is still alive back home, it'd be my brother's. I'd bet my life on it, Thomas said, looking over at his seal brother. He was thankful to still have Glenn, even if his family was lost in this limbo of a shattered world. You bet your life on enough, Tommy. Let's go find the towel heads with the mortar before that suicide bomber makes his way over here. I want to go back to Kandahar. Thomas nodded and the two men got to their feet. It had already been a hard day and it was nowhere near being over. They began to jog towards where they felt the mortars had come from. Warfare is both art and science. There is an ebb and flow to battle that only those that have learned to feel it can describe it, and even fewer can find ways to control it. Knowing when to retreat, when to advance, and how to judge the abilities of your enemy is something that is hard to define. It is much like learning how to compose a painting or a concerto. The science of warfare is chemistry, engineering, geology, geography, and mathematics. Making a proper bomb or an advanced bullet requires scientists and engineers. Proper maps require satellites and scouts with lasers. Firing a mortar accurately requires mathematics. Distance, elevation, propulsion, and more all factor into the equation that the mortar firers solve. An excellent mortar crew can drop their base plates, set the mortar up, and be firing accurate rounds hundreds and hundreds of meters away in seconds, then pick up and be gone just as fast, having never laid eyes on where they were launching their ordnance to. Tommy and Glenn were hoping the crew of this mortar didn't attend much school and were simply set up in a pre-sighted location. As they ran from cover location to cover location, they agreed an elevated position was likely. They headed up the slope of the valley to where they hoped they'd hear the mortars fire. Thomas radioed Ellum. Sergeant, we're moving on the mortar. It seems they only had a single shooter to suppress you. I'm wondering if that shooter was their spotter as well. Can you get a guy to a firing position and shoot some of the undead at your doorstep? If we can't get them to drop another round on you so we can find their location? Yeah, you bet, Ellum responded quickly. Within moments, they could hear the distant and distinctive cracks of the Marines' M4 carbines. The firing was controlled and deliberate. In his mind's eye, Tommy envisioned headshot after headshot bringing down the reanimated villagers, ending their rotten unlives at long last. The two seals kept their eyes and ears peeled for the thumping noise of a dropped mortar. It didn't take long. About three hundred meters uphill and north from their position, in a cleft on the valley side, they'd heard the mortar's boom. It would be an easy approach for them, as the incision in the valley would provide them cover from above and below. The two men nodded, and Glenn took point with his more agile M4A1. Moving slowly but smoothly, they'd be at the mortar in less than two minutes. Five members of the Taliban were waiting for them in the fading daylight. The mortar lay at the end of the crooked cut in the stone the two men approached in. Perched in the stone above the mortar was a strange tree that clung to the rocks. It had been split open a long time ago by a strike of lightning, and it gave the seals pause. A long dead tree overlooking a dying world and men who sought to murder. It was eerie, a bad omen. The end of the ravine fishhooked to the right into an open slot that looked out high over the valley and gave the mortar crew an ample view of the valley floor yet also shielded them from any fire that might come from below. The seals appreciated the location of the mortar. It was defensible and, aside from the dried-out death tree above it, well-placed. The seals stopped short of rounding the corner to the open area where the mortar was. Once they moved beyond a certain point, it would be all trigger-pulling, and they were walking into an area that could very well be booby-trapped. 
Glenn reached into a pocket on the side of his trousers and pulled out a rare child's toy, a small can of pink silly string. He shook the can and prayed that the spray would come out quietly. His finger depressed and out came a silent jet of the pink foam. The sticky material flew out ten feet and fell slowly to the ground of the ravine, but in one spot it hung suspended in midair, almost as if levitating. A tripwire. Glenn slid forward on one knee, his right hand holding his M4A1 at the corner in the ravine as Tommy covered him. If anyone came round the stones there, he'd depress that finger again, but instead of a face full of pink string, the walker would get a face full of 556 millimeter. He reached the spot where the pink foam lay on the wire and examined it. The wire led to a grenade that was wedged in between two stones. The explosion would be tightly confined in the narrow stone path, causing tremendous damage to whoever tripped the wire. Glenn slung his weapon and gripped the grenade tightly, removing it from the trap. He turned to Tommy with unrestrained glee on his face, pointing to the grenade and mouthing, Free grenade! Tommy had to stifle a laugh. He pointed to the hook in the stone path and slung his own long weapon on his back. To move as fast as he really wanted to, he'd need a smaller weapon. His own M4A1 was back at Firebase Walker, so he drew his Mark 23 handgun and threaded the suppressor on with practiced haste. Tommy loved the heavy beast and the way it sat in his hand. Glenn preferred the Sig P226 and its lighter 9mm, but Tommy wanted to know that every single round was going to knock the teeth out of a man he shot only in the asshole. The forty-five was his caliber of choice for a handgun. He readied his $2,000 hand cannon and nodded to his brother. Glenn pulled the pin on his brand new grenade and tossed it over the stones that separated them from the men they were about to assault. The grenade went off with an ear-splitting boom. The dust hadn't even settled to the ground and the two seals were moving. Assaults like this were about violence of action and leaving your enemy no time to recover. Glenn kept the point position and rounded the stones, keeping his eyes alert and his finger prepped. His finger slid down to the trigger as they entered the hot area. Two dying men were propped up against the left stone wall of the ravine, clutching at wounds in their abdomen, weapons at least a foot or two away from their busy hands. Glenn held his fire, knowing they weren't the biggest threats, and that Thomas would handle them in a second. His barrel sighted across the room, looking for moving targets with weapons. He saw the mortar tipped over on its side impotently, no more than a pipe with murder in its past. A scorch mark near the base plate told him where his grenade had landed. Immediately to the right of that, nearest the opening in the stone that looked out over the valley, there was a man crouching, stunned and trying to pick up an AK-47. Glenn's finger pulled the trigger, and on full auto his M4A1 spat out five rounds into the man's head and upper body. He fell on the rifle he was trying to pick up. Across the gap in the stone was a man lying dead or so close to it as not to matter. As Glenn moved his weapon to meet that area of the space, he registered the movement of someone on the ground. Another man had been on his back and lifted his own AK-47 to fire. The heavy Russian weapon tore open the evening air and sent a stream of lethal lead through the space between the two seals. At nearly the same time behind him, Tommy snapped off two rounds into the chest and face of the first wounded man on the ground, just as Glenn knew he would. Glenn's weapon went cyclic and let the muzzle lift carry the rounds across the area of the room the man was. He watched as a few of the lethal rounds skipped off the ground and stones before finding the warm living flesh of the terrorist. The man screamed out as his thigh, waist, and stomach each caught a high-velocity round. Immediately, he began to slide into shock as his perforated bowels fell apart inside him. Glenn tapped the trigger once more, ripping the man's head apart and ending his agony. If anything, Glenn was merciful and generous. Tommy squeezed off two more rounds into the other wounded man as he rolled over towards his discarded AK, ending that threat. The two men searched the space for any other threats and found none. Tommy put one more suppressed round into the head of the dead man in the center of the room to be sure he'd never sit up again.
He removed his suppressor and holstered the pistol, taking up a firing position in the gap in the stone with his M110. Glenn provided security while Tommy looked down on the valley floor below. Far away, hundreds and hundreds of meters away, Tommy saw the trucks that had unloaded the undead earlier in the day. In the day's dying light, he couldn't quite make out good shots, but he could see a smaller vehicle mixed in near the forefront of the trucks. It stood out and made him wonder. One Corolla mixed in with the Mercedes trucks, single occupant, clean as day. Glenn stopped his search of the dead bodies. There's your VBIED. Tommy nodded slightly. Do they have any mortar rounds? Glenn looked around and saw a few leaning up against the stones. Yeah, they have six rounds left. Got an idea? Let's set this mortar back up. Send them some of their own airmail. Navy couriers never miss a delivery, you know. Neither rain nor sleet nor snow nor insurgent attacks prevent us from delivering our packages, Glenn quipped. Amen to that. The two men worked together setting the mortar upright and ensuring that it wasn't damaged by the grenade blast. All of its parts were in working order, and through the scope of his rifle they dialed in the dope on the mortar. Both men had trained on the Russian mortar before, and it came quickly to them. They found these relics often, and it was a key skill to be able to use your enemy's weapons if needed. Dialed, good to go, Glenn said. Tommy shouldered his rifle and took a knee. He'd judged the range to be 450 meters, give or take. Once I take the driver of the suicide machine out, send the first round. Gotcha. Tommy slowed his heartbeat and steadied his breathing. The scope was already adjusted for windage, and to be truthful, the shot would be easier than most. The wind was dead, and it was a clear shot through the windshield. He watched the driver nervously knuckle up on the steering wheel of the beat-up Toyota, clearly waiting for the word to go. He was scared to die. Tommy thought he'd remove that concern for him. His rifle punched around through the glass and opened up a hole in the man even a miracle couldn't close. He hoped the man had a good time with all his virgins in the afterlife. Sending, Glenn said calmly over the echo of Thomas's shot before dropping a mortar round down the tube. The small mortar round thumped loudly and sailed high towards the trucks. Tommy watched passively as the Taliban men went over to investigate the strange noise that had just occurred at the Toyota. Just as they realized the man inside had been eviscerated by a shooter, Glenn's mortar round impacted on a truck far to the rear of the group. Twenty meters long, Tommy said. Glenn made a hasty adjustment to the mortar and dropped the second round. It erupted out of the tube and missiled through the air, this time impacting on the cab of one of the Mercedes trucks, blowing it to smithereens. The men nearby dove to the ground to avoid the lethal shrapnel, but Tommy watched as a few still ate hot steel. One man's arm was sheared clean off by a red-hot piece of spinning engine. Fire for effect, Tommy said. Aye, aye, Glenn said as he dropped another round. No sooner had the mortar screamed away, Glenn picked up another and dropped it. He waited for a second before sending the next and repeated the process until all the remaining high-explosive rounds had been launched. Tommy watched each impact the area near the second explosion that had destroyed the old white Mercedes truck. For once he was thankful the breeze had picked up, for it drifted a few of the mortar rounds a few dozen feet in each direction, spreading the death for them. One man took a mortar round square in the back, and Tommy watched as his entire body disintegrated, limbs flying outward in all directions. Horses could not have pulled him apart more efficiently. He was thankful the man wouldn't be a worry as an undead ever. When the sixth round fell and exploded on the Taliban, Thomas sat still and watched, waiting for anyone to move. As one man slowly rolled over, clearly wounded, Tommy sighted in on him and sent a round through him. He didn't roll over again. The light finally faded away and Tommy gave up on his vigilance. They were all dead or dying. He sent a few rounds into the engine block of the Toyota to ensure that it wouldn't be operable for a good long time, and then turned to Glenn. Get the Chinook here. Let's get the fuck gone. Glenn happily started to hail the extraction team as the two gathered what they felt was worth taking. Three AK-47s were a hot commodity nowadays.
It took the Hilo two hours to arrive at Firebase Walker, giving the Marines and SEALs plenty of time to shoot all the zombies surrounding the base dead, and pack up and be ready to leave nothing but the ghosts of friends and enemies behind. They could hear the thumping of the Chinook's dual rotors long before they could see it, and as the massive helicopter landed in the dust and dirt outside the base, the whoop-whoop-whoop of the massive rotors shook their chests. Ellum stood with the two seals as the rest of the Marines boarded through the rear ramp of the transport chopper. Several Army Rangers provided fallout security as the Marines lugged their meager possessions aboard. The Marines looked thankful for more friendly faces, and the Rangers were elated to see them. Tommy was glad the cross-service bullshit had more or less died since June. It had gotten old to watch men and women spar over which branch was better than the other. The Marine sergeant stood silently, emotion clear on his face. I'm sad to leave. That sounds stupid, doesn't it? Ellum said over the cacophony of the helicopter. Thomas shook his head and assessed the sergeant. He seemed like a good man and a leader that had stepped up when he was needed most. The world would need men and women like him, possibly now more than ever. Sergeant, you're like the captain of a ship, no different. No captain wants to watch his ship sink, nor ever step foot off its decks. Yeah, I suppose, Ellum said wistfully. Well, fuck both of you poets. We still have hot food in Kandahar, and if I'm not mistaken, today is over, and it is time to leave. Glenn trotted off towards the rear of the Chinook, shaking his ass happily. How can he be so goddamn happy? Yesterday was horrible, Ellum shook his head. Yesterday was easy, Sergeant, Tommy said, picking up one last pack of supplies from the base. Tomorrow could be hard. How can you say that? Elam asked as the two walked towards the Chinook, ready to leave the Valley of Death. We have a saying in the teams, the only easy day is yesterday. Yesterday was dealt with and is past us and is thus easy. I don't have to worry about yesterday anymore. Today and tomorrow, though? That I've got to focus on. Ellum laughed. You seals are fucking crazy. The only easy day is yesterday. Man, that's some shit. No argument for me, Sarge. Let's go to Kandahar. January 2014 January 4th, 2014 Mr. Journal so far, so good, though we haven't come that far and things aren't all that good. As I said, we met with the NVC people and toured the factory with them yesterday. Classic case of third wheel. Thorpe came, and in a plot twist we weren't expecting, so did King Shit of Turd Hill, North. Hector and Celeste greeted them and gave an unfettered walkthrough. I mean, it's a strip club— I don't know what about the place would give them a hard-on anymore to add to their repertoire, but they seemed adequately excited to have a fortified outpost on the city edge. It also helped that the camera system Andy installed there gave them a bit of a chubber. I dislike giving them access to such a system, because now they can theoretically replicate it like we have at all our locations, but that could have happened without them gaining access to the factory. I should add that Andy and his thick glasses departed the factory for good. He's decided he'd rather be back at Bastion, a little further away from the spread of the NVC, and a little closer to the large group of people with guns that he trusts. After our tour ended, Mizaki sat the brains of the respective operations down, the same group of people who debated the whole process at the end of last month, and he presented Hector and Celeste a thick stack of paperwork that represented the Alliance in official legal-sounding language. I'm glad Kevin stayed back, because he would have whipped his dick out and pissed all over that paperwork right then and there and underlined his John Hancock with a turd. I love the idea that Hector and Celeste think a few signed sheets of paper mean anything. It goes to their positivity about people giving their word and... It lends power to what otherwise would have been a simple handshake and verbal agreement. I guess the same could be said about Mizaki and his crew. But paper and the words written on it don't mean shit now, and there's nothing stopping either group from ignoring the whole agreement at will for any reason. And paper didn't mean shit ever, Mr. Journal. 
We broke treaties, ignored them at will, and generally the people with the biggest guns did whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, at the expense of the little man. And in this scenario, we're the little man. But still, the treaty-slash-alliance paperwork was cute, and both Hector and Celeste seemed happy that something firm was in place to protect their rights and autonomy as such. Afterwards, everyone involved shook hands, and we set up a date for the NVC people to visit Spring Meadow. As I suspected, they were okay with the Seventh to tour the interior of the gated community, but we made no assurances any treaty would be signed on that day. We've decided that Spring Meadow, MGR, and Bastion all stand together, no matter what. No secret tours, no back alley agreements, all or nothing. And right now, all doesn't look impossible. I know my language is negative and pessimistic for the most part, but at the end of the day, they're still making us feel good about joining forces, and it's still the right choice based on everything we know. We have plenty of time to decide or change our mind, and if things follow the course we've charted thus far, it looks good for everyone involved. A lot of blood will stay inside the people it belongs to because of this, and that's a good thing. Adrian January 7th, 2014 we're about to head out to Spring Meadow to escort the NVC people there, but I had to put in a little entry before I go. I wouldn't say anything, but I had my laptop open from last night when I was listening to music. My brother Caleb and his wife Sophie had a middle-of-the-night miscarriage. I woke up to hearing Caleb's primal screams for help. I've never been more frightened. My brother has never made a sound like that before. We rushed them to the clinic a few hours ago, Baby obviously passed, and we damn near lost Sophie, too. Fletcher, the veterinarian, and Joel were on call last night, and they saved her life. I'm told she had a ton of bleeding. My family owes the two of them more than I can say. I'm fighting the need to leave to spend time with my brother. We'll see what I decide. Uh, I'm on the fence. Adrian January 7th, 2014, Second Entry Becca and I stayed with Caleb. Michelle went in my stead. I miss my brothers. I'm waiting for Michelle to return so I can hear how it all went at Spring Meadow. I hate that I missed the meet, but I'm glad that I stayed with my brother and his wife. Heartbroken. Adrian January 10th, 2014 If I didn't love her madly, I'd kill Michelle. Do you know how hard it has been to get information out of her about the Spring Meadow visit? I'm serious, she's like a brick wall when it comes to getting proper good information. Can I find out about her personal take on people? How she read them and how everyone reacted emotionally? how she estimated their interpersonal effectiveness and overall social ability. Do I know that Vega is Roman Catholic? You bet. Can I get her to tell me the specifics about what everyone said and how they said it? Not a chance. All those details slipped past her like goose shit through a tin horn, an expression that has never made sense to me, but I'm saying it because men become their fathers. And the stereotype is that women hear everything everyone says and never forget it. I know that's sexist and unfair, but I'm all out of sorts since Caleb and Sophie's miscarriage. Ah, <sighs> I'm pissed. Why take a fucking baby? What god would do that? Seriously. Not even a baby, a fucking unborn child. Second trimester, no less. Well into the supposed safe zone of a pregnancy. <sighs> My brother and his wife are a wreck. Sophie's doing much better physically, but the abruption she suffered nearly killed her. She's mending, but losing a baby is something you don't come back from the same. Caleb's broken about it, and watching him watch her be broken makes me hurt so goddamn bad. It's not fair. It's just not fair. My brother deserved another child. 
He's such a good father, always there for his family, always. They're the kind of people who should be making babies to repopulate this fucked up world, and they did everything right, everything. My sister Becca is all fucked up too. She lost a nephew or a niece. We aren't asking which it was. That seems like too much. And she was closer to my brother and his wife than I was. They survived a long time together in their house after that day. They've got a bond I don't share, and we're close as fuck. Adding insult to injury, my decision, and it was the right one, to stay behind cost me front row seats of the team AAA meeting with the NVC brass. I can't say much, despite me spending the last few days grilling folks about it. I know Mizaki didn't show, but Thorpe and a few of the other council people did. They came with lots of tanks and lots of armed men, as Michelle has said, but she didn't say much about whether they postured or intimidated. I think the NVC people left their heavy shit outside of the gated community out of respect or logistical difficulty getting it through the gates. She spent most of her time with Team AAA and Thorpe, and boy does she have a lengthy evaluation of Thorpe. If you want to skip the next paragraph, she likes him. She believes that Thorpe is the best of the bunch there. She thinks he's a good man, but the rest of the NVC is trailing but still coming around. Like I thought, she thinks they made some mistakes early and fell into a bad reputation, but they're working on it, trying to improve, and she thinks Thorpe is one of the men who are pushing for that change. I like him more now that she said that, but her assessment of the NVC does scare me. She isn't wrong about people often. I wish I'd been in a better place to send someone to Rome more when she went. I know she did a good job and represented us well, but... She didn't look at the things like I would have. She saw different things, and it's good to hear those things, but it wasn't helpful for me like I'd hoped. I'm angry at her for doing a good job differently than I would have, and that's not fair. I'm angry about other things and projecting that shit onto her. Totally uncool, Adrian. Totally uncool. Grow the fuck up. <laughs> I've been trying to grow up my entire life. I have at least been nice to her. I've bottled it up for now, and that's a good thing. I gotta check, though. Too much on my mind, and I'm angry enough to punch walls for no good reason. I can't be doing that anymore. There's a baby in the dorm now, and we're running low on drywall to fix my temper tantrums. Oh, and Michelle gave the go-ahead to visit MGR on the 15th. Maybe that's why I'm pissed. I'm not even in charge. She is. Jesus. I'm a mess. We're meeting with Patty and Mike to make sure everything is planned out before the NBC diplomatic mission gets there and that the residents are comfortable with everything. I suspect it'll be a shit sandwich covered in pea soup and the Jinx Fairy will be floating and gloating, winged cunt. Adrian. January 16th, 2014 I'm not a dad, nor do I pretend to be one on television, but have you ever seen a protective father the first time his daughter brings a boy home? It's like an all-stairs pissing contest. The father knows that no matter what, in the end, he'll burn his house down and the new kid's parents' house down to protect his daughter. He'll raise the whole world to protect his little girl. And the boy, ever mindful that in the end he'll be set on fire, knows he's still gonna bang the daughter because that's just the way it is. She shouldn't need her dad's protection, if the mom and dad have done a good job of raising their girl to pick the right people to have in her life. That's sort of what I saw going down at MGR yesterday with Mike and Patty. That's their home, their daughter, and the NVC people are the boy coming over to meet mom and dad. Stairs that could light fires, man. Stairs that'd freeze water solid. Crazy. But they played nice, all for the sake of that precious daughter's future. Thorpe came again. I must admit, it was nice to see him. And he brought boss man King Shit of Turd Hill north. Mizaki was a cool cucumber, too. Pleasant, thankful, and happy to be meeting new friendly people at every turn. They didn't bring any of the other council members, but they did roll into town with two APCs, 
two Humvees and the Hilo flying overhead for the majority of the afternoon. I gotta give credit to the pilot. The weather was a little stiff today, cold and windy, and he still put his bird in the air for his people. Ballsy. I'd like to meet him eventually. In short, they went all the way up to the top of the building, toured a few of the apartments, and met a good portion of the residents. In a turn of events I approved of, the common people of the tower put them to the coals, asking them questions like it was their day job. Mazaki and Thorpe had to backpedal and talk far more than they ever had, I think, and it was nice to see them scramble and still say the right things. Maybe they're talented talkers, but I think the verbal attack by the locals of McGreevy Russell Tower put them on their heels. The people took every chance to ask questions, and I loved every minute of it. I think I loved most that Abby was there asking questions of them, and she'll be putting the entire conversation into her newsletter for the whole of our people to read later today. So, after the relatively brief tour, two hours, maybe three, Mazaki and Thorpe started talking a little odd with me over lunch. So, this is the town, huh? Thorpe kind of blurted at me. You were pretty much just here the whole time? Well, out and about. I made some forays into the city and a few towns over to Westfield before they lost their school to a fire. I kept it close. Yeah, we heard about that. A couple people from the school made their way north to us after the place burnt down, Mazaki said back. Some kind of internal arson? Is that true? Yeah, some prick named Chris Sunderman. Made a deal with the devil, so I'm told. I pointed at the back of my neck where my scar is. Chris came to Bastion after the fire and played nice to get close to me. Shot me in the fucking neck. Gave me a phobia about apple orchards. I can't eat apple crisp anymore. Can't explain to you the loss I feel over that. Yeah, we heard you almost bit it, Thorpe said. When you say he made a deal with the devil, you sound like you're speaking literally. Are you? It's complicated. Michelle answered for me because I was chewing a bite of sandwich. The devil Adrian speaks of isn't the one talked about in the religious texts, per se. With the end, we, and, I mean, mankind, when I say we, narrowly avoided, there was a great power tasked with the destruction of mankind, and it was very much sentient and willful, manipulative and capable of vast evils. It worked against the good using evil. What she said, I added. Sunderman tried to work his way up the evil corporate ladder by burning the school down and then taking a shot at me. But I'm still here, and he isn't, so read into that what you will. Fated to live, Mazaki said. Convenient. More like he was a shit rifleman, I quipped. I didn't say anything about Gilbert's reloads being underpowered. They didn't need to know about him. Either way, I don't get it. How did we live for so long not knowing that God was real? How did we put ourselves in the position that he'd want to eliminate us with friggin' zombies? Why would God task an evil force with the job of killing us? What God does that? A lot of talk about our cruel God lately, eh, Mr. Journal? Michelle laughed. Maybe you forgot how messed up the world was. We needed a reset in the worst way, Mr. Thorpe. God, or whatever it is you want to call the power that is, achieved that through means it felt appropriate. We were judged by our dead. There are multiple verses of the King James Bible that speak of the dead walking the earth. We shouldn't be surprised in the least that we were taken to task by our deceased. We are lucky that the Trinity came together in time, and that we did what we had to do to save everyone. You are the prettiest, nicest, creepy woman I've ever met, Thorpe said, totally uncomfortable with everything she said. We all laughed at that, and Michelle blushed. She added an agreeing nod at the end of the laughter. So then, Bastion is close, Mazaki said, ending the humorous moment like a loud, damp fart in a confessional. One more humid Hail Mary, General. Yeah, not far, I said back. So, would it be too much to ask to tour it today? It's a very long drive southwest to here. We could move this forward by leaps and bounds were you to let us see your base. We would be respectful of anything you asked of us during the tour. We could leave our armor here and ride in one of your vehicles. Just Colonel Thorpe and I. 
I'd be very appreciative of the gesture, he added. I got the impression it was less of a request and more of an attempt to push us along politely. I don't get pushed much. I gotta hand it to him, though. He was genuine. He would have gone with just he and Thorpe. That's a huge sign of trust, and I didn't skip over that. Not today, General. I hear you on the long drive and the fuel waste, but we're still moving on a slow schedule for this, and today is not the day. No dog and pony show for you. He laughed. I had to try. It was an admirable effort, General, really, I joked back at him. When can we come? We'd like to see where your story played out. We're told you've quite the fortress, that you built it all yourself. Don't believe everything you hear. I did a lot for Bastion, but my people did the bulk of the heavy lifting to get it where it is today, and it's pretty secure, but it's no calendar mountain. We're in a good spot, safe. You'll approve, I think. I'm sure we will. No one's managed a siege on your Bastion yet, and that's saying something, Mazaki added. Not many have tried. I suspect we'd put up a hell of a fight, though. I hope to never find out, Mazaki added, his words solemn and very real. And that kind of ended it. We talked about the town, its local resources that we've already drained, and that seemed to deflate their idea of MGR's value to them. Less raiding and foraging opportunities, I suppose. Though to spread out their communications reach and find safe neighbors has to be good. We sent them away with no date for the Bastion tour. I couldn't give them a day on the spot, but we said we'd be in touch soon through the factory. Mike and Patty calmed down after they left too, and eventually wound their way around to saying nice things about them. Again, Mazaki and Thorpe seemed like good people, and the soldiers they keep bringing with them seem like really nice people too. No missteps on their part so far means good things, right? I'd wager we've been more of the assholes to them. Whatever. Caleb and Sophie are better, but not well. Joro is cute. Jumped the ugly hurdle. Gavin is still cute and is crying less every day. Abby is a great mom in between posting her newsletters all over campus and sending them out on patrols to MGR. She's reporting the NVC Alliance meetings to the general populace as being very positive. Hal's a great dad. He's so proud of his baby boy. I overheard him talking to Abby late last night about how he wished his mother and father could have met Gavin. He didn't cry, but I could hear a tone of mourning in his voice. He was close to his mom and dad back in England, and there's no chance now of ever seeing them again, if they're even still alive. People seem to be happy about Abby's talk about the NBC, and I'm sure her newsletter later today will only add to that. They're excited that the process has been peaceful and that it's moving forward. No one here has cold feet about it, or if they do, they're wearing socks and shutting the fuck up about their icy toes. Michelle's great, using her bookmark all the time and keeping our little municipal world running smoothly. I'm so proud of her. Still not sure what it is I do here exactly, but that's okay. Story of my life. Heading to bed, Mr. Journal. Tired, and I need to get with some people to start figuring out when we're willing to bring the NVC inside our wire. My asshole itches when I think about it. Adrian January 20th, 2014 All is well enough, Mr. Journal. Abby's newsletter went out the other day and stirred up a wave of positivity with the people of Bastion and MGR. The frank and open conversation the NVC people had with the MGR folks pretty much made it straight into the two-pager, her biggest publication thus far, and it helped to encourage people like nothing I've seen before. As an aside, I wonder how many of these newsletters she can put out before we run out of paper or copier printer toner. Folks are genuinely happy with what happened that day, and they are absolutely excited to join with the NVC people. Mizaki and Thorpe being a little clumsy and vulnerable when confronted made them seem human, and that made the difference, I think. Abby is happy as a pig in shit about how her writing has been received, and I'm happy for her as well. I've given up on trying to keep secrets from her, and that feels good. So... 
Why am I still not entertaining a scheduled meet here on campus? Um, I'm scared. Like, unreasonably scared to allow someone who could possibly be dangerous here? Escorted or not, it feels like a gigantic breach of security. I know Kevin and I are in agreement on this, but we are in the vast minority, and with each passing hour, fewer and fewer people are with us. I'm afraid to give up power. I killed to keep this place safe. I put down hundreds of zombies, maybe thousands, to keep it habitable and to make it a place where I could live and where I could invite others in to help them. It seems silly to me to give up what I fought so hard for. But maybe this was part of the plan all along. Maybe all of what I did to build Auburn Lake Preparatory Academy into Bastion and the place it is today was the first step of getting us to be able to be part of the larger new world that's forming right now. Maybe the powers that be orchestrated the NVC being douches long enough for us to get our shit together, and then gave them time and focus to get their shit together, and now it's meant to be. Maybe I'm the old guard that needs to change for the youth. Am I the grumpy old fuck that sits on his porch and yells at the neighborhood kids when they ride too close to his lawn during the summer? Am I that fucking guy? Shit, I think I'm that guy. I'm holding up progress. I'm the dude who can't see the future and keeps living in the past. Ah, I hate realizations. Epiphanies aren't always enlightening in that positive way. I feel like the kid sitting at the back of the class that's been arguing with the teacher, positive that he's right, only to have the light turn on after figuring out he's been arguing incorrectly the whole time. And now everyone is turned around in their seat and they're looking at me, judging me. Decided that I'll never get a slow dance in the gymnasium at the next school function. I need to talk to Michelle and agree on a date to have him here, but I think I'll do that tomorrow. Or maybe the next day, but definitely soon. In other news, Hector and Celeste have reported that nothing has changed at the factory beyond now the NVC has a room there where they keep a small unit of four men in rotation. The men are involved in security of the club and are good folks by their report. Once every other day, the soldiers make a call back to the NVC to give a short sit rep, and that's it. The two bosses seem very pleased with the arrangement thus far. Adrian. January 25th, 2014. Yep, still waiting on setting that meeting up. We had a small issue come up the other day at the wall, and that bought me a few days, thankfully. I still don't know why I haven't set a date yet. The NVC has got to be getting pissed at me over this. They've been polite thus far about it, but that won't last forever. I mean, I know why, but I won't admit to being afraid of progress or stranger danger. Two school buses pulled past MGR yesterday and were seen dumping out a few dozen people on the streets of town in the morning. Mixed folks of all colors, shapes, and sizes, the buses they arrived in bore markings from Iowa and Indiana. The MGR people stood up their security and notified us of the issue, and we got the QRF ready, too. After an hour of watching them wander through town like dislodged tourists sans cameras, they packed up and headed west out of town towards here. We watched their progress through our remote cameras, one intersection at a time, as they made the turn off of Main Street onto Route 18. When that happened, we doubled up our active shooters on the wall and at the gate, and when the two buses made the turn onto Auburn Lake Road, shit got a little intense. A full-on assault alarm was given, and every single person who could shoot a gun got a gun. Those who couldn't shoot picked up butter knives and prepared to get medieval. I myself geared up for war and found Kevin at the top of our berm wall, AT-4 nearby, and we got down on the ground with our M4A1s. The boys and girls in the towers at the bridge had their saws trained on the far side, and at our backs were twenty more people ready to step into harm's way to protect our home. I was vibrating when the two buses crept down the hill through the area where we clear-cut the trees, where Zack died and where we ambushed Sean's assholes a few winters ago, if you recall. 
I had my red dot on the driver's distant head and kept it right there until the buses came to a stop on the downslope of the far hill twenty or so yards from the outer gate. I radioed out the patrols on horseback to flank them a half mile back in the event they took a shot at us and ran. They were ready for the counterattack if need be. A thin guy of maybe forty got out of the bus and approached the distant wooden gate with his arms raised. I watched him through my ACOG as he stood awkwardly, waiting for someone to approach him from the other side of the delta-shaped gate. Kevin radioed for James Howitz to talk to the man with his mic on, and Jimmy did that. The man spoke with some excitement, but also nervousness. Through my scope, I could see that he kept looking down at Jim's M4 over and over, which told me he didn't care for guns. I was later proven right. His name was Tim Board, born and bred in Las Vegas. Tim worked as a stage magician in the casinos and clubs out there from the time he was 13 to that day. He'd made his way out of the city and east since then and hooked up with the crew in the buses some time before they made the pilgrimage here. Tim seemed like a good guy, but then again he's a performer, so he's supposed to be likable. When I say pilgrimage, I mean pilgrimage. They came cross-country to meet the Trinity and to live closer to us. Over the course of the unfolding hours after that, we sent out more representatives across the bridge to meet Tim and the several other people who came with him. In total, there were forty-three souls on the shot-up pair of yellow school buses. In addition to the magician, there was a sweet old lady of maybe sixty named Nell Turner. She went on and on about being excited to work with the people who manage our gardens. She was most excited to meet Michelle, though she seemed real pleased in general. Thomas Thorne was a pickup of a lifetime. He met them a few weeks ago and joined up after his helicopter ran out of fuel. Yes, I said, helicopter. Turns out he was a maritime coast guard pilot turned tour guide pilot, and he'd lived for months flying up and down the eastern seaboard, landing on offshore oil rigs for fuel and trading goods to them he got on the shore and inland. He was a young fifty-plus, and he's a gold mine if we can find him another helicopter. We need to check the airport in the city to see if there's something there he can fly. That's a priority. He, too, seemed like a good person. I dreamed about you, one of them said to me, probably my favorite of all of them. It was a kid named Archer Mason of maybe twenty years. Archer has downs and is the nicest kid you could imagine. He's high-functioning. Had a job at the local VA he lived near just outside of Des Moines, and he was preparing to go to the local tech before the shit hit the fan. He would have done well, I bet. He's excited to be here, and he was real excited to meet me. An older lady named Ginny Wilson hung around Archer like it was her job. Turns out she worked with people with brain injuries and intellectual difficulties before the end, and she gravitated to Archer. I don't think Archer needed the help, but... She was there to give it. Jenny also had a former client with her, a woman in her thirties who was pretty well debilitated from a car accident. Jenny's awful story began with her three kids being separated from her on that day as she cared for the lady who can't speak or walk on her own. She wouldn't talk much to me or Kevin, but she and Michelle hit it off. Michelle mentioned that Jenny politely suggested that we might be able to help her find her kids back in Ohio. All order, Jenny. Props to her for keeping her last client alive, though, to the end. How, I don't know, but she did it. That says a lot about her. There was some guy named Dave Ward who struck me as a bit selfish. When I say selfish, I mean asshole. He looked like he joined the troop because it was his best option, not because he genuinely wanted to go across the country after the apocalypse. He struck me as well as a midlife crisis frozen in time. His hair had product in it. One of their brain trusts is a thirty-odd-year-old girl named Harley Franklin. Harley was, is, a librarian whose bookworm antics allowed them to figure out how to get the buses running and keep them that way, as well as build traps, find roads, forage for food, etc. <laughs> I said antics. As it turns out, brains might actually help you survive the apocalypse, which explains why I had such a hard time of it. 
Harley will be a welcome addition to our community. We need a librarian to help with the school, and she perked right up when Michelle made the suggestion. It's like seeing someone round the corner as they lay eyes on the home they grew up in. Caroline and Roger Thompson are a great find. They are six months pregnant and from a small town in North Carolina. Roger's a former police officer and worked as their primary trigger puller on the journey. Kevin's assessing him. Caroline is an elementary school teacher and is the sweetest. Her and Roger have been together since high school, and that's cute. I need to see their kid born. After Sophie and Caleb lost theirs, it's now a mission of mine. I will become the grand baby facilitator. Maybe, just maybe, Michelle and I will have one of our own, too. Still gotta talk to her about that. Still chicken about it, too. We have them housed in the homes near the exploded gas station at the intersection of Route 18 and Auburn Lake Road. Our security cameras there allow us to keep watch on them and their two buses all hours of the day, and that helps me sleep at night. I do think they're good people, though. I mean, they drove all the way across the country just to meet us. Meet me? Pretty cool. Weird, though. Really weird. Makes me uncomfortable if I think about it. More people showed, but... I'm getting tired. Michelle knows this delayed the decision to have the NBC visit, and for that, I'm thankful. She's wise that she shouldn't make the decision on her own because she knows I'll pitch a fit like a toddler or find some reason to change her mind. I know I'll agree with her the next time she asks me, but delaying it just feels good for some reason. I'm a weirdo. A paranoid weirdo. A paranoid weirdo who has kept a lot of people alive for a long time. I view that as a highlight on my post-apocalyptic resume, thank you very much. You're also welcome. We have a meeting with Maria Hunt and her people on the 28th, too, by the way. Routine trade, and I'm going to try to make it. I hope the weather holds. Adrian January 30th, 2014 New people are settling in well around town. Of them, we've only allowed Tom Thorne, helicopter pilot, and Harley Franklin, librarian, inside the walls to live. Everyone else was set up in the houses on Auburn Lake Road and Route 18 near the exploded gas station and the Lime and Urine Home. Ah, oh, the Lime and Urine Home. I miss Gilbert. I miss him more than my real dad, and that's the first time I've ever admitted it, I think. I don't think about my parents much, but I do think about Gilbert. Ugh, shit got too real. Moving on. Okay, so I mainly wanted to check in here because work outside has been stymied by shit weather. Michelle is up my ass like a butt doctor on the hunt for a polyp to schedule the NVC visit. Kevin's patrols on horseback in town have reported that since the 26th, they have seen two of the NBC M113 armored personnel carriers moving around in the east side of town towards the city. They haven't entered the town limits in depth, but they're definitely making a show of wanting to be here. I don't feel like they're being aggressive, and Kevin doesn't either, and I don't know why we don't feel that way. Maybe it's because they're being very respectful of our actual space, or that we've built a good relationship with Thorpe and Mazaki. I don't know, but I feel good about it. Michelle scheduled a meeting tomorrow with the Brass, weather permitting, for us to make the final decision to have them visit here. I also think the reason why I want to do that is because every time I'm out and about here, I get stopped and asked when the visit is. Past few days have seen people migrate from being respectful and inquisitive to me about it, to now they're short and obviously bothered by my lack of will to move forward. They want this settled, and they want to move forward. Well, with the exception of Jay Wilson and his little sister, they're still completely certain that the NVC is responsible for their death of their family back at the junkyard, and I can't say that they're wrong. Problem is, even if they're right, we're so committed to this, and so many people are behind it, I can't make a difficult decision, or advise Michelle differently about it. People want this. It isn't Michelle or Peaceniks holding up signs on the quad. I know Michelle isn't throwing me under the bus about it. I crawled under it on my own. Tires hurt. Besides, 
What can our patrol of horses and shooters do about armored personnel carriers with 50 cal BMGs? Not a whole lot unless we stumble upon a cache of heavy weaponry somewhere. Deep breath. Meeting tomorrow. Hopefully, Jay and his sister behave. All's well otherwise. Oh, and the meeting with Maria and her people was canceled due to snow. We've rescheduled for February 7th. Adrian. January 31st, 2014. Two things to note, Mr. Journal. Weather was good, and we met about having the NVC visit this morning. We reached out to the factory, and on our behalf, they scheduled the NVC trip here for February 5th. Everyone was on board with the idea. Everyone enough, that is. It was weird to meet and not have Hector and Celeste there. They're already on the other side of the fence, though. Didn't make sense to invite them. Second thing to note... Our meeting was interrupted by Danny Jr., who had guard duty on the wall for that shift. He came in rushing, freaking the hell out, happy as can be. You guys gotta come see this, he said, standing in the door to Hall E after we opened it for him. He didn't even use his radio to let us know, he just ran over. We exited the dorm and followed him to an opening in the trees at the top of the berm wall. I knew something was happening, I could hear it. A faint hum hung in the air, like a distant piece of machinery grinding away at the earth, though I felt no rumble in my feet. We scampered to the top of the snow-covered hill and watched as Danny looked up and scanned the sky. He raised a single finger and pointed. A white streak moved from south to north miles and miles above. At the leading tip of the contrail was a wide-winged military transport, a C-130 Hercules or maybe a C-5 galaxy. I think it was a galaxy. I believe the wings were swept back a bit. We cheered. A military plane like that doesn't just take off by accident, and if it got that high in altitude, it had a plan to travel far, and that means there is infrastructure putting planes in the sky. Maybe big government's coming back after all. That plane above sure made the threat of the NVC seem small. We meet them on the 7th. The Last Plane Out of Kandahar, May 2011 Thomas and Glenn sat in the corner of a dilapidated conference room in the airbase they had called home for the last nine brutal months. It was May 4th, 2011, and the world had fallen apart. Life in Afghanistan hadn't been particularly good for anyone for a long time, regardless of whether or not the undead had been roaming the earth. The zombies that wandered the city outside of the base's walls and fences were only adding a new color to the palette of horrible that the nation of Afghanistan was. Thomas and Glenn were artists in the medium of violence. They'd spent their entire adult lives in the United States Navy, either training to become Navy SEALs or putting that training to good use in the real world downrange. Though it didn't feel like the real world anymore. It felt like a shitty horror movie on late-night television. The gathered group of military men and women were holdovers from stationed forces from the War on Terror prior to the War on the Dead. They represented every branch of the military, even the Coast Guard. Thomas wasn't sure why there was a coast yet an airbase this far inland, but... Every living body counted right now. Air Force ground officers as well as pilots were in attendance, as were Army officers and frontline ground pounders. Marines were accounted for as well, and the small contingent of Navy men and women sat proudly together. Uniforms and service creeds no longer mattered. Nationality and the color of your skin was an afterthought at best for most of the survivors. Were you alive? Could you shoot? Then you were family. Thomas Ring looked around the room and did a quick head count. Of the 38 men and women in attendance, he and his best friend Glenn had been personally responsible for rescuing 13 of them. 13 souls given a reprieve from a lonely death in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by the starving dead. There were more people on the base not in attendance that owed the two men their lives. The highest-ranking military officer present called a hush to the chatter and started the briefing. Ladies and gentlemen, you all know me as Colonel Fallon. I've been running this show since June 23rd. 
As you all are intimately aware, we have been waiting patiently to retrieve all American and Allied personnel from forward operating bases across the country so we can leave this godforsaken sandbox and head home. I am pleased to report that after last September's retrieval of the last unit of Marines by Punisher and the resulting radio silence, we are happy to report that we believe we have collected all our boys. The room applauded. Several of the men and women leapt to their feet and cheered, exchanging hugs and high fives. Glenn and Thomas sat quietly, smiling at their fellow Navy men and women, who were glad that the final phase had begun. The tall Fallon gave the group time to celebrate before calming them again and speaking. As you are all aware, on the 20th of January, we sent out the first plane to Rammstein with a heavy load of 202 souls. As you probably have already heard, we've gotten no word of their arrival in Rammstein, Germany. That silenced the room far more than anything could have. Thomas and Glenn already knew that fact was coming. Which leaves us to this meeting. In country, we have 75 men and women. 62 of which are American military personnel or NGO American personnel. The remaining 13 are non-U.S. nationals who have been tremendous assets to our operations here, and I, for one, consider them indispensable. Eight are Polish, three British, and two are New Zealanders. I've invited two of the Poles in for this powwow and all five of the other English speakers. Fallon nodded over to the corner of the room opposite the seals. The seven non-Americans all gave a bit of a wave to the group, and there was a modest round of applause. I'm going to hand the real bad news portion of this over to my Air Force counterpart, Major Gary Locke. Fallon waved a hand at the middle-aged man sitting nearby and took a seat. The shorter Air Force officer took to his feet and spoke loudly. He had a touch of a southern accent. Thomas pegged it as Arkansas. Y'all are excited to go home, yeah? Major Locke asked, a grin on his face. The group shouted out their excitement, though it was tempered now. Well, as some of you know, we've got a single plane operational right now that can make the flight to Europe. It's a C-17 with extended range, and we got room for four vehicles in the belly, plus about 55 passengers. I'll give you a minute to do the math on that. It didn't take long for the assembled group to realize what the bad news was. The plane could only take less than sixty, and there were seventy-five people to transport. Murmurs in the voices of the men and women started to grow. I got this, Gary, Fallon said softly. The major sat as the colonel stood. Listen, folks, we all knew it would be shit. Now we're in the shit. Let's be adults about it. A soldier stood in the center of the room, his face a painting of frustration. Colonel, how are we going to do this? Draw straws? I already volunteered once to stay behind here to help bring our people in, but I want to go home. It wouldn't be fair to stay behind again. Fallon nodded. Lieutenant Carroll, you are absolutely right. It would be unfair to ask anyone to stay behind. The group seemed lifted by the officer's statement. Thomas held his breath. But life ain't fair, young man. Fallon's statement was sadness made aloud. We have been talking this over for some time, and some decisions have been made based on the situation we expect to encounter in Germany when our bird lands, and what we expect to need in terms of expertise should we not be able to link up with our forces there. The situation on the ground here is dire, I don't need to remind you. I can only imagine how bad it is in a heavily populated area like Germany. We're expecting tens of thousands of the dead, if not more. We cannot afford to move fat or slow, and we can only bring a lean force for this or it's our asses. The younger lieutenant took his seat, a frightened scowl on his face. We are prioritizing shooters, medical personnel, mechanical personnel, and then those with electronics experience. After that, we're looking at knowledge of Europe and then basic skills such as gardening, knitting, weaving, pottery, and the like. We've made up a questionnaire for circulation so we can assess what everyone is capable of, beyond what's in your folders. Mikey, give those out, please. Fallon pointed to a stack of photocopies on a plain folding table. A staff sergeant, clearly the one named Mikey, jumped up and grabbed them. 
He then began to roam the room, handing the forms out to nervous and angry servicemen and women. Fallon continued, Anyone who lies on this questionnaire will receive my never-ending wrath. Some of you are aware that I can be a mean motherfucker, and I assure you, all my previous incidents of anger will pale in comparison to what I will do if any of you attempt to sneak on my plane. If you deserve a seat on the plane and a shot at home, you will get it. If you lie to me, I will see to it you are thrown to those fucking wolves outside our wire. The room was silent as Staff Sergeant Mikey handed Glenn and Thomas their questionnaires. The two SEALs sat them on the floor next to where their M4A1 weapons were. They already knew their seats on the plane were assured. Their skill sets were invaluable. Sir, thirteen are staying behind? A female Air Force tech sergeant asked softly. No, sergeant, eighteen. I thought the Air Force taught better math than that. With ammunition, food, parts, and four Humvees, we will only be able to bring fifty-seven souls. Also, we've come to the conclusion that our eight poles are already on the plane. They're a hop, skip, and a jump from home, and if we can accomplish one good thing out of this, we owe them that. I don't think I need to remind you how many of our people they've pulled from the shit in the past few months with our SEAL boys. Fallon inclined his head directly at Glenn and Thomas. There could be little argument there. The Polish soldiers were hard-nosed, never-give-up, deep drinkers of life that everyone loved. The round of applause was genuine, and the two Polish men who were present stood and attempted to appear humble. Thomas knew they were humble men naturally. The attention they were getting was not what they wanted. Fallon continued, Questionnaires are due back to my office by 0900 tomorrow. Final decisions on who will remain behind will be made by the same time the day after that. We are wheels up and headed to Germany 48 hours after the decisions are made. I suggest you all enjoy the lovely March weather here in Afghanistan while we're still here. Dismissed. Everyone but Glenn and Thomas stood and left the room. Not one set of eyes looked up from the sheet of paper filled with questions that held their fates. Glenn and Thomas sat alone in the room, wondering who would be left behind. There was no alcohol left in the base. No beer, no wine, no liquor. Even the mouthwash was long gone. There was no marijuana or cocaine or meth. Even the coffee and tea was becoming rare. So there was no excuse for the violence that ripped through the base late that night. Everyone knew why people had been killed. Despite all their attempts, the local Taliban forces had wound up being unable to control the living dead to use as weapons. The soldiers, marines, airmen, and sailors inside the base had watched through binoculars and rifle scopes as the insurgents were eaten alive one by one by the very locals they'd oppressed for so long. I wonder how many virgins they get if they're eaten alive. You think it's extra, like punitive damages? Glenn had asked. As a result, gunfire had waned in the recent months. With far fewer gun-toting fanatics in the city's picked-apart skeleton to target, there was little to no reason to waste ammunition on the undead. There were simply far too many to kill again, and when they finally left, there would be far too many they'd need to kill where they landed. So, when gunfire erupted late in the night of the meeting, hackles stood on end and the response was swift and harsh. Glenn and Thomas were billeted in a hard-roofed building that resembled a tiny mobile home with a single room, plywood walls, and two beds. Mice and rats came through when the men slept, and the thin wood did little to scare off the late-night, early spring winds. The single light bulb that dangled from the exposed roof rafters hung dark. The men went to bed as soon as the sun set or lit candles. Thomas felt the trailer was opulent compared to some of the places they'd stayed in, the sound of rapid gunfire a few hundred feet away was very loud through the flimsy walls. Thomas sat his MRE bag down and grabbed his body armor without thinking. Glenn tossed his beaten and dog-eared copy of Clive Barker's Weave World and went for his armor as well. Both men were suited up and out the door with their weapons in hand and off safe within thirty seconds. The dark and cold base felt incredibly empty especially after the lights went out for the night and everyone retreated to their bunks or their guard posts. 
It was a desolate place despite being in the middle of a city filled with roaming bodies. But now, in the wake of the quiet night being shattered by violence, everything was starting to come to cold electric light. Guard tower floodlights designed to rain down a frigid beam of blue-white light were snapping on and training over to where the gunfire had come from. The two seals moved towards where the horizontal pillars of luminescence pointed. Another shot rang out in the dark coves of the alleys ahead. One of the Polish soldiers staggered out of a building that was identical to the one Gary and Thomas lived in. His dirty white undershirt had a dark red stain covering the side from his armpit to his waist. He was wounded. At first glance, Thomas knew it wasn't good. The Polish man looked over at the two seals and raised his AK clone a bit, but when he saw the two familiar seals for who they were, he began to sob and drop the weapon. He fell to his knees and pointed with a blood-slicked finger inside the building he'd just exited. His thick accent was further twisted by pain. Americans. Americans. He slid down the side of the billet and laid there, sucking in oxygen with stuttered short breaths. Fuck, Thomas said as he slid up the side of the building. Glenn was directly at his back. Anyone inside still thinking about shooting anyone had better drop their weapons, he hollered out, hoping to God whoever was still inside listened. Silence came back from the interior of the room in response. Silence could be good. The raw metallic smell of blood could only be bad. Battery conservation be damned, Thomas and Glenn flicked on the tiny flashlights mounted on the side rails of their M4A1s, and they went into the room ready for anything. Like theirs, the building had a single room with four bunk beds, one in each corner. A round table had sat in the center of the room, but that was undone. The table was busted apart, and the remnants of it scattered to the four corners of the room. One leg was leaning up against a bunk bed comically, and many shards of wood were strewn about the floor. Five bodies lay in the room. Three were in beds as if they were asleep but the enormous, ominous bloodstains on the blankets revealed a murderous truth. The other two were American service members, and they were face down on the floor in pools of their own blood. The room was entirely devoid of life. Motherfucker, Glenn muttered as four more heavily armed personnel came into the building, ready to kill. They stopped as soon as the carnage was revealed. In the far corner, one of the dead Polish soldiers began to twitch. It was by the grace of God that only four of the Polish warriors were in the barracks at the time of the assault. The others were likely playing poker at the mess hall. Thomas shook his head and drew out his knife. There were too few bullets to spare solely for the sake of mercy. It took Thomas and Glenn two hours to find the three U.S. servicemen who attacked the Polish barracks. They made sure to bring along five other Americans who owed their lives to the dead Polish soldiers. The three murderous miscreants disappeared into the depths of the base and were found hiding in an abandoned maintenance building, a shed, really. The men were injured, and following the trails of blood wasn't too difficult. Two had taken 556 rounds to their limbs, and another was holding a loop of his own intestines as he cried. They begged for mercy when the seals finally found them. Glenn and Thomas were kind. The other five men were not. They reported that the murderers were found dead in the shed, having succumbed to multiple stab wounds. Justice had been served, though now eight less names needed to be thought about. You gotta be fucking kidding me, Colonel Fallon said. The highest-ranking officer still in Kandahar sat behind a ratty desk in a room that was lit by a single Afghan-made candle. Five other men were gathered with the officer in the quiet room in the darkest hours of the night. Two of the men were Glenn and Thomas. No one was happy for any reason. Motive is obvious. No one wants to stay behind. I feel so fucking bad for the Poles. They're good people. All of them would have been an asset, even if we cut them free in Germany, Thomas said softly, his eyes tracing the lines in the skin of his dirty palm. Damn straight one of the others said. He was one of the people that owed their life to the Polish soldiers. Nothing left but who? They lost three and one isn't critical? 
They go from eight to four and a half in twelve goddamn hours. These fucking people, man. Fallon made a fist and hammered it down on the desk. The candle flame flickered. One of the others spoke up. Fallon, this is hard, but we need to take this for what it is. Yes, it's a shame, but it does make our lives a whole hell of a lot easier. We only got to cut ten names now instead of eighteen. Several men voiced some agreement, but Glenn quickly changed their opinions. We can't leave ten behind. Eighteen was one thing. They could have held an area of the base until we could get back here to get them too, but ten? We can't leave ten behind. They won't last. The Air Force Major Gary was there. We could shave off some of the manifest gear we're bringing, try and fit the other ten on. It'd mean bringing less water and food more than likely, but that won't be a problem if we link up with local forces and we can scavenge once we land if need be. Thomas chimed in. I like that idea better than leaving ten behind to go crazy or die, likely both, and in that order to boot. Let's not forget that if we mount a return trip to get the ten left back, we need to know that the base here will be secure to make any kind of landing. I don't think ten men can manage all that. It's asking too much. A marine captain spoke up. We should leave behind people who don't contribute, sir. People who can't or won't help us build a future. Pardon me, Captain? Could you elaborate on what you mean? Fallon sipped water from a coffee mug that said, World's Greatest Lover. The captain gave Thomas a sideways glance. I think there are people we are bringing that aren't representative of what we want to have, sir. I say we leave behind the lazy and morally corrupted, good Christians and good warriors only. You want me to run around this base and ask everyone if they're a good Christian? You gotta be out of your fucking mind, devil dog. I don't give a fart out of a mouse's ass what religion any of us practice right now. You got a personal vendetta against a lazy guy under your command, you deal with it. My marines are fine, sir. I have a problem with some of the Navy boys. Glenn sat forward, ready to get hostile. Say what you fucking mean to say, Captain. We're all big boys here. Torrance, I respect you. My problem lies with your faggot buddy over there. We don't need queers anymore. There's no reason to have them. Thomas didn't respond to the taunting. He'd heard it all, and so much of it from guys like the Marine. Glenn, on the other hand, responded quickly and violently. The seal crossed the distance between he and the Marine in a long stride, and as the Marine stood to defend himself, Glenn put a size 11 combat boot square into the jarhead officer's sternum. The speed and force of the kick launched him right over the back of the metal folding chair and spun him ass over tea kettle. The Marine crashed into a cheap bookshelf that splintered and fell apart on impact. Thomas sat still, shaking his head. Say faggot again, you bitch. Say faggot one more time. I fucking dare you. That man is my brother. He'd die for you if he had to, and he still would, right here, right now, if it meant saving your life, despite you calling him a faggot. You have no right to preach about anything right now. You want to talk about being a good Christian? Glenn was rabid, foaming at the mouth. Two of the officers stepped between the Marine and the SEAL, trying to stop the two from continuing the scuffle. It was a bad place to be. The captain got to his feet with the help of the bent metal chair. He wiped blood from his mouth. Fuck you, pal. I don't need any of his kind watching my back. Fallon, impassive in the face of the two men's rage, spoke quietly, ending it. Captain, I want you to debate something in your thick skull very quickly. Here's your choice, because I've already made mine. Petty Officer Ring will be on that plane. I don't care if he eats pussy or sucks dick. That man has been through it and has shown time and time again he is indispensable. You, on the other hand, have failed to show me why I need you in Germany, Captain, over him. You need to decide if you want to be in Germany with a faggot watching your back or here in Afghanistan with no one watching your back. The young Marine captain looked at his senior officer and then walked out, disgusted. The office door slammed behind him as he left. Everyone out but Ring, Fallon said hard. The room quickly emptied. Thank you, sir, 
Thomas said, still sitting in his own folding metal chair. Shut up. Thomas did as he was told. Son, this is the tenth time you being gay has made my life more of a pain in the ass than it needs to be, and that is a statement of truly epic proportions considering the amount of dead motherfuckers who are outside that thin-ass wall that keeps us safe at night. You understand the sarcasm when I say safe, right? Yes, sir, Thomas said flatly. It has never been my intention to make your life more difficult. If I could, I would make it easier, but that ain't the way of things. Ain't that the truth? Look, son, you're a warrior, died in the wool through and through, and I can't imagine the things you and Glenn have been through. I can't afford to leave men of your caliber behind, but I also don't want to leave that Marine behind either. He's a good leader. A little zealous about his personal beliefs, clearly, but a good Marine. I can't afford to leave him behind either. Patch that up however you can, and that's an order. Thomas nodded, though he was unsure he'd ever be able to see eye to eye with the Marine. Yes, sir. Dismissed, Fallon said as he lifted his personalized mug again. Thomas picked up his weapon and left the room. Glenn was waiting outside. You okay? He tore you a new one, didn't he? The two men fell into step together. Not so much. He wants me to make peace with the captain. I don't think the captain is interested in peace, Tommy. You really need to be a weatherman, Glenn. With that kind of foresight, you'd be a goddamn ringer. I could make plans based on your forecast. Glenn put on a newscaster's overly charismatic tone. Tonight we've got a chance of shitstorm with highs in the fifties. See? Perfect. I would prepare for a shitstorm if I heard that on the nightly news. Well, you ought to prepare for it tonight. I don't suspect that jarhead is going to let me putting a boot into his chest stand for long. I suppose you're right about that. We should sleep in shifts. Thomas sighed, and the two men headed back to their billet. Morning in the mess hall was a dark time. People were up and eating their small meals by 0700 as a rule, and it seemed to Thomas that the room was mostly full with tired eyes and sad faces half an hour prior to normal. Looks like no one else could sleep either, he muttered to Glenn as they sat down at an empty table. Yeah, funny, isn't it? After all the bullshit last night, I'd bet all my back pay every single person in this room is more worried that they're one of the ten that are going to get left behind. Glenn stirred a lump of cool, chunky scrambled eggs on his tray. I believe the Poles aren't thinking that. I'm happy the Brits and the Kiwis are sitting with them. He pointed to the table with the non-U.S. people at it. They seemed somber, united in defeat. Thomas scooped a mouthful of the bland egg material and started to chew it. It was flavorless, so he reached for the salt. He only managed a single shake before the container went empty. Everything in Kandahar was going empty. Heads up, some of that captain's boys are coming this way. Glenn's hand slipped below the table and flicked the holster for his sidearm so it could be drawn faster. Four young Marines with clean faces were walking over towards the seals. Two Air Force personnel at the table next to Glenn and Thomas stood up immediately and walked away, trays in hand. No one wanted to be near what might happen. May we sit with you guys? A young black Marine asked Thomas. He wore three stripes on his shoulder, as many as the others combined. It'd be our pleasure, Marines, Thomas said as he waved to the open seats. As they began to sit, Thomas recognized them as Marines from Firebase Walker. The four Marines put their trays down and slid into the bench seating. All six ate their mediocre breakfast in silence before the black sergeant spoke again. Hey, we, uh, we heard about what happened last night after the Polish guys got whacked. The four Marines all sent out strange messages with their body language. Some were tense, sitting up too straight like they were expecting a fight. The others were slouching, sad, and defeated. The seals were unsure what to expect. Oh, yeah? Glenn answered. The sergeant sat his fork down on the metal tray. Yeah, we wanted to talk about it. Apologize for the captain. He's been tripping the last two months, and what he said ain't cool with all of us. Just wanted you to know we can think for ourselves. I appreciate that. I also understand he's got a right to his beliefs, Thomas said nonchalantly as he scooped up more fake egg. The sergeant looked perplexed. 
How can you say that? The man called you a faggot and said you should be left behind. You should be royally pissed off. You got every right to be. Thomas smirked. You know, in the past five, six months, I've had almost a dozen men here approach me and ask me to blow them. The awkwardness at the table got worse. Suck them off, in my billet, in the mess hall here, in their quarters, you name it. I've been cornered by two guys at the same time, twice asking me to fuck them. You know why? Because we're in jail, for Christ's sake. You think I like being locked behind these fucking walls with a bunch of horny assholes that think just because I'm gay I'll fuck any of them? There are too few women here to satisfy the needs of the straight men, and too few gay men to satisfy the needs of the straight men. Thomas paused and let that sink in. So, you ask me why I'm not pissed off about a captain that's read too much of his Bible of late? Because he's entitled to his opinion. Because maybe he's got a fucking point. Maybe a fag like me doesn't belong in a world where I won't make babies with a woman. Maybe I'm not angry because he at least has the decency to hate me to my fucking face, instead of talk behind my back or come at me holding a gun telling me I need to get him off because he just can't wait any longer to get home. I'm done being angry over me being gay, guys. The only thing I'm angry about is when my friends and family die, and last night, quite a few of my friends died, so, Sergeant, yeah, I'm pissed off, real pissed off. But not for what you think. The silence lasted for several minutes, and no one wanted to break it. Finally, the sergeant spoke up. I'm sorry, man. I, I had no idea. Thomas shrugged. We, uh, we just wanted to support you. Let you know that we appreciate what you did for us back in September. We wouldn't be here if you hadn't come out and gone to battle for us. Captain Allen might be our commanding officer, but we stand beside you guys on this. The Marines all added their agreement, and the awkwardness abated somewhat. Well, guys, I appreciate that a great deal, but... He is your CO, and you gotta do what you're told, same as me. Glenn chimed in. Is he real pissed at me? I split his lip pretty good last night. The men all laughed and nodded. A corporal responded. Yeah, he's real pissed, but he learned his lesson. He was calling for blood most of the night last night, but we got him grounded. He feels a little like an asshole now, which is good. I'll talk to him later today, see if we can't squash this, Glenn said. Everyone seemed to think that was a decent idea. The two SEALs put themselves near the office of the colonel at 0900 when the questionnaires were due to be handed in. Every person remaining on the base made their way over to the office with the single sheet of paper in their hand. Staff Sergeant Mikey waited patiently, taking each sheet and checking it for names and to ensure that each question had been answered. Thomas and Glenn handed theirs in last. Dinner in the mess hall had a morgue feel. The marine captain sat alone at a long folding table, pushing his food around in the cafeteria tray's indentations. He looked lonely, worried, and still angry. Glenn got up from his table and walked over to the officer. May I? Glenn asked after the marine finally looked up. Free country, so to speak. Thanks. Glenn sat down. He wasted no time. Captain Allen, I wanted to say a few things to you. The Marine officer took a sip of water from a cup and sat it down. Go ahead. His voice carried a good deal of anger still. I wanted to say I was sorry for kicking you in the chest last night. I never should have struck a senior officer, and I wanted to thank you for not pressing charges against me. Captain Allen snorted. And in what military court would I find justice on that matter, sailor? Fair enough. I also wanted to try and clear the air on my buddy Tommy. The captain visibly ruffled. Just the mention of the seal's name caused him distress. I don't care to talk about that or him anymore. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm talking about it, and you need to listen, Glenn said flatly. The marine captain took his tray and started to stand, but Glenn's hand shot out and snapped shut around the officer's wrist. Captain Allen glared down at the still-seated seal, a darkness growing in his eyes. They were a second away from clashing again. Sit, please. I'd rather we talked like gentlemen. I can beat what I want to say into you, but that won't solve anything. 
I don't like gay people, and I don't want to talk about them. The Marine still stood, still angry. I don't think we're in a position as human beings to like or dislike anyone that can keep us alive, Captain Allen. Have a seat, please. Glenn was firm, and after another moment of the mess hall staring, the Marine sat down. He didn't eat. Glenn let go of the wrist and started speaking. Tommy is a good human being, Captain. He's killed dozens and dozens of insurgents, saving SEALs, Marines, and soldiers all at the same time. He's given medical aid to children, adults, and animals, all while under enemy fire. He's received years and years of special operations training and has given up a personal life for his nation. He's a patriot, he's a brother, and he's a son. I would die for him right now if it meant he'd have a chance at living, and I know for certain he'd do the same for me. The captain sat silently, listening angrily. He reads books. He likes comic books, too. He plays football and baseball and could compete as an Olympic swimmer if he felt like it. He has a brother in the Navy and had a brother in both the Army and the Marines. They're all straight, if you're curious. Good for them, the Marine quipped. Good for them, exactly. But you know what, Alan? We've got Tommy, not them. And he's the best man on this damn base. And you need to understand that if you're a good Christian, then you need to see that God has put Tommy where he is for a reason. You need to understand that you have been put here to work with us, to rebuild this world in a better way. And if God has seen fit to have Tommy be a piece of that new world, then you need to search deep inside yourself and at the very least, Accept him as the world-class Tier 1 shooter he is. Captain Allen looked long into Glenn's eyes, searching for the lie, but there was none. Glenn had said everything in truth to the best of his passion and the best of his ability. I'll think on it, sailor. Dismissed. Glenn stood and picked up his tray. Thank you, sir. Everyone was gathered. The weather turned warm the following morning, and the colonel elected to have everyone meet outside. Everyone was asked to leave all their weapons behind, with the exception of the officers. They were providing security for when the bad news was announced. Colonel Fallon spoke loudly over the cool Afghan wind. Before we get into this, I want us all to share a moment of silence for the men we lost two nights ago. Everyone bow your heads. Everyone did. The loss of life was a powerful thing, and... The loss of life now was something much worse. It spoke to darkness that there should be dead due to needless greed. I've received everyone's paperwork and we've gone over them. In the light of us losing eight men, things have changed. We cannot leave behind ten people to hold this base, so we've made cuts on what we're bringing with us on the plane so we can bring everyone. The gathered didn't quite put it together. We are leaving no one behind. An eruption of joy happened. Soldiers, airmen, marines, men and women alike all grabbed at the person standing closest to them and embraced them in relief. The colonel gave them several minutes to let all that tension escape. Of course, this means there will be other sacrifices. We cannot leave a Humvee behind, despite that being a lot of weight we could cut. We will be bringing 67 bodies, and the vehicles we are bringing can only fit 20. We will have a lot of people on foot, and we need the vehicle weapon platforms for support. Everyone will be allowed to bring their weapons, their clothing, and 40 pounds of miscellaneous gear. No more. If you need a weight allowance, Major Locke will approve it. The group seemed to approve thus far. We're bringing less water and food than we'd like, but water is heavy. We'll have to rely on purification when we arrive in Europe, should the situation on the ground be bad. Major Locke also asked me to remind you all that the plane only has 53 seats as configured, so there will be quite a few of us hanging on for dear life during takeoffs and landings. A soldier raised his hand and the colonel called on him. Sir, are we expecting this shit in Europe, or is there a chance things are better than they are here? Son, I'd be lying to you if I thought things were good. We haven't heard a peep from anyone in a real long time. I think the situation outside their wire will be similar to ours, likely far worse, in fact. If we land at Rammstein, we'll be up in the air safe here and down on the ground safe there. When we link up, we'll make good plans to figure out what's next. 
What happens if we don't link up? Another soldier asked. The colonel scratched his skull through shortly cropped gray hair. He coughed and then answered the question. If we are unable to link up, we will find a place to lock down and then evaluate what we need based on the unfolding environment. This sounds dangerous, sir, another soldier said. It does, Corporal, but sitting here is dangerous too, and there's nothing left in this country for us. I can't speak for all of you, but I'd rather die in Europe trying to make it work than die here alone running out of ammo one dead motherfucker at a time. More applause came. Thomas and Glenn escaped away as the men and women who served their nation became more and more excited at the prospect of maybe making it home. Despite being trained warriors, the gathered military men and women had no idea what to expect. The base and all of its hungry inhabitants had two days to get their things ready. Glenn and Thomas were already prepared. Living as a SEAL meant always having your bags packed and ready to go in a moment's notice. Glenn had taken the initiative and approached Major Locke already, and had gotten the clearance to bring along far more gear than what was okayed. The SEALs had extra weapons gear, body armor, medical equipment, and more that they used on a regular basis. It would be silly to leave it behind if the weight could be accounted for. Glenn and Thomas sat together in a guard post far away from the bulk of their brethren. The only person nearby was an army sergeant named Garcia and his dog, Taco. The sergeant was going over dog training drills with the animal. Garcia had been a canine handler before the world ended, but his original military-issued bomb-sniffing dog had been killed saving his life. When they found the ugly mutt stray living under a pile of rubble near the airbase, Garcia had adopted it immediately, and the base had voted to call it Taco. Now Taco was a well-trained, loyal canine that did anything and everything Garcia asked of it. Mostly, he told his soldiers when the dead were near. Watching everyone hastily run around the base packing and organizing was bad for Zen Quiet, so the men had offered to take a shift from a pair of guys who still needed to get their shit together. Here in the tower, the only thing that could bother them was Taco barking at his best friend Garcia. Thomas was prone behind the scope of his M110 sniper rifle, and Glenn was standing, looking through a pair of binoculars. There were thousands of dead Afghans roaming the streets, wandering aimlessly. From this distance, they looked drunk or high. Through the optics, though, their truth was made apparent. Many were missing parts of their bodies, an arm gone here, a jaw ripped off there. Their clothing was stained dark from their own blood and the blood of undead attackers. It seemed that everyone had died at the hands of the dead here, or in some kind of foolish explosion engineered by the now fallen Taliban. I will not miss this place, Thomas said as he scanned the sector they were assigned. Yeah, me either, Glenn spat off the tower. His phlegm sailed through the air and landed on the dirty Kandahar street between two zombies. They clawed and bit at the air, not realizing the spit had come from above. You think the zombies in Europe will be as dumb as the ones here? I think they'll be the same. I can't imagine the disease or virus that's causing this has different effects based on what it's killing. I am kind of worried about what we're going to see when we land, though, in terms of numbers. Germany's got millions of people, and Lahnstuhl is a good-sized town, as is Kaiserslautern. Shit, it's like what, an hour away from Frankfurt? That's a million people at least. We are not bringing a million bullets, Glenn said idly, watching the two zombies claw at the Hesco barrier wall below the tower. No, my friend, we are not. You think we're going to make it? You think this story has a happy ending? I think we need a plan B. What we're going to do when the shit hits the fan after we're wheels down in Europe? What's our short term and what's our long term? Short term... Assuming we're unable to link up with ground forces there immediately is find a safe place for us to settle while we get intel on the region. Either that or get into the base and see if we can gather intel there. The two zombies shuffled and bumped into one another, throwing them into a silent frenzy. Taco the dog barked behind the seals. They scratched and clawed at one another needlessly, tearing skin and clothing away. The noise of the dog was getting them riled up. Glenn shook his head. I agree. Once we're stable, then what? Is our end goal to try and make it back to the States? Do we risk a transatlantic flight? 
There are no air refueling wings up in the sky to give us a drink on the way. Boat? Thomas pulled back from the scope and considered the idea. Yeah, maybe a boat. What's a major port near there? The two seals thought about it for some time, watching the city rot as their brains worked overtime. We head south to Italy or north to what? France? Belgium? Thomas shook his head. No, we head to the Netherlands, northwest, Rotterdam, big city and one of the world's largest ports. There should be a dozen freighters or cruise ships there we could take. We just need to clear a boat and make it safe, then train up a crew for a good long sail. We got the one coasty. Between the three of us, that'd be something. Maybe we could link up with some locals, Glenn suggested. We're getting way ahead of ourselves here. Who knows what it's going to be like there. At the moment, we need to focus on the next 40 hours and making sure everything we need gets on that plane. When we land in Germany or wherever we put down, we assess and move then. I like the boat idea. We're seals. We're supposed to like boat ideas. It seemed like no one slept, and that was probably the truth. The hive of activity centered around the C-17 Globemaster aircraft that was their ride closer to home. Once the four Humvees were loaded in by the Loadmaster, the rest of the gear was packed in person by person. Earlier in the week, the Loadmaster had his job cut out for him. A precarious balancing act was in the works. Too much weight in the wrong place meant the aircraft would fly strangely and be unsafe. If the gear wasn't stowed properly, it could come loose and become dangerous projectiles in turbulence. God forbid the vehicles come free while in flight. The C-17's passengers loaded in at 0300 in the morning. A 0400 departure on a roughly 2800-mile trip with an average cruising speed of just over 500 miles per hour put them at Rammstein in roughly six hours. With no weather information, there was no way to gauge how powerful the headwind would be. Accounting for the change in hours due to time zones, that put wheels on the ground in Germany at 0600 hours local. They'd have the entire day to figure out the world. Assuming they didn't run out of fuel first or crash and die for a different reason. The plane lifted into the air with grace, cutting through the clouds like a knife and finding smooth air to ride above. Spirits were high. The wounded pole was strapped to a stretcher that was attached to the floor, and his comrades were near him. Their spirits seemed elevated even after the death of so many of their countrymen. The pilots got the plane to cruising altitude and speed very quickly, almost before the remnants of Kandahar were left behind. From high in the sky, the human debris they were abandoning was almost invisible, and things seemed normal, if only for a moment, if only at a distance. As the plane racked up mile after mile of flight, the pilots called out on all the channels, trying to hail other planes or airport towers that might still be operational. None responded. The men and women departing Afghanistan were alone in the skies and, for all they knew, the whole world. The time passed as fast as the plane flew northwest. All right, everyone, Captain Allen said over the roar of the C-17's engines. We are an hour from touchdown. When we land, every single weapon is to be charged and on safe. If we are able to put down at Rammstein, we will assess the situation on the ground. If it is safe, we will exit the plane from side door exits initially, secure the tarmac, then open the rear cargo doors to get our vehicles out. If we put down at an airfield, we are going to try and secure a hangar to keep the plane safe for future trips. That's our priority. Glenn and Thomas were putting their kit on. They were already on board with the plan. They helped design it. If we are to put down outside the AFB or not at an airfield, then the plan stays the same. Form a perimeter and secure it so we can get the vehicles out of the bird. Once we get the heavy weapons loaded onto the turrets of the trucks, we'll be able to rock and roll a little better. I've got my sergeants assigned to form fire teams. They'll be around to group and discuss specifics you need to know. Captain Allen made his way towards the front of the aircraft, past the four trucks that were taking up so much of the space inside it. Thomas sat back in the cargo strapping seat and closed his eyes. He fell quickly into a deep and strange sleep. Colonel Fallon stood in the cramped cockpit of the C-17. 
The two pilots sat in their seats ahead of him, slumped and worried. All three wore flight headsets. You're sure? Fallon asked. The pilot responded, Yes, sir. Nothing at all from the tower. Still nothing at all from anywhere. Dead air. By all rights, someone somewhere should be hearing us. A ham radio operator, someone, something, somewhere. But we're pulling jack shit. Could it be our comms gears on the bird? Fallon asked into the microphone. Are we Helen Keller up here? We tested everything before we left, all green. This is grade A fucking weird, Colonel. Roger that. Keep heading. Fuel okay? The co-pilot answered. Yeah, we're doing well. There's almost no headwind at all, so we're burning slow, all things considered. We won't be able to loiter long once we get there, but we've got some options. Good work, people. Keep me appraised, Fallon said, and then took off the headset. Thomas slumbered in a deep sleep, the kind of sleep that only someone who has accepted their fate wholly can. The sleep of a guilty convict or of a man with true faith. In this dream, Tommy met a stranger. There was an unfamiliar house in the dream, a small home with a modest kitchen that had a mudroom attached, a living room attached opposite the mudroom. Tommy sat next to an island covered in dust. Are you Thomas? A man's voice said from behind him. Tommy spun and reached to his thigh for his sidearm, but the pistol wasn't there. He looked down and realized he was wearing civvies and had no weapon. When he looked up, he saw a man sitting in the living room recliner, feet up. He was middle-aged and had the look of a proud father to him, though at the edge of his vision, Tommy felt he could see sadness seeping through the man's face like a stain on a ceiling. I'm Thomas. Who are you? Tommy stayed in the dream house's kitchen and looked around for a weapon, a knife, a rolling pin, anything. My name is Doug Manning, Tommy. May I call you Tommy? I don't see why not. This is a dream, after all. Tommy spotted a butcher's block on the counter near the sink. When he looked back to the man named Doug, he saw a stain of blood on the floor. Somewhere in the back of his mind, he almost thought the stain was talking to him rather than the man in a chair. It's a dream of a sort, Tommy. I've spent the last few days looking for you. You're a long ways from home. A long trip from your brother. Tommy laughed. Which brother? I've got three. Your brother Adrian. Tommy's dream heart spiked. Is Adrian alive? Adrian was his favorite brother, the one he was closest to. Very much so. He's doing great work. Tommy felt a strange relief from the dream. It almost felt like real relief. Why am I dreaming this? Where is this house? Who are you? I don't have long, Tommy. Keeping this connection is incredibly difficult. Dozens of us are working together, focusing to get this message to you. I need for you to listen. Talk. I'm hearing you. You'll be tempted to leave where you're headed, to try and get on a boat and come back to America, but you can't. You shouldn't leave. Why not? I can't go home? You don't think I've earned it, stranger in my dream? Not yet. Your presence will be very important in Europe. You need to do work there, prepare things. What things? We can't see all the details, Tommy, but we know that eventually your brother's fight may move. He may decide to leave where he is now to help elsewhere, and if he should do that, he will need your help. Secure a place for him. Give him a home base and greeting that will live up to his stature. <laughs> stature? You haven't met him, have you? Dick and fart jokes are the extent of his stature. Do you know he slipped and shit himself wearing a snowsuit once? They don't give out statues for that. People change, Tommy. If he succeeds at what he's been tasked to do, then he'll deserve a welcoming that will be historic. Yeah, whatever, Doug Manning. Time to wake up. Bad news is about to reach you. Tommy, wake up. You gotta see this. Glenn's voice echoed in the dream. Tommy's real eyes opened, and he saw his buddy standing over him in the back of the plane. Turbulence gently shook them side to side. Tommy rubbed his eyes and huffed the cobwebs out of his skull. He stood with Glenn's help. Come up to the cockpit, Glenn beckoned. That's Rammstein below us, the co-pilot said to the two seals. Fallon, Locke, and Allen were all nearby, some squeezed into a space where they could see out the cockpit windows, others nearby just to listen. 
And that is a large plane smashed apart in the middle of the runway, Glenn said. Correct. And as you can see, there are multiple vehicles parked in the other runways. Those, the co-pilot pointed out the windows, are impact craters from bombs. Looks like the base was abandoned and they dropped ordnance to prevent it from being used by an enemy. We've got no clear approach, the co-pilot said. And I would assume that all those people walking about down there in uniform are not on patrol, nor are they doing PT? No, sir. They look pretty fucking dead to me. Then Rammstein has fallen, Fallon said with finality. I wonder if the boys at the hospital made it. Plan B? Thomas asked quickly. He didn't want to give depression any time to sink in, for him or for anyone else. We flew over a clear airfield in Erfurt. We're going to turn us around and put down there. We've got enough fuel. Fallon seemed pleased. All righty. Once we put down, we'll secure some place nearby as an HQ and start making plans for tonight and tomorrow. Everyone left the cockpit and began to head back into the aft of the plane except for Thomas. He pointed his eyes through the thick cockpit windows and looked downward as the pilots tilted the plane and started to turn it around. Far down, thousands and thousands of feet below, Thomas could see the ant specks of the remnants of mankind. As far as he could see in the streets and in the fields and across all of visible Germany were the walking dead, an ominous army mindless in purpose, endless in numbers, and unstoppable. The horde covered all he could see. In the face of all that, all Thomas could think about was his brother and the strange visit in his dream. February 2014 February 3rd, 2014 Kevin and I have been preparing for the NVC visit behind the scenes, off the official record. Just two concerned citizens of Bastion trying to make sure our home is prepared for potential bad stuff. We've moved one diesel dually and two of our Prius cars far off campus and to a secluded home on a country road on the north side of town. The cars are parked in a garage there along with two barrels of diesel and two barrels of gasoline that Blake gave us on the sly. We hit our tire tracks with brush to make sure they couldn't see the movement after the fact from the air. We've also moved weapons caches, food, water, and more to several safe houses in the event we need to bug out or they try and take our weapons. Kevin and I have drafted a plan for what to do if it goes south, and we're ready to follow through in a moment's notice if need be. I've been doing this with snow machines late at night while wearing NVGs with Kevin. We're slipping out the back gate into the forest onto our secret trails in the woods and moving things one sled at a time. It's taken hours, late hours, where I leave Michelle with Otis in a cold bed, but it's done now, and I feel good about it. Gilbert did this shit back in the day. He slid around on his snow machine, using gas he got from me to do things he didn't want to tell me about. If I'm doing it now, does that make me an asshole or a hero? Either way, it makes me like Gilbert. I accept my fate in this matter. I know Michelle knows. I can feel her awareness pouring off her as if it were sweat on a hot day. I know she's turning a blind eye to it. It's her job to be the optimist. It's my job to pull the trigger when things go bad. I hope I've left that battleground behind me, but if I have to protect my people, I will, and until the day I am forced to take up arms comes again, I will smile and be friendly and give everyone the opportunity to do the same to me. Adrian February 6th, 2014 Yesterday was a good day, and I had to skip a good portion of it due to anxiety. Early on in the morning before the NVC convoy arrived here, I offered to Kevin that I could take one of the horseback patrol shifts. Offered and could. I wanted to miss the early parts of their tour here. I couldn't bear the idea of being here to welcome those assholes. Kevin obliged me, and I started to conquer my fear of horses. I'd taken a few lessons already from the Texans who'd brought them, but I'd avoided them, the animals, not the Texans, intentionally for a long time. Yesterday morning helped. I went out with Bud, Donna, and Ethan to do a short tour of the place. 
I had Ethan sent off-site in the event things got violent. I had to protect our medical team. We watched from deep in the tree line off of Route 18 as their vehicles went past and made the turn up Auburn Lake Road. We didn't have to give them directions. A few minutes later, the helicopter flew overhead, taking the straight route. I don't know why they brought the helo or why it lagged behind, failing to provide adequate cover or provide an eye in the sky on the route they were taking. Sloppy. When I returned, the tour was already in full swing. Michelle led the way, supported by Abby and Hal, as well as Ollie and Sylvia. It was a cross-section of people they knew, people in charge of things, shooters and non-shooters, and the brain trust. Abby served as our resident journalist, though she didn't advertise that until much later in the day, so I'm told. I pieced together a lot from asking folks this morning what they saw. Michelle really stepped up her game for me and looked at the things I asked her about from the Spring Meadow trip, as well as staying on point for her own agenda. She evaluated them like a courtroom lawyer. The convoy delivered a huge complement of people in a small package. They came in one APC and three Humvees and somehow managed to transport thirty people. Most were logistics types, not shooters, which was nice. They also landed the helo in the road outside of the gate and allowed most of the adults and all of the kids to come see the helicopter. They scored major points with the parents and kids with that, which might have been the reason they brought the bird. Sway the kids and you get the parents. What else? Michelle let them see all the halls inside and out, though she kept their visits out of the bedrooms and basements, common spaces only. Otis hissed and booked ass when they came through. Smart cat. He and I are cut from the same cloth. They toured our cafeteria, hydroponics facility, which, by the way, we crush them on, our staged armories, the maintenance area, the barns, and the medical clinic, which their doctor, Tina Ackworth, seemed impressed by. She got along with our vet-slash-doctor Fletcher really well, too. Maybe they're cut from the same cloth, too. We didn't tell them about Ethan or Joel, nor Kevin or Quan, or Kate or Nick, or the rest of our military men and women, their elite military status doesn't need to go on the roll of things they're acquiring. After about eight solid hours of Michelle leading Mazaki around and me trying to ignore the feeling of my space being violated, we wrapped it up with a huge open meeting and dinner in the cafeteria. Somehow, Michelle worked with Ollie and Melissa to get a feast up and prepared, all while I was squirreling my nuts away in the forest. She works in miracles— I work in foul language and toes pushing shit down shower drains. Play to your strengths. Speaking of Ollie and Melissa, she's as pregnant as three people. They're due literally any minute now, and somehow Melissa still managed to kill it. She runs the cooking operation here, as well as managing the food storage and production behind the scenes, and run their family while Ollie slaves away to keep us all fed. This place would survive if I went down in a gunfight, but if we lost Ollie or Melissa... We'd be fucked in six months. I'm excited to meet their next ginger baby. Baby Martha and her red curls is the cutest and well-behaved, and I'm sure number two will be the same. The open-air meeting was a blast. I sat with Michelle near the front as my people grilled the living shit out of the NBC council members. I thought the MGR people were thorough, but holy shit, our folks put them to shame. We talked about trade, economics, Security, short-term plans for integration, long-term plans for expansion, resource allocation, repopulation plans, and what the immigration policy would be on where people could live. They talked about weather, food shortages, and food production. They asked them personal questions. Mazaki is married with a daughter and son, both in their early teens, and they asked them about impersonal things like how much medicine they have in the event of a cholera outbreak. Oregon Trail, anyone? They also grilled them about vehicle repair, news and entertainment, shockingly little up there, it would appear, as well as education for kids. They did their best to answer the questions, but they didn't have answers for it all, and that made me feel a lot better. We don't have answers for it all either, and if they had faked it, we would have caught it and stomped them right down the drain. But alas, they came, they saw, and they were cool. Veni Vidi Nido. We're signing the official treaty on the 12th at the factory. 
I've stipulated that I will not allow the treaty to move forward if Pasta is a part of their organization in a decision-making capacity. He gives me the bubble guts, and I want to punch him in the face when I hear his ugly name or think about his ugly face. Michelle is taking the lead on negotiating, as it should be. I'm stepping back and allowing her to do her thing, because I want to be able to say I told you so if it shits the bed. Maturity has always been a struggle for me. We meet with Maria and her people tomorrow, barring bad weather, again. Adrian February 12th, 2014 Almost Valentine's Day. I'm about to put head to pillow, but I wanted to write a few words in here before I do so. The treaty signing went well earlier today at the factory. I believe it went well because I made sure Kevin remained back at Bastion to hold down the fort. Kev is still hot under the collar about conceding any control of anything, but he's come around a good bit. No matter how far he moves from his original position, he's still apprehensive about the whole deal. Can't say that I blame him. I'm starting to believe all diplomacy is is agreeing to something that's halfway to getting fucked and then hoping the other guy doesn't go all the way anyway and finish fucking you. How did anyone get anything done? For that matter, how did they get rid of their paranoia and need to protect their people in all ways? I'm not good at giving up ground in places to get it elsewhere. I'm too all or nothing as a thinker, I think. Anyway, worthless treaty is signed on paper that won't last time. In under a week, the NBC moves their support unit down here to assist us in the event of an attack. We agreed to no more than two vehicles and ten soldiers, and that was agreeable to them. We're giving them one of the smallest staff houses at the far rear of campus that's remained empty. We haven't put anyone in it because we usually do our funeral fires back there, but that's an easy fix. We'll build something more stoic and permanent for funeral services on the shore of Auburn Lake. Putting them back there will also keep their vehicles out of the way. Michelle spoke to them minutes prior to the signing and blindsided them with my big claws. I told her to tell them in order for this to happen, we had to have Picarillo removed from service. At the very least, he had to be moved to a desk job where he was no longer in charge of people outside their wire. Mazaki pushed back against her on it, but she stood firm and explained that we had people who knew Picarillo was the shit on their heels and that we couldn't associate ourselves with him if he went out and did something shady again. We couldn't risk our reputation, such as it is, for him. If he did something, it'd be an on-the-spot deal-breaker. Thorpe understood completely, according to Michelle, and she went further and said she thought Thorpe handled Mazaki in a way that told her they both knew that this was coming. They got the agreement amended, and I'm happy to say Captain Pasta will now be stirring his noodle solo as either a retiree or a pog inside Calendar Mountain. If I ever see him again, I'm going to raise hell to get him strung up. He's bad, and I can smell it a mile away. Smug motherfucker. I guess Jay Wilson and his sister pitched a fit while we were gone, but they've since been calmed down, mostly by me when I returned. I explained that we had Picarillo sent off to the pasture, and that seemed to help. I think the little sister Sharon is still simmering, but I think we can appease her for the time being, all for the greater good. Anyway, all is well otherwise. Weather is crisp and cold, our food supplies are holding up better than we thought, Zada Ollie's crew for a banner harvest, as well as Ryan and Becca killing it with the hydroponics. We're also excited because we now have the Calendar Mountain food exchange option to trade in our excess to get variety. Our wheat harvest lacked this season, but we've got so many pumpkin and apple byproducts, it's not even funny. Bi weekly trips for staff exchanges and food swaps are the new rule. I'm kind of excited. Oh, and the meeting a few days ago with Maria actually happened. We met at the same overpass as before and did some pretty routine trade stuff. The above-mentioned pumpkin and apple byproducts traded well, and we were able to procure some flour and medical supplies that they accumulated. Maria knew about our NBC shit due to the radio traffic, no secrets on an unencrypted channel or an encrypted channel that she has the encryption for, and she seemed hesitant at best about it. 
Worried, I would say. I couldn't find fault. She said for now they'd call off trade meetings with us so we could get our house in order. She said to reach out to her when we were ready, and I thanked her for her patience and understanding. She's a good egg. Adrian February 18th, 2014 The men arrived from the NVC today and got settled in quick and without incident. The initial complement of soldiers came with a Humvee and a single Bradley APC. The Humvee has an MK-19 grenade launcher mounted in the turret, and the APC has an M250 cal. The men are armed with standard infantry gear the guard would have supplied them with before that day, supplemented by civvy gear as needed when shit fails and can't be repaired. Their leader is a Lieutenant Dana Lamanowitz, Polish as fuck. He's a decent guy and did a good job of listening and doing what he was told when he arrived. He treated Michelle as more of an authority figure than Kevin or I, which may or may not be the smartest thing I've ever seen someone do. Time will tell. The rest of his eight guys looked and acted like you'd expect and stayed close to his ass. I think they'll be more social as time goes on. They'll need to make an effort to be part of our community if they want to be accepted. So yeah, it went well, and didn't feel nearly as strange as I thought it would. Maybe because I spent most of the day playing PlayStation while watching Baby Gavin here in Hall E. Pick your battles. Adrian February 24th, 2014 Been super busy with the hydroponics facility and Ollie and Melissa's new baby. They welcomed their new daughter, Barbara Ann, with the dawn on the 22nd. Somehow, Melissa knew and had everything all set up and ready to go. In anticipation of the arrival of their new kid, Ollie had been working more or less around the clock to build three new hydro bays for the gymnasium. It isn't a massive addition to our capabilities there, but it will help bolster any lack of effort he has when it comes to helping Melissa and his two daughters. For a guy who I thought wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed when I first met him, all he has his shit together. Ginger or not, you gotta give the guy credit. His dad would be so proud of him and everything he's done here. I mean, you gotta spot me a mulligan on him. I made him piss his pants when we first met. Anyway... The other bit of news is that Lieutenant Lemanowitz and his crew have settled in well. The men are respectful and helpful and have been assigned tertiary duties to help around campus while they're stationed here. The Humvee and the tank haven't moved unless we've asked them to move them, and they aren't even carrying sidearms around. Only the lieutenant, and he's legit calm. I must say, when they do move the tank for us, I have weird dreams about it that night. Sweaty, anxiety-ridden dreams of IEDs and Iraq. I dream of Kevin a lot in those dreams, and that's comforting because it means I'm still dreaming of the living. In all, they suck, but I know they're just memories dredged up by the presence of armor. Things are going great. Maybe this was all blown out of proportion after all. Adrian March 2014 March 2nd, 2014 Sitting here in the old common-slash-living room of Hall E watching the snow fall outside the windows that are still half-boarded up, I had the realization that tomorrow is March 3rd. That means in just a few hours, it'll be the third hour of the third day of the third month again. Maybe you remember what happened back a few years ago when that little celestial bullshit lined up. Bad dreams of Cassie, followed by waking to the entirety of campus being overrun by book-carrying dead? Huh. <laughs> Shenanigans. Subtle fuck you by God, I suppose. You're the scribe, Adrian. Here's a thousand undead-carrying books to let you know your job. Now do it. It's a shame I didn't figure it all out earlier. Might have saved more lives. Maybe not. And let's not even talk about me going back into the city and finding Cassie in her speaking undead form on March 3rd a year later. Coincidence? I think the fuck not. So much has happened. Pain and suffering. All for what? 
I can't control what tomorrow brings beyond whether or not Michelle and I take some venison out of the freezer to eat, which I do believe I'll ask her about. We haven't had any meat in a few days, and while I do love quiche and carrots and old canned beans, some venison chops sautéed in fresh garlic and olive oil sound like the way to celebrate 333 Day. Ugh, protein. In other news, MGR, The Factory, and Spring Meadow are all reporting increased foot traffic. Nothing hostile, but there are a lot of people who are new to the area wandering about, setting up shop in houses and apartments, mostly near Spring Meadow and The Factory right now, but MGR reported seeing new fires in town this evening, so who knows? Weird that people are traveling at all right now. Snowstorms are bad and regular, and... With all the roads and neighborhoods overgrown and unplowed, there's no easy way to get anywhere. We're able to only because we have the infrastructure, read plows, and reasons to plow. What would make so many people want to leave where they were in February or March? Go huddle by a fire, you idiots. Stay warm and fed. Avoid the cold and getting lost. I hope this is not some portent of doom. An exodus from anywhere at this point can't be good. I need a fucking break from doom and gloom. And we were doing so well. NBC people are still cool. Adrian. March 7th, 2014. Nothing weird happened on the 3rd. Well, more pilgrims. Pilgrims in the I traveled a far journey to reach a spiritual place or person sense the creepy kind. Michelle's shitting golden eggs over this. It's literally the birth of a new religion and she's got front row seats. No, fuck that. She's on stage front and center. I get to stand beside her and Kevin is in the corner wearing his white warden protective group dunce cap. Yeah, I do literally mean we are watching the birth of a religion and I get to be a part of it. So not excited. Can we also have an aside right here and discuss that if Michelle were actually laying golden eggs, I'd be disappointed they weren't real eggs? I'd rather have the protein than the precious metal. Go figure. Leading a small group of men and women that literally knocked on the door downtown at MGR was an older man named Peter White. Yesterday, the group of five people with seven horses appeared camped out at the base of the tower with a small fire going. The nighttime watch somehow didn't see them approach, nor start the fire, which is halfway between creepy and awesome. I went down there this afternoon and visited with the noobs. Mike and Patty said that I should. Texas Rich, the new guy David, plus Quan and I, drove down in a Humvee with one of the MVC sergeants in the turret, Sergeant Rodriguez. Seems nice. Forms full sentences, eats his crayons with a fork and knife. White's this short, gruff old dude with stark white hair and a square jaw. He's seen some grizzled action. You don't need to see the old scar on his neck to tell. I can see it in the way he looked at me and by the way he chose his words so carefully. He had a small Beretta and a leather holster on his left hip, and the holster didn't look new if you catch my drift. I'd place a two-Michelle butt-egg wager that the front side of that pistol is worn down nice and shiny from being drawn once or twice. I think the man has experienced some terrible stuff during a long life of being busy, and even more so since that day. He says he came all the way up from the Virginia area with his two nephews and their two wives. They heard of the Trinity, specifically noting me, and they've been making their way up for a couple months. They had dreams, just like many of us did. The boys were all cops in Virginia, and they still had their police-issued gear right down to the Velcro patches identifying the original departments they worked for. AR-15s, Glock handguns, Kevlar, cuffs, etc. The wives looked just as rugged and carried firearms of their own. His nephews were mid-twenties, both military veterans, and White served in the Army during Nam. The five of them are shooters to a one, and I liked that. White reminds me of Gilbert, if Gilbert swapped a sense of humor for brooding eyes and wary smiles. They asked if there was room in town for them to stay close to Bastion, and yes, they called it that, and Mike and Patty offered them apartments at MGR on the spot. 
I didn't think there were any left, but apparently there were two on the top floor. The gravelly old dude with the icy blue eyes nodded and thanked them, and asked if they could start moving their bags in and start building some kind of stable area at the base of the tower for their horses. Mike and Patty accepted the offer of the stable, and Patty led them off to their new homes. White's got this funny habit of clucking his tongue when he's asked a question. Sounds like bubbles popping rapidly. Old people are funny. I'm not telling the NVC people that we picked up five more souls, all of which with guns and skills to use them. I did tell Rodriguez, who I had wait outside MGR, that five people with horses made yet another pilgrimage to the Bastion area to find salvation at the hands of the not-mythical-at-all trinity. I got a chuckle out of that. I'm hoping to have Patty and Mike integrate White and his family to the point where we can put them into our patrol rotations. They're shooters, former cops, and they have their own horses. Furthermore, they seem like good eggs, not Michelle Butt eggs, and they feel like allies in a strange time. Speaking of which, I sent a runner over to the barn to have some hay delivered for their animals. I'll ask Fletcher to swing down and check on the horses in a few days, too. Gesture of good faith. Time to hit the other kind of hay and listen to Michelle talk ad nauseum about how amazing it is to watch this spiritual explosion happen in real time. I'd say it gets old, but... All this theological moving and shaking gets her excited, and the sex has been stellar of late. See nail, hit nail kind of guy, remember? Pro tip, chicks with master's degrees get horny when they're mentally stimulated by the shit they know well. Adrian. March 16th, 2014 just got word from the factory that they're in contact with a group of attackers. We're spinning up a QRF to head out to them. I'm not in tonight's rotation, so I get to sit here, waiting. Uh, I'm still pissed at them for bouncing to the NVC cause early, but they're my people, you know. I'll update as I get news. Adrian. March 23rd, 2014 so much for getting back into the swing of regular entries. It's been like two weeks since I sat down and wrote something. I feel like a lazy schlub. But, I mean, I'm actually quite busy, Mr. Journal. Really friggin' busy. I'm like a one-armed wallpaper hanger here. Or like a president with an intern, if you want me to get filthy again and talk about Michelle. Rawr. Sometimes it sucks to be the sounding board for a man. Tough break, kid. The big news is the NVC people are still being cool. We're over a month into our agreement, and literally nothing has changed here. Well, that's not true. Lemanowitz and his two fire teams are still here, as are their vehicles. But they've integrated nicely, and the people like them. Sergeant Rodriguez has mentioned several times that when his rotation here is up, he'll ask to move here from Calendar Mountain permanently, and I'm inclined to vouch for him. He's a cool cat. Throws a killer game of darts, too. He's run train on our weekly darts nights in the cafeteria. Next week, we start having him throw lefty. Texas people are still awesome, still doing their thing and being tremendous community members. All the babies are well, and if I don't think about Caleb and Sophie's lost child, it's a gift every day to watch them grow. Our school bus of friends that arrived as well are doing well. They've taken on jobs here and in the vicinity at other homes, and in fact, are working hard to get other houses on Auburn Lake Road back up and running. We're turning into an actual town at the rate we're going, not just a fort in the woods. <laughs> fort in the woods. <laughs> <sighs> Abby's still writing her newsletter, though there's little to report beyond what social event is happening in the next few days. Knitting clubs, shooting practice, cooking lessons, gardening and farming advice with Ollie, hydroponics with Becca, hunting with James and David, We've rewound time to the 1950s and in only the best ways. Dialed up our sense of community, dialed back the red scare and the misogyny. Hal is great. He's really stepped up as a father and friend of mine. It doesn't take much beyond taking care of Abby to get on my good side, though. He tries to get out and be social, and now that Gavin's a little bigger and able to be brought to the school for daycare, he's back in Bastion's security rotation. 
Adding a former British Royal Marine to the mix makes me happy. The factory is well, though Hector is recuperating from a gunshot wound he suffered during that encounter with looters a week ago. They repelled the small late-night attack easily, but he did catch a round. Tis but a flesh wound. He received his medical care from Dr. Tina up north, and that's another feather in the NVC cap. Taking care of people I like will put you in my good graces. Spring Meadow is good as well. Team AAA manages their shit, and despite having to deal with regular people coming to their gate asking for help, it is well in their hands. We've moved two more people there to bolster their shooters in the event that they're attacked by these friendly people asking for help. It wouldn't surprise us in the least if the people begging for food and water started taking shit by force when Spring Meadows can't offer anything, which, as the winter drags on, we're coming closer and closer to. Food supplies are a bit short. Hunting has been dismal the past two weeks, and we lost a few chickens to a fox or coyote a week or so ago. Ollie had a fit over it and scoured town for chicken wire for a full day. The chicken coops are now better fortified than Bastion. We also need to tighten up the gates in the front and back. There's just enough space at the bottom and on the side for animals like foxes to slip into campus. I think Ollie or Melissa asked Michelle to find some folks to help with that. Guaranteed it'll fall to Martin or Blake to get done. Feeding the new faces at MGR, Pete White's crew, and the nine folks from Calendar Mountain have put some stress on us. Michelle asked Lieutenant Lemanowitz to request some supplies on the next run to help offset the burden, and the lieutenant assures us he will. It's only fair. I've been working on building more hydro bays for people's homes with Ryan and Becca and volunteering for the security details, trying to get as much face time with the NVC soldiers stationed here as I can. I'd like to know their skills better, and I'd really like to get personal. I want them to like me if push comes to shove. It's harder to shoot at a person you like. I've also put more than a few hours into roaming town and meeting up with people who've come all this way to meet the Trinity. Funny thing is, most people new to the area don't believe me when I say I'm Adrian Ring. They think I should be bigger or taller or different somehow. Almost everyone says that the real Adrian Ring has a mohawk. <laughs> Funny, like hair just stops growing. But in the end, they all come around and they have this moment of joy when they realize they're really where they wanted to be and that they're close to Kevin, Michelle, and me. It's a funny thing. Makes me uncomfortable, but I keep going out and making these people's days. Maybe I like it. Maybe I haven't made up my mind about it or who I am. Speaking of big projects, which it wasn't really, but it's a nice segue into a random statement, Kevin is leading a team to the airport with Kate and new guy helicopter pilot Tom, our aviators, to see if there's any kind of salvageable aircraft. We've got a shit Cessna operating, and I should put that in quotes, for reals, but the parts situation is bleak on it, and ideally we'd like a chopper just like Calendar Mountain does. I'm tempted to reach out to Maria's people to see if they have any aviation parts or planes or anything. Might be nice to shore that relationship up and include them on the ground level as we try and head for the skies. We'll figure it out. Or we won't. Back to work. Hydro bays don't build themselves. Adrian March 31st, 2014 Mr. Journal, some crazy shit is going down, and I don't think it's an April Fool's joke. I'd be pissed if it was. I might be pissed if it isn't. Yesterday, Agnes and Anders contacted our collective locations and reported that they've had numerous peaceful encounters at their gate and in their neighborhood with people speaking different languages, each with strong, clearly foreign accents. They're describing these new people as joyous and happy beyond sensible measure. Agnes described them as starved but elated. I'm reminded of the time I found a candy bar under my bed when I was a hungry kid late at night. I ate that bitch like it was my job. I can still remember how it tasted. That's some fat kid tendencies for you. Anyway, this is a pretty fucking American region of America, and to suddenly encounter large groups of people speaking different languages 
is a very strange occurrence. It's like the reverse rapture for foreigners. And to send all the Europeans back, we got enough up here. Mr. Journal, I hope that's not the case. This morning, Spring Meadow radioed again and said they had just met with about 15 people all hailing from the United Kingdom, mostly English. British? What is the correct term for that, anyway? They're English. British. UK citizens? Uh, pick one, please. Thanks. And they have just arrived on a good-sized boat via transatlantic voyage. Fourteen days on the boat to get here. Slow going with extra fuel and rough seas, I'm told. I know fuck all about boats. That's a heads up if I ever start talking like I know anything about boats. I went in the army. Ask me about guns, masturbation, crayon color flavors, and poop jokes. Ask my Navy brothers Thomas and William about boats. Or anal lube and self-loathing. That joke would be funnier if my brother Tommy wasn't gay, but he is, and it isn't. I mean, but kinda. He'd laugh, but only because I said it, and only because he'd give me a wedgie afterward. They told the Spring Meadow people that they left England on a boat because at one point or another they all had dreams that America was safe from the dead. They also heard that there were people here that helped make America safe, read, safer, and that maybe, just maybe, those people would go help them back in Europe. Those three people. So, as it turns out, we might be celebrities across the pond, too. Hi, fucking Larius. Michelle and I are heading over to Spring Meadow tomorrow to meet with these people firsthand and sort them out. They've got to have good information. Abby finally has something exciting to write about again. Adrian. The Citadel Mid-May 2011 Thomas stayed in the cockpit while the massive Globemaster aircraft backtracked in the sky to the small city of Erfurt. The keen-eyed pilots had spotted a clear runway at a small airport there, and that would be where the foreign refugees would put down in Europe. Are we on a straight approach? Thomas asked the pilot after donning a headset. We'll be swinging all the way around to make an east-to-west landing. Better into the wind for this he replied. Can you take us real low, maybe circle around once? This might be our only chance at getting the lay of the land from above. The pilot made fifteen faces that all showed some kind of discomfort at the idea Thomas proposed. Why wouldn't you? Tommy asked him. Low on fuel mostly, he started. But also, it's bad military protocol to fly that low. We're easy targets. Sir, I highly doubt that anyone on the ground in central Germany has the weapons, will, or time to take a pot shot at a cargo plane flying above. There might be a war raging below us, but not one a low flyover should be worried about. If I can get you to do that, let me see what the area surrounding the airport looks like. It'll save lives today or tomorrow, I promise you that. Sure, yeah, it's a good idea. Promise me you'll do your best to shoot those fuckers in the head? I don't make promises about things I'm going to do no matter what, Tommy replied. Sounds good. Let's just hope the runway is still clear. Eh, what could change in thirty minutes? The pilot turned and looked at Tommy. Everything. The giant cargo craft took a fat, slow flight around the airport of Erfurt and the nearby central city. The talented flight crew kept the heavy bird a thousand feet above the tops of the low old city and the forests and fields surrounding it, giving Tommy and the few others who were at the windows ample view. Cameras and cell phones snapped pictures and took video for the survivors to look at once they had secured a shelter on the ground. Tommy's military mind looked for two things. First, he sought out masses of the undead as they moved along the country roads of the suburbs and later the narrow streets of the central city. He saw many, and when he gauged how quickly they moved, he felt ill. These were healthier undead. Are they almost running? The co-pilot asked the cockpit. Looks like it, Tommy said back. Not quite jogging. They're more twitchy. Look at them. They're looking up at us as we move, shifting, pursuing. Not good, the pilot said. No. Tommy muttered. Can we deal with that? 
the co-pilot asked him. Not much of a choice unless you guys roll down the windows and start flapping your arms like ducks. The second thing Tommy looked for were structures, buildings, walls, the lay of roads and parks, open areas where he could create space if he was moving on foot or in a vehicle. He looked at the blocked intersections, most of them barricades and fences, and he looked at elevated positions, the hills, steeples, and the large amount of centuries-old stone structures that dominated the downtown area of Erfurt. His eye caught a jagged stony outline atop what looked to be a hill on the western edge of the city. The circumference of the odd shape seemed almost star-like. He'd seen that shape, or shapes like it, in history books. That right there is either a fort or a citadel, Tommy said, pointing at the elevated spot. An old one, pre-World War. As they flew closer and circled to approach the runway, he got a better look at it. Built like an irregular star with many points, the stone-walled fort was covered in grassy fields, stone buildings, and hundreds and hundreds of survivors. They all stood waving in the air at the giant plane as it soared overhead. Surrounding the medieval fortress, however, was a sea of the undead. That's where we gotta get. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but that place is the safest place around, Tommy said. In the meantime, after we land, you gotta taxi us to the eastmost hangars, park us a hundred yards off so we have distance, and we'll close the gap with the vehicles or on foot. We don't want to be swarmed before the doors are open. I'll get us as close as I can. That citadel is your job, though, the pilot said. Right now, my job is to land this big girl. Sit down. We're about to do this for real. Tommy had to get his weapon in the cargo hold. When they dropped the rear ramp of the bird, he and his partner Glenn had to be squared away and ready to put rounds down range to protect the others as they got the Humvees offloaded. He took his seat. True to his word, the pilot put the plane down as soft as it could be and then got his winged bus looped around the tarmac until they were a hundred yards away from the row of hangars at the eastern edge of the airfield. He even powered the plane until the rear ramp faced towards the buildings the SEAL wanted them to capture. Tommy thanked him and bolted to the rear cargo hold. Captain Allen, Tommy said to the Marine captain who hated him. The second to last hangar in the row is open and looks empty. The last one looks to be a business. Which do you want us to clear? Let's dismount and secure the immediate area, then make that call, the officer replied. Aye, aye, Tommy replied and walked past him, shouldering his way gently to Glenn, who tossed him his rifle and then his helmet. You ready? He slapped his helmet on and then slid ballistic sunglasses on his nose. Born ready. Well, red at least. Caesarean section, Glenn said with a smirk as he fastened the light helmet atop his head. He put matching shades on as well. These zombies are faster than Afghanistan. Maybe it's the healthier diet, but stay sharp. As a knife. The two seals marched through the crowd of nervous soldiers, airmen, marines, and the odd civilian heading towards the starboard side paratroop exit door. That door put them facing the hangars they wanted to secure. Opposite them, on the port side of the craft, six marines did the same, and in the far front of the plane, eight soldiers were about to exit through the crew door. On my count, three, two, one. Tommy said, and all the doors opened. Fresh summer air, humid unlike the dry air they'd had in Kandahar for so long, streamed in like a tidal wave. Tommy poked his head outside the aircraft and bright sun smacked the seal in the face. He squinted even through the dark lenses of the glasses that protected him. Tommy's weapon went to semi-auto and he shouldered it as he jumped to the ground a few feet below. Glenn was right on his booted heels and the two seals started to scour the perimeter for anything moving. Contact left, Glenn said softly before firing a single shot. Tommy looked over just in time to see a body collapse face first to the tarmac. No blood streamed from the fresh headshot. It had been a zombie. The warrior returned his attention to his side of the plane and watched as three, no, four undead slipped out from between the two massive aircraft warehouses. Two were women of varied age, and two were young men, college-aged. All four were deceased based on the amount of blood they were covered in. 
They were walking when they left the shade between the two buildings, but when they got into the open, they picked up speed to an awkward, tilted jog. They gnashed their teeth and breathlessly hissed at him with dead lungs. Arms shot out, grasping at the two men from a hundred yards away. Contact, Tommy said. They're quick, man. Up close, this place is going to be a fucking nightmare. Tommy lined up his first shot and dropped the closest man. His second shot missed, but his third shot put the undead college kid down for good. Glenn didn't use words to reply. He found more things to shoot at and let his rifle do the talking. Tommy sighed and shot the two women before they got a quarter of the way to the plane. In the distance, on the other side of the Globemaster, he could hear the Marines and soldiers firing their weapons. Volume of fire is steady over there, Glenn said, taking the words from Tommy's mind. Push out, get a larger perimeter? Yeah, Tommy said. He pinched the mic on his neck to broadcast to the larger group. We're pushing out ten yards. Have a couple people step out to fill the void. Good copy, Captain Allen replied. Without waiting, Thomas and Glenn walked forward on measured feet, keeping stable and firing a shot every few paces as zombies stood up in the overgrown grass or appeared from behind buildings or vehicles arrayed around them. In their ears, they heard the soldiers and marines calling out clear and pushing away from the plane, eating a circle of safety from the dangerous undead. Tommy saw no threats emerging and stole a glance over his shoulder. Three Polish soldiers had stepped out of the plane to cover their six. He felt a rush of confidence and smiled. Glenn shot again. Punisher One, Thomas heard. The voice belonged to Captain Allen. Do you feel comfortable clearing out the larger central hangar ahead of you? Roger that. Punisher pushing forward to breach, Tommy replied. Glenn? I got you, Glenn said, and the two seals started forward without hesitation. Tommy headed straight towards the small office door tucked in the corner of the giant, featureless metal building. The main hangar doors were closed and would require a forklift or Humvee with a tow chain to get open, so they had to enter that way. The two men strode ahead, shooting at targets in the distance, making sure nothing got close to them. The Polish men behind them picked up their fire as well, providing them with time to think and breach the office. Tommy went to the window and looked inside. Slam! Something hit the glass just opposite his face, and he reeled back almost tripping. He brought the muzzle of his weapon up to fire, but checked himself. He wanted to save the glass. On the other side of the window, banging its emaciated bandana-covered face against the glass, was a dead man wearing coveralls and a yellow safety helmet. Fuck, that scared me, he blurted. Asshole. Shoot him, Glenn said as he covered Tommy. Can't. I want to save the glass if we hole up in here. It's not much, but any additional barrier is good, Tommy said as he slid the rifle to his side and went to the steel door that led into the office. He grabbed a handle and applied downward pressure. The handle budged and the lock released. He put the side of his foot against the bottom of the door to keep it shut and drew his sidearm. Ready when you are, Glenn said. Breaching, Tommy said, and stepped back to yank the door open. Before he could, the steel door erupted outward, shoved forward by two more of the grease-coated, coverall-wearing undead workers. Fuck! Tommy yelled as the impact of the door blasted him on his heels. One of the undead collapsed directly on top of him as he snapped off two rounds from the hip. The shots hit home, piercing the chest of the monster but failing to strike the only spot that mattered. From where he stood beside him, Glenn ripped off a fast burst of shots, shattering the window to kill the zombie inside the office and the zombie that stumbled forward. Save the bullet, Glenn barked. As Tommy jammed the barrel of the pistol upwards into the face of the bandana-obscured zombie, Glenn slid his weapon to the side and reached down to grab the worker by the back. With his Nomex-gloved hands, Glenn grabbed the man around the neck and ripped him off of his friend. He tossed him against the building with a resounding metal bang, and the two seals stepped back or crawled back as appropriate. As the worker tried to get to his feet on unstable, panicked legs, Glenn unsheathed his knife and punched it into the man's ear. He crumpled to the pavement so fast Glenn lost hold of the knife. The seal leaned down to retrieve the tool, but Tommy stopped him. Leave it. We need to clear the building. We'll come back for it. Okay, Dad. Jesus, Glenn replied. Sorry I saved your life. 
Tommy chuckled, but never took his eyes or his pistol off the open steel door that led into the office. The hangar was stuffed with the massive aircraft. The entire wall of the warehouse had to be shuttered open to fit it in, and even then the wingtips had mere inches of space on each side. The Globemaster was a gargantuan flying machine, and this storage facility struggled to contain it. The ground crew for the plane used abandoned airport equipment retrieved under heavy protection to tow it inside the building. And now that the refugees' means of aerial escape was safe inside, they could collapse into the hangar and fortify it with the supplies part of the group peeled off to collect. Sheets of steel, rebar, concrete blocks, several civilian vehicles that still managed to start and drive, plywood, lumber, and even several barricades and rolls of plastic fencing were all collected and transported back, again under the protection of soldiers, marines, and two very tired SEALs. No one had died in the landing and storage of the plane, and considering the frightening foot pace the undead in Germany managed, that was no small feat. As the frenetic activity on the tarmac died down, the officers gathered in the shadows near the hangar door. Tommy and Glenn were invited again. What do we think? Colonel Fallon posed to the group. Safe here for now? This building ready to withstand a night or two? For now, Captain Allen said as he wiped a trickle of sweat off his forehead and face. Hangers are sturdy steel. The doors are good. We've got the windows barricaded with plywood, and we parked three cars around the entrance there so we can exit with breathing room if we get swamped. Two other side exits are blocked by salvaged cars, too. Tomorrow, we can scout out the hotel on the other side of the hangar row here. The fucking German Hilton? Won't be enough, Glenn said, mimicking the sweat removal. There are 10,000 undead marching their asses this way from the downtown area we flew over. They'll be on top of us within an hour. We'll never get out. We'll get out, Alan countered. Blast a hole through the crowd and drive on out, and hey, we already know the fence surrounding the airport is intact, so that's a solid perimeter. It's a fucking chain-link fence, Glenn said, then laughed. Solid is not the word you wanted. I don't know, Tommy said. Look, you're both probably right. We will get surrounded, and we probably could blast our way out, but we couldn't afford to. We'd go Winchester just getting on surface streets, then what? Is this where you propose a genius solution, petty officer? Fallon posed. Did you guys see that fort we flew over? They all shook their heads no. Well, we did. It's old, but it looked solid, like really solid, with stone walls and an elevated interior. I saw hundreds of survivors waving up at us, so I think we can say the place is fortified. I think that's what we need to head for. Take a Humvee and go, Sergeant Mikey offered. Grab some infantry boys and scout it out? Alan started to open his mouth to say something, but a glare from Glenn stopped him. Fallon smiled. Tommy produced a paper map from his back pocket and motioned for the men to gather in. We're here, he pointed at the hangar they stood inside, and right here is the fort. Tommy slid his finger over to the irregular star-shaped area that he saw from the air. In German, the map labeled the area as Zitadella Petersburg. My German is shit, Sergeant Mikey said, but that says Citadel Petersburg. Right, Tommy said. I think. Anyway, it's a castle or a base or something, and it's keeping people safe. And that means if we can get inside it without killing ourselves or getting them killed, we could have a real staple place to hang our hats. Fallon spit on the ground and nodded in agreement. How far away is it? few miles. Surface roads lead right to it. I don't like it, Glenn said. By now the streets will be asshole to elbow with those fucking corpses. We get cut off guaranteed. Then what? Anyone ever driven around here before? I don't want to get lost without a local to navigate. I don't see us as having a choice, Fallon replied. The fences will fail. The cars and these steel prefab walls won't last forever either. All band-aids. We need to find a place, and that place looks real good. The noise of a grinding vehicle engine grew in the distance. Something diesel whined closer and came to an abrupt end with a groaning metal crash. 
A pair of slow, heavy shots rang out on the outside of the building opposite the airfield where the men stood, near where the crash happened. That wasn't an M4, Tommy said and grabbed his helmet off his belt. He bolted away with Glenn on his heels. The two men rounded the edge of the hangar and sprinted around to its street side, toward the airport main entrance and the hotel Captain Allen had referred to. They halted at the fence where it met the edge of the hangar, right at the hood of a Mercedes they had parked against the building and fortification. The vehicle had been intended to bolster the fence, but instead it had become a victim of a car accident. A soldier rolled around on the ground between the two hangars. Glenn went to provide aid as Tommy jumped on the hood of the black vehicle to assess the vehicle that had crashed into it. It was a silver Volkswagen sedan, and as he aimed his weapon down at the windshield, two women spilled out of the front seats. A third person, a man with a bolt-action rifle, stood near the car's trunk, aiming the rifle into the distant, thickening crowd of monsters approaching. Entschuldigen Sie, the short-haired driver called out to him. She stumbled into the metal wall of the hangar, and her temple careened off the surface with a comically loud bang. English. Tommy barked as he moved his weapon to the woman with the ponytail getting out of the passenger side. Hands up. Show me hands. The woman snapped her flat palms up and looked at the seal with fear and irritation. You are American? She asked him in clean, slightly accented English. Yes, do you need aid? Is she bitten? Tommy replied. Below and behind him he felt Glenn sliding into cover with the injured soldier. Nine, she said back to him. We saw your plane. We had to come. Locals? Tommy asked, letting his gaze drift from her for a second to assess the encroaching army of dead. There had to be two hundred just in the streets he could see. Yes. Can we get out of the car? Come inside. We'd like to talk. She pleaded, throwing a thumb over her shoulder at the very same horde of undead. We haven't long. No, we haven't. Tommy leapt from the hood of the Mercedes onto its roof, and leaned over to help the woman up. As the bloody masses closed in, Tommy got her, the unconscious driver, and the rifle-wielding man with a scar on his forehead up and over the crashed vehicles and to safety inside the hangar. That solid fence of yours, Glenn said to Captain Allen as the Marine walked by to assess the damage, is already fucked. Secure your opinion, Allen replied with a snarl and continued on to fix the issue. I sense animosity, the woman with the dark ponytail said to Thomas. You ain't kidding, he replied and ushered the crew into the hangar. My name is Katrin, and our crash driver is Stephanie. The man with the rifle who keeps us safe is Dennis, Katrin explained as they all sat down in a secluded break room with a claustrophobia-inducing ceiling and lack of windows. With them were the colonel and the two seals. They introduced themselves by name and rank to the locals, and after getting them each bottles of water, they conversed. How bad is it? Fallon asked. Worst possible, Dennis blurted. Almost everyone is dead and dangerous. Military and police? Annihilated during the early days of the outbreak, Katrine said. There weren't enough guns to protect everyone, and the military wouldn't use bombs. The loss of life has been catastrophic. What about American military bases? Any idea if they're still operational? Tommy asked. Before the internet and television went out, we heard they were all sending planes home or shoring up defenses. So it was almost a year ago, she said. No idea what is happening now. No soldiers moving in the streets? No tanks? Helicopters? Fallon pressed. She shook her head. The others did as well. Shit, the colonel muttered. Did you come from the Citadel down the way? Tommy asked her. She nodded. Yes. They opened it up for shelter early in July, when the death toll climbed and peaked. They have repelled all the dead with no issues. A few violent groups of brigands have grown inside our number, but they have been expelled. Brigands? Tommy asked her, confused. Like pirates? She searched her mind for the words. Ah, uh, thugs. Uh, mean people. Selfish men and women who would not sacrifice for the greater good. They stole, intimidated. They were asked to leave, forced in some cases. Savages, Glenn added. 
Is your head okay? Can we look at it for you? He asked the woman identified as Stephanie. She shook her head. I'll have Katrine look at it later. Danke. You're a doctor? Nurse? Fallon asked Katrine. Yes, neurological nurse. Jackpot, Fallon said with a chuckle. You must be real popular back at your citadel. I am, she said with a soft laugh. Some professions are of tremendous use right now. Jobs like uh, men who know how to shoot guns really well, and nurses are very high on the list. That's why you jetted to come say hi? Tommy asked her. We had to see who you were and offer help, Dennis answered him. And we hoped you might want to come to the Citadel to help make it safe. But you said you'd repelled all attacks, Glenn asked them. I do not worry about our past successes, Katrine said to him. I worry about our future failures, and if you turned out to be willing to help us, I would worry less about that. I like her, Fallon said with a grin as he stood. I'm glad we've made your acquaintance, though I fear getting back to your castle might be a bit of a journey based on the reality outside this building. Yes, she agreed. Your shooting has drawn in thousands of the undead. By morning, there will be no leaving here. Fuck, Glenn said with a chuckle. Unless you know how to get around, Stephanie said with more clarity than she'd had thus far. You're gonna get us around? Glenn asked her, eyebrows launched to the sky. He laughed out loud. No offense, but get led around by crash test dummy over here? I don't think so. I'm hurt, Stephanie said, letting her chin drop. But I understand your skepticism. My most recent performance was underwhelming. You got that right, Glenn agreed. Stephanie was a tour guide here in Erfurt before the end. She knows the city better than anyone, Katrine explained. And most importantly, she knows all about the Citadel's tunnel system. Say again? All three Americans said in unison. Stephanie's chin came up, revealing a grin any Cheshire cat would approve of. The fortress has a labyrinth of tunnels beneath it. Originally built so soldiers could move anywhere inside it without having to walk on the surface, exposed to bombs or arrows or whatever. But there are a few tunnels we didn't give tours of. You have my attention, Tommy said and leaned forward. There is a tunnel that exits the fortress and surfaces beneath an old church about halfway to here. We could more easily ferry your people to that entrance and not risk the full trip, Stephanie said to him. How would we get to this entrance? Fallon asked the retired tour guide. Vehicles? On foot? I do not make plans for the military, she answered him, but I can show you the way. Outside, against the wall of the hangar that faced the street, the bodies pressed in and began to beat on the building. Within a few minutes, the noise irritated, and within an hour, it deafened. April 2014 April 7th, 2014 Michelle and I made camp at Spring Meadow for almost a full week. We just got back. I feel like a missionary in Africa after helping all these people. Well, add snow and rain, but Africa, really. Holy shit, what an experience. Humanitarian work on a scale we've never accomplished before. I mean, humanitarian work, period. Actual altruistic assistance to strangers. I wish I'd brought you along, Mr. Journal. I would have written more while it was fresh in my head. Names, places, people, all that. I'll try and catch up and try to remember as best I can. Let me set the stage. Europe is a nightmare. I can't figure out if that's shocking or not. I mean, everything here was a shitstorm for so long, it shouldn't come as a surprise that Europe is all fucked up too. What I guess does surprise me is that they're still struggling with undead there. As recently as their day of departure, zombies roam just as they roamed here for so long. Of course, there are more of them there than there were here. As they describe the countryside and cities, there are still millions of them, hungry and endless as far as the eye can see at times. The people we've talked to claim that 
There are so many because there were fewer armed police and fewer weapons in the public sector. I can't say if that's true or not, but it sounds like it could be true. A single person in a safe shooting position armed with a decent rifle and a hundred rounds here could conceivably kill fifty or more undead before succumbing or displacing to find more ammo. Do the math on that. If we have a million armed citizens and they each kill, let's say, twenty undead each with their firearms, that evens things out considerably. What are you going to do with a cricket bat? What are your chances against the horde with a kitchen knife or, if you're lucky, a wood-splitting axe? What's the math on that? I guess little Sylvia was right. Me defeating Cassie and forgiving myself with Michelle and Kevin's help didn't save the world. It only saved here, whatever here means, not Europe. Sylvia, in her creepy fucking little girl lost in the woods way, said that the three of us were only one part of nine, three trinities, three groups of people to judge the world by, not just one. And to think of the weight I put on myself. Turns out I was only responsible for a fraction of the world's success or failure. Granted, that fraction is one-third. Easy peasy. Nailed it. One-third done. Give me my fucking beer. So, zombies in the millions or billions roam the English countryside, France, Germany, Spain, Portugal, etc., and... According to some of the people who migrated to Europe from points beyond, Russia, Iran, and Algiers, too. So, pretty much the rest of the world. Totally fucked. Great news. They're also still unable to dream of the living, and some of them have dreamt of our trinity, though they say their dreams have changed since they've arrived here in America. Some are able to dream of the living, though... Most of those people report of being able to dream only of the Trinity here, Michelle, Kevin, and me. Most of what we learned came from three people, all English, British, whatever. Get this. They were members of a punk rock band in northern England that was on tour that day down in Brighton, on the southern coast near the English Channel. The band called themselves Wine Glass Apocalypse, and the band members are Beatrice Smith, lead singer, think Velma, Gerald Lee, rhythm guitar, think Lurch, and Parvati Sandeep, drums and backup vocals, think Bend It Like Beckham. They're an eclectic bunch, and get this, they made their way through the shit over there by traveling at night from settlement to settlement, trading entertainment, mail delivery, and news for food, drink, shelter, and clothing. They're bards. They're fucking bards. Unreal, right? True story. Swear on Gilbert's grave. Anywho, uh, Beatrice, Gerald, and Parvati are flush with information about the southern area of England. They traveled from London to Wales and Brighton and back, and when the ship departed under extreme duress from a Brighton dock two weeks ago, they begged, borrowed, and stole to get the fuck out of Dodge. Can't blame them. The captain of the freighter fell off the side of the boat during a big storm, but the first mate led them to the east coast safely. They traveled with the people who got off the boat, heading inland and asking the locals who weren't afraid to talk about the Trinity where to find us. They've been walking since Portland, Maine, and that's no short jaunt. They laughed it off, happy that they could travel during both the day and night without fear of being eaten alive. Though they did voice some concern over the number of firearms they've come across and the amount of people who have no qualms about pointing them at traveling foreigners or locals for that matter. Also, the amount of people that believe a warning shot has replaced the traditional greeting of a wave and a pleasant hello. But they made it here, 130 souls across the rough seas of the Atlantic Ocean, straight to our doorstep. Give me your tired, give me your poor. Though, as cool as it has been to feed them, clothe them, and hear their stories, it worries the living shit out of me that zombies are still everywhere, somewhere. Can you imagine it? The great cities of Europe overrun with undead. Can you envision Tower Bridge teeming over with undead? Can you see the feet of the Eiffel Tower planted in a crowd of endless bodies? What about Berlin, shoulder to shoulder with the dead? What about the canals of Venice blocked up with floating corpses that just won't die, or the wilds of Africa with herds of gazelle and wildebeests trampling over errant undead tribesmen. That might be neat. But seriously, 
It also means that my brother Thomas experienced in Afghanistan what happened here, and he hasn't gotten a reprieve from it if he's still alive. I hope he's still alive. I hope William is, too, wherever he is. Wine Glass Apocalypse reports that most days traveling the British countryside or even urban areas, you'd encounter no survivors, not one soul. Five hundred undead, but not a single person to say hi to. Only the most robust fortifications held, and most of those were elevated. Think the top floors of apartment buildings, government offices, or the fortified castles that litter the countryside. Remember, moats and walls work against mindless undead. It also speaks to the reality that whoever is in the Trinity over there isn't getting shit done. Assuming, of course, Sylvia's bizarre visions about there being three Trinities is right, Either they haven't figured out who they are yet, or they haven't done anything with that knowledge. Maybe they died already, and the whole of Europe, Africa, Asia, whatever, is straight bent over and fucked dry. What would have happened here if I'd been shot and killed that day in the orchard? What might have become had Sunderman been a better shot by a quarter of an inch? My neck still aches when it rains. Well... That's not my problem. I did what I was supposed to do. I held my end of the bargain that was thrust upon me. The others have to do what they have to do. I'm a little bummed about the NVC. While our relations are good, when we pushed them to get aid for the foreigners, they pushed back, said they didn't have adequate food stores to give much, and that the new people needed to start working to earn their keep before they gave up anything to them and Michelle wasn't having it. You gotta see these people, Mr. Journal. They're emaciated and frozen solid. Most of them don't have winter clothes nearly adequate enough to survive our kind of cold snaps. Some of them had frostbite on their hands, toes, and feet when we got to them, and Ethan, Joel, and Fletcher are gonna be working on amputations for days. Thank God the weather is changing. We've had heavy snows this winter with regular cold, and it seems to be breaking. We haven't had snow in a few days, and the temps have crept up high enough that the ice in the gutters of buildings is dripping. Maybe we'll get a break and spring'll come quick. Sad that we had to explain need to the NVC. Mizaki was a prick over it, but Michelle swayed him. Get the people operational, then put them to work. You don't ask someone who can't walk to get a job before selling them a wheelchair. Mizaki is a dipped turd in my humble opinion right now. Dipped in what, I don't know, but he's a shit stick with a kernel of corn on the side by my book for the foreseeable future. But I must say the asshole did come through in the clutch and sent us a Humvee loaded with fresh-ish produce, some canned goods and winter clothes from their ski resort stores to give the people. A little bit of medical supplies too, but thankfully we didn't need much. Toe and finger amputations are apparently something we are able to do a lot of. One of the weirdest things I've ever written, easily. Spring Meadow has opened their gates for most of the people for care, and they're actively working to bring the nearby homes and buildings up to speed to house them as weather, materials, and energy permits. The houses aren't inside their brick-walled compound, but they're close enough, and once a day they bring folks in for care, food, and whatnot. The immigrants are happy to do all they can to earn what they're being given. Totally worth it to help them. And it's nice to hear more about the rest of the world. I mean, I wish it were better news, but news is news. Abby's going to have a field day doing interviews with these people. Not sure how Bastion will take news of the dead still roaming the world. Adrian April 18th, 2014 Mr. Journal, super busy. Sorry it took me, uh, 11 days to sit down and write something. People are a lot freaked out. News of the presence of undead in Europe has put people on their heels here. Safety is a relative idea, you see. What once was unthinkably dangerous has become very safe after you've experienced something worse. For example, after you've been shot at while standing in the open, getting shot at when you're in cover doesn't feel nearly as dangerous as it did before you were first shot at. 
This is what we're experiencing. People thought they were safe in a post-zombie world filled with armed assholes with low moral standing. Now that they know the undead are still somewhere and we still have assholes with low moral standings, paranoia is off the charts. I'm really pissed, but Michelle responded to people's fears and asked the NVC to station a few more people here. They agreed and sent down four more soldiers to bolster their garrison. We didn't need it, not in the least, but they're here now, and in the couple days they've been moving about, people do seem to have settled. We told everyone the news of Spring Meadow at a town hall meeting in our multi-purpose cafeteria. Skipping the dialogue verbatim, it was a ruckus, but we survived. Michelle managed everyone's fears so capably with her calm tone and patience while Kevin, myself, and Abby stood at her side. Melissa spoke up several times to quell someone yelling while she held her new baby, Barbara Ann, with little Martha clinging to her leg, red hair wild and bouncing. There's a fierceness in our women with babies, the women here in general. I see it in Abby's face, and I saw it in Melissa's. I love it, even though it scares the shit out of me. I've been moving back and forth from Spring Meadow on the regular with Hal and a rotating third body. I've been helping renovate houses and listening to the stories of the travelers. Hal has been a new man reconnecting with his fellow countrymen. It's easy to forget he's not from around here, even though he has an accent. When I'm not doing work over there with him, I'm managing Kevin's anxiety about the four new NVC guys at Bastion and the better weather we're getting and how spring will bring more threats to us. I'm not sleeping well. Between baby Gavin struggling to rest at night and the general level of fucked up dreams I'm having, it's been work to get rest. I should be sleeping like a log, but I'm not. I talk about sleep a lot. I realize that suddenly. I'm still really worried about food. Like, I spend a lot of my free time talking to an equally exhausted Ollie and my sister Becca trying to find a way to make food grow faster. As meaningful and important as it was to help the ship of refugees, feeding an additional 130 people has strained our stores to the breaking point. I hate to say this, so I'll whisper it. Mazaki may have been right to hesitate on feeding them. I will never admit that in public, not even to Michelle. Us head motherfuckers in charge had the ration-cutting talk this morning. Meal sizes are being trimmed starting tomorrow, and we're pulling four guards from the wall rotation to send out hunting. Ollie got real happy, and Kevin got real not happy. James Halwitz is going out into the woods, he's our best hunter by far, as is Texas Rich, Hawaii Dave, and Bud and his wife Donna. They're going on horseback. We're hoping each of them can pull down a deer or bear or moose within a week. The wildlife has come back to a degree that could happen. Five average-sized white-tailed deer should yield something around 200 to 250 pounds of meat for us. We can also use the bones for broth, the hide for clothing, blankets, rugs, and someone somewhere will find a way to use the other shit. I'm told if each person eats a half pound of venison each day for protein, that's 400 to 500 servings. I forget exactly how many people we have now, but the number is well over 350 if you count the new people. So, basically, five deer and the chicken eggs from our coop covers our protein needs across our entire population for a single day. Maybe a day and a half. Two if the deer are chubby and we eat light. A moose or large bear would add to that, but we can't assume anything. Fuck me. If we're lucky, they'll pull down more than one deer each a week for the next few weeks, but again, that's optimism. MGR is in the same boat, as is the factory and Spring Meadow. Spring Meadow was worse off, actually. They depleted to almost zero feeding the new people. To cover the needs of our empty bellies, the elderly are sitting in the cold at Auburn Lake and by the river to fish. We're sending kids out to forage for berries and wild shit we can pick, and we're breaking into our canned goods stores. Becca and Ryan have asked for even more hydro bays and a couple people they can train to help manage them. The shit thing is that no matter how fast we build the units, the food still has to grow. There's only so much people can do to make plants grow faster. 
We have the gear for new units around here already, but space might be an issue too. The old gymnasium is already pretty much full, and structures on Bastion are filling up or full up already. Never mind that bays need lights, and lights need electricity, and to make electricity we need diesel, and we're pissing through that like there's no tomorrow. Not only is the candle lit at both ends, but the fucking Jinx Fairy has taken a blowtorch to it. Michelle is reaching out to the NVC to see what they can offer us. I feel like the asshole friend who always shows up asking for money or a couch to crash on. I'm eating light for the next few days. Shit, maybe I'll dig a deer rifle out of the armory and head over to where the farm was. I know the deer used to be thick over there, and I don't mind the cold much. Another hunter is what we need right now. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll check in when I can. Adrian. April 23rd, 2014 It took less than a week for the food situation to get worse, as you can imagine it would have. Fucking jinx, fairy. That's what I get for assuming anything. The power of positive thinking can eat my asshole with syrup. I just got back in from a third straight day in the woods hunting, and I'm tired and colder than I've been in a long time. Spring got a little sidetracked on the trip getting here, and the mornings have been brutally cold with frost and dampness in the air. Rain has been steady, and it sucks. Hours spent sitting or laying in the woods is normally an enjoyable way to pass the time for me, but when it's like that, I'll take a pass. Hot cocoa, recliner, a warm blanket, and television, please. Sadly, none of those things feeds my people. Our canned goods stores were lower than expected, and our hunters, myself included, haven't pulled down shit. Two rabbits and a couple turkeys, which is better than nothing, but not good enough. The NVC hasn't been able to send us any food either, so right now we're on 50% rations across the board. We have to last for a few weeks to make it to the next batch of hydro crops and to buy us time for the hunters to bring something down. Anything. Rabbits. Fucking squirrels. We're about to start digging up slugs and chewing on leaves. At least the sugar maples are producing sap for us to boil down into syrup. I don't get how we've come up so short on food so fast. I thought we had this winter in the bag as it related to food. I'm forgetting about the Brits. We didn't anticipate feeding an extra 130 mouths. Not to mention we're now feeding 14 extra mouths from up north. They brought food to supplement, but it's MREs and canned goods, and to the best of my knowledge, they aren't using it yet. I need to talk to Michelle and get her to push that idea. Eat your own food, strangers. People are starting to look unhealthy, and worse yet, they're acting angry and lashing out against one another from frustration. Kevin and the shooters have had to break up more than one fight here the past few days. One of our teenagers, a kid named Adam McDonald, had his arm broken in a shoving match with one of the older ladies here. She lost her mind after she realized what she did to the kid, but still. Hungry people do crazy shit. We have to do something before it gets worse. I don't think we're anywhere near true desperation, but it won't take long for things to go real south for us. In truth, I have no way of knowing. Two new plans put into action. One goat, one sheep, four chickens, and one cow are going on the butcher's block tomorrow morning to make sure we have enough protein for a few more days of hunting. We've also opted to send another four hunters out, leaving the wall insufficiently defended. We're that worried about food and morale. Summed up, if we starve, there's no reason to guard a wall at all. Second level of plan... The NVC garrison, led by Dana Lemanowitz, immediately offered up their guys to either hunt or to man the wall. It's their job to protect us, and they stepped up. Kudos to Dana for being good about it and realizing that it's not only about being ready for a fight. Kevin asked them to supply four people to the wall and to send out two hunters. The rest will remain in place as usual in the event something goes awry and we need a QRF. As well, Michelle asked Kevin to hold off on his trip to the airport to build up our aviation capabilities. It had been a priority, but we can't afford the loss of personnel right now for a non-essential trip. Again, there's no point trying to fly on an empty stomach. He agreed.
I won't say we're in panic mode, but that's only because I won't say it. I'm headed back into the woods in the early morning. I'm cashing out here and heading up into Michelle's in my room so we can spend some time together. We haven't seen each other much the past week, and I feel strained and more than a little empty. When we do see each other, all we talk about is logistics and plans, other people and their needs, and rarely about us. There's always one more thing to plan for or to do before we take time for ourselves. Then we're exhausted and sleeping with the cat. At least Otis replenishes both of us. He's a font of energy we can tap into. That changes tonight. Even if all we get is twenty minutes of peace and quiet together, I'm fighting for it. I miss looking at her talk. Adrian April 30th, 2014 Weirdest thing happened today. Set me on edge. Due to timing on shift changes and someone having to take a shit, I was on the wall with the leader of the NVC guys, Lieutenant Dana, when one of his guys yells up from the base of the wall to him. The hour was early, 7 or 8 a.m., I think. Guy says, Lieutenant, you want me to make the call for today? Dana says back, Yeah, go ahead. Tell them all's well. After the younger kid heads off and we keep talking, I called Dana out. What's the deal with that? What call's he talking about? Well, uh, we check in with Calendar Mountain so they know we're okay. They're still worried that things could get complicated, he said back. I think you mean to say violent. Where's the trust, bro? I joked, but I was miffed. You're not a stupid man, Adrian. It's a precaution. If we fail to check in, they send the cavalry to investigate. Don't take this the wrong way, but how do they know it's really you making the call? They can't know everyone's voice. What's stopping us from taking you out and just making the calls? No, they don't know all our voices. We have codes. When we check in, we use the day's code and they reference it. If someone were to radio in and use the wrong code or not use a code at all, they'd send help. It's for our safety. I hope you understand. I did. Didn't make me feel any better about it. I did feel better knowing Dana was loose-lipped enough to tell me more than he should have. I guess it could be trust and not him being careless. I'll take it either way. We walked the rest of the morning in the decent weather until the right people came to relieve us, and I pretended like I didn't want to throw him in the river with each step. All I could think about was, where are the codes kept? In other news, food is doing okay. We got a smallish moose and five deer since my last entry, plus Becca and her boyfriend have been able to yield out some fast-growing crops in all their new bays, and with the repurposed generators we moved over to juice the joint. The very first bits of spinach are coming off now, and we'll get more every day from here on out. I guess spinach and kale grow fast, so they swapped in and amped up production for us. My sister is a bright one. I can't speak for stoner Ryan in the same way, but he gets a pass today. He's yet to let me down, and that's saying something. We'll still be hungry for another week, maybe two, but people are doing okay with the meat we took down, and Abby's using her newsletter to spin the good news, not just report the bad. I find it funny that she's willing to alter the way she reports news to guide our people in the direction that suits our community best, in her opinion. When she thought telling everyone my operational secrets was in their best interests, she did. When she thinks that telling them about the awesome spinach harvest is best, she does that. She could, of course, report that we had two boxes of pasta ruined in the kitchen yesterday because someone overcooked them, but that wouldn't help people be positive about life and our progress, would it? It's far better to report that spinach and kale are just days away. I should be angry about her being a hypocrite, but she's helping maintain the status quo as well as at our other locations. Still on the fence about calling the factory one of our locations. Nah, I'm pissy for no good reason. Check that. I've got plenty of good reasons to be pissy. In other news, the NVC sent half a dozen armed bodies to Spring Meadow to help with security and construction. They continue to claim that they cannot spare food for the new people, and Michelle compromised with having them send bodies. 
Ryan is heading over to the development tomorrow to start collecting materials from buildings to construct a series of hydroponics bays over that way. They don't have any substantial space inside the brick walls of the community, but there's an apartment building a block away they're gutting to turn into a food generation facility. Might be a month to get rolling, but that additional urban food supply will be solid gold. We should have done this months ago. We spend too much time putting out fires instead of clearing away the flammable shit and building for the future. We'll see how it goes. I'm guardedly optimistic about our near future. This year's early crops are going into the ground now, and we've shifted manpower to help Ollie. He's going hard on peas, beets, onions, corn, cukes, and some other shit. He claims if it all goes well, we can have beets in a month. I hope he's right. He's also sourcing new fields nearby we can till and get in process. I'm tired. Otis is acting strange again, rubbing up on my calves and trying to jump into my lap as I write here at the kitchen table. He hasn't done that in a long time. Maybe I'll head over to the recliner and give this little guy some lap time before I retire. Michelle is over at the factory tonight, meeting with them over something, so it's just me, the cat, and some laptop porn. I guess it's not all bad. Adrian May 2014 May 5th, 2014 Taco Day, bitch. Happy Cinco de Mayo, Mr. Journal. I think Mexican food was a critically underappreciated culinary delight before the apocalypse. Can we talk about how almost an entire culture's cuisine is essentially the same six ingredients combined in slightly different ways and presented in slightly different fashions? I mean, tacos and burritos are like one degree of separation from each other in terms of what goes inside them. And let's be honest. They're both brilliant and delicious. Can you tell I'm hungry? Jesus, I'm so hungry. I've lost 12 pounds that I couldn't afford to lose the last two and a half weeks. I feel like ass despite mainlining vitamins like their breath mints. I think the shelf life on these multis has been reached and breached. I mean, that's based on the expiration date being like a year ago, but who gives a shit? Even if they're like 20% effective, it's better than nothing at all. I might not be getting any calories, but at least I'm getting that, right? We're pushing through. Weather has officially turned for the better for several days now, and everything is turning green as it ought to. Spirits are improved from that alone. Pretty crap winter, all things considered. A lot of snow. I'm tired. I've straddled here in Spring Meadow with Hal and Peter White from MGR for days again. Old man Peter has been insistent on meeting the ship people. He wants to help, and I think he's excited to talk to people with different accents. For a break, I took a single day off to head out into the woods with my old Tac-22 hunting for rabbits. I did excellent, and took down 14 over the course of yesterday. With all the neighborhoods overgrown with grasses and saplings, all you have to do is find a ladder and climb on a roof to see fresh, small game moving everywhere. I need to get the guys and gals on it with shotguns, too. There's enough quail, duck, and pheasant to feed us for a few weeks, just in the neighborhood I went to. Stevie Wonder could rack up a high score right now. I wonder how Stevie fared with the undead. Not all that well, I imagine. I haven't met any blind people since the end, and there's got to be something to that. Admittedly, it's a little dumb to go hunting by myself, but I need to get away. There's no place for me to escape to here. I've been back and forth to Spring Meadow to help with some triage needs. As you might imagine, with two disparate peoples coming together, there's been a fair amount of sickness swapping. The Brits have come down with a case of our flu, it would appear, and a mess of the Spring Meadow locals have come down with some stomach bug, too. Not as bad as the foreigners, but still... The collective level of need has had Fletcher and his wife Annie shift over there full-time temporarily to help care for everyone. Because they've had so many people knocked out with the ninja shits, they've asked for more bodies to fill the gaps, and that's what I've been doing. I'm covering the gate as anonymously as I can to avoid being fawned over by the Brits, though they all know me now. Wineglass Apocalypse has seen to it that I am well known amongst their people. 
motherfuckers. Speaking of the bards, the big motherfucker who plays rhythm guitar for him, Gerald, is one of the sickest of them all. He looked like a card-carrying member of the Adams family before, and now, man, it's eerie. I stopped in to say hi to him and the other women in the band before I crashed, and he's looking like shit. Sunken face, yellowed eyes, and covered in sweat. Gerald lost a toe to frostbite, and it still hasn't healed right. You can see the red, angry flesh of his foot that Fletcher is fighting with our dwindling supply of antibiotics. I keep thinking of the time that dog tried to eat my balls and the infection I got that nearly did me in. I'm not a doctor, but I think the wound on his foot is dragging him down worse than the others who are sick. Hard to fight a battle on two fronts. Hitler figured that out the hard way. Credit to Velma and Bend it Like Beckham, they're taking good care of him. A band in more ways than one. They've been through a lot together, more than we have, arguably. Their apocalypse started when ours did, and it kept going after ours came to an end. I'm sleeping in Spring Meadow tonight, by the way. Adam was kind enough to offer me a room in his and his son's house any time I need it. Michelle was back at the factory tonight until late, sorting out some kind of legal moral argument between Celeste and a few of the people there, rights of possession as it pertains to common spaces or something. They couldn't sort it out on their own, and they called her for help. She'll help. So here I am. Hal is sleeping downstairs on the couch in the living room, snoring away. It's nice to give him a few days of rest away from the responsibility of the infant. Tough on Abby, though. The old man White is sleeping on the floor near the back door of the house, and I think he's sleeping with his small Beretta in his hand. Creepy old guy. Adam crashed an hour ago, and his son a couple hours before that. Single dad killing it here in the post-zombie world. His son is polite and funny, and he's a good man. I envy him. One day I hope I can be as consistently as good a man as Adam. You know, Adam reminds me of a slightly less angry version of my brother Caleb. I blame the Marines for fostering that aggression in him. He's still a great man and a great father, I won't take that from him. Anyway, Adam is a good dude. Tad bit religious for me. He was a pastor in Longview, Texas before heading here, but he's mellowed on that. His word choice in my presence has been distinctly different in the past few months, as in less God references and more vague uses of divinity. It's hard to describe. Less Jesus talk, but no less talk of faith. Maybe nearly losing the whole world causes a pastor to reevaluate their semantics. I'm bugging out to bed. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm really hungry, and I can't sleep in a weird place without at least a little something to eat. I know they don't have much to spare here. Adam's kitchen supplies here are just as pathetic as ours back at Bastion, but I do have an MRE in the Humvee we came in earlier. I'll spoil myself and go get it. Eat and sleep like the good old days. Status quo everywhere else, Mr. Journal. Once we get over this flu bug here, summer will be upon us and the crops will be catching up to our food needs as we plant even more food than ever before. Turning the corner, Mr. Journal. Turning the corner. I miss Michelle. And Otis. Adrian. May 7th, 2014. I can't. It's all different now, or the same, again. Everything. The whole game just changed, and in a way we had no idea it could. Just like that. Should have expected it. I'm gonna be sick. It's been a shit show of proportions I can't even grasp. Bigger than any problem we faced since the dead were here. You know why? Because the undead are back. They're fucking back. The other night when I left Adam's place to get the meal, I took my sweet-ass time wandering through the gated neighborhood here, looking for a nice place to sit and eat. The night was crisp. A warm spring day had given way to a night that winter hadn't quite relinquished. I love that weather. Spring Meadow had been storing the majority of the ill outside of the walls in a nearby rug and flooring store that they'd repurposed into a clinic. 
The building had worked well, but with the locals getting sick too, it became overwhelmed, and they moved a handful of ill back into one of the first houses from the road in the development. The same house Kevin and I stayed in the night before we headed into the city on March 3rd of 2012. The day I found Cassie and set us both free from our torment. Appropriate that it all seems to be starting again right there. For no reason I can remember, I put my ass onto a stone bench in the front yard of the house across the street and got my chili with Mexican-style rice ready to eat. That it was Cinco de Mayo and I got that meal randomly struck me as funny, and I was chuckling, thinking about my silly bullshit on the fifth as I ate. I had just finished the bulk of my meal with the crescent moon far above when I heard a muffled noise from across the street. I'd heard that noise before, and everything in my body dialed up. A primal, animal response. I'd heard a scream, from fear or pain, I don't know, but no one screams like that unless they're being hurt or they're about to be hurt. I dropped my last cracker with cheese on the bench and drew my ten-millimeter Kimber. I'd left my M4A1 in the back of the Humvee for the sake of keeping it out of the eyes of the NVC people. We're still trying to keep those upper echelon guns under wraps when we can. Not sure how long that secret can be held now. Like I said, I drew the pistol and snapped the thumb safety off. I had my walkie on my left hip and radioed out to whoever was working the night guard shift that screams were coming from the house I was walking to. A few unfamiliar voices responded that they were on the way, and I moved to within ten feet of the front door of the house. Big house, with a lot of windows, if you recall. All of them in Spring Meadow are. Big, that is. I kept my distance from the windows, but moved side to side trying to get a look at what might have let slip that scream. I knew the sick people were immediately inside the front door in the large entry foyer, and I knew the friends and family were in the bedrooms and the common living spaces just off the center passage. Inside the house, I couldn't see anything. The lights were off, and the way the moon illuminated the world, it put just enough shine on the glass to keep my vision hampered. I went for the small flashlight in my cargo pants pocket, but didn't get it out before I heard another scream. Then another one, deeper in tone. First female, second male. My ears didn't need to see. You always wait for backup, right? Always, because going into a dark, scary place alone is stupid. But with my flashlight handy, it wouldn't be dark. I made the impulsive call to go in. I had to help. I... Couldn't sit there waiting for people I didn't know to come help when people were screaming, and something bad was happening. Besides, it couldn't be the undead, right? That had to make rushing in far safer. I'm Adrian Ring, right? Scribe and soul, savior of the Americas, survivor of a headshot and vicious dog bite. I'm bulletproof. I went at the front door with hell on my mind, both hands up and wrists crossed, one with pistol, one with flashlight. With the flashlight hand, I tried the front door and found it locked. I took a step back and got ready to kick the fucking thing off its hinges. As I stepped forward, boot going forward with all the strength I could muster, the door opened. I tried to stop, but it was too late. Everything had uncoiled. I put my boot straight into Parvati's midsection and sent her back into the house like she'd been hit by a small car. She's so tiny. I heard the air whoosh out of her, and I could barely hear the beginning of a pained grunt as she flew away. The girl disappeared out of my flashlight's luminescence, and I had to move. You can't just stand in a doorway. Inside, I saw a past that I begged and pleaded to have been far beyond. In the center passage where the people of Spring Meadow had put all the twin mattresses they could find, I saw Gerald, Lurch, squatting, facing the door I'd just tried to kick in. His face had regained color, though it was from dark red blood smeared across it. His bared teeth were pink, and I could see thin strands of skin and muscle lodged in his mouth stuck on something. He slavered and snapped his head up at me, forgetting about the dead bandmate he'd just murdered with his hands and mouth. He had that same malicious foreign presence to him, that same distant fury manifested in his flesh. He had died and reanimated as a zombie. The first since Cassie I'd been close to. Since March of 2012, they'd been gone, but now? 
They're back. After all we went through. Someone else inside the house fired a gun twice. The two shots came from my right to left across the foyer from the living room. I think the shots were aimed at Gerald, but they missed him. Someone else out of my sight screamed in pain, and I knew the shot hadn't missed everyone. Cease fire, I yelled. Whoever had fired didn't know what they were doing and hadn't cleared the path of their shot. It wasn't clean. People were beyond the target. I had no sooner yelled when chaos took over. Everyone had started to rouse from the yelling, but when the gun went off, they woke up in a complete panic and started to scream and try to get up to run. They couldn't see anything other than my light, but they knew a gunshot when they heard one, and that's never good close. I couldn't shoot Gerald as he stood up. A dozen people were rushing around near him, past him, and if I missed or had a pass-through, someone else could have died. So I yelled at him. I yelled and screamed as loud as I could to get him to come to me. He listened, but then again so did everybody else. As they rushed around his giant body, he came. He reached out and grabbed everyone moving and managed to bite more than one person. I might be remembering this wrong, but he seemed more coordinated, faster than the vast majority of undead I've dealt with. Not like alive speed, but faster than he had any right to be dead. Three was the final count of people he got his mitts on, and I'm trying not to associate the Trinity with that number. They turned after, just like he did. I took a few measured steps back out of the door and down the steps, yelling for people to get clear, get clear, and screaming at him to keep following me. Once outside, he tripped on the steps of the house and toppled down, smashing onto the flagstone walkway face first. I leapt at him. I thought for a second I'd zip-tie him or restrain him face down to ask him why he did what he did so he could face trial for his crimes or something. But I had a flash of memory about what happened to the people that shot Angela, and I pivoted. I mean, I knew he was dead, and I knew he was a threat, and I knew that if I tried that I might be bitten. It's the same reason we lost so many cops that day. They tried to restrain zombies and got bitten for their effort. Not me. Not after all I've been through. I still leapt at him, and I still landed on his back, so I had to act fast. Beryl went to the top of his neck, finger went to the trigger, and a second later the brain that gave Gerald all his musical talent and his cheery jokes was spread out all over the pretty stones beneath the white moon. The recoil of the pistol surprised me a little. I forgot how hard the ten millimeter kicked, and I almost misjudged it and lost my grip. Rookie shit. He twitched as I got up and moved back towards the front door. Just as I squared up, one of the Spring Meadow citizens came out, holding a Smith & Wesson semi-auto pistol in her shaking hands. I knew her. Adeline Cartwright, mom of two boys, PTA regular, survivor, and now a murderer of an innocent. I made eye contact with her shaky, tear-running eyes, and as I walked past her, I took the pistol from her with my flashlight hand. I sat it down in the cool grass, and she walked away on stiff legs, crying. I turned and walked in, flashlight up and looking. I heard my backup coming up the lawn behind me, but I didn't wait. Gerald had killed Beatrice, eaten her face and chest until most of the flesh had been chewed down to the bone. She'd struggled. Streaks and smears dragged across the pools of coagulating blood. As I approached her where she'd died on the floor, she started to sit up. Her eyes, like all the others, had gone white, though she looked somehow more coordinated than other zombies had been. Lurch had, too. Seemed less loose, more driven. She turned her head and looked straight into my flashlight, and she started chewing at the air, angry that something had disturbed her rebirth. I flashed the light down the corridor to the kitchen entrance and saw nothing in the path of a bullet. When I brought the light back to her, I put a second ten-millimeter round into the face of a new friend, deafening inside the house. Bad night. No trouble with the second recoil. She went down, and I saw the light switch. 
A flick of a finger later, and everything came into focus. As I moved into the left living room, old man Peter White entered the house behind me with his little pistol up, and on his heels were two Spring Meadow people, rifle and shotgun up, looking. I motioned for them to stay back and for Peter to follow. For some reason, I trust that old man, and I barely know him. He moves like someone who's seen some shit. Careful, cautious, and smooth. Maybe it's the power of the Gilbert Association. Before doing anything else, I went back towards the door and hollered out at the gathering crowd of people who came to help and the people who had fled the house. I hollered out to them. Zombies! Undead! Several people were bitten. Isolate them and keep an eye on them. People responded. I'm told the bitten had already pulled themselves to the side to protect the others. Good people, them. In the second living room, where Adeline's shots went, I found two bodies and one of my people crying. One of the dead had taken a round straight to the chest, killing him. I vaguely recognized him as one of the British people, and as I closed in on him, he began to twitch and clench his fists. He was coming back and fast. The man crying I recognized as Fletcher. He sat on the couch not ten feet from the reanimating guy holding his wife. She'd been hit by one of the two errant rounds, and she'd died too. Both husband and wife were covered in blood, though I couldn't see where she'd been hit. It had to have been a bad spot for her to die so quick. Fletcher, you need to step out, I said to him in a firm voice. No, I need to stay with Annie. He mumbled back at me. His voice creaked and broke. The effort it took for him to stand up to me must have been immense. Fletcher, one of them is coming back as a zombie right there, right now, and I need to deal with it. I don't know what's going on, but Annie might be dangerous. I need you to lay her back down on the couch and step away. No, he said back without looking. I don't know how he wasn't crying and falling apart. Do what you have to do. I'm not scared. There's nothing left for me to be afraid of. Fletcher, move right now, or I'll move you. We will take care of Annie in a minute. Together, you and me, I give you my word, I said, firmer this time. He looked up with the same eyes I've seen too many times, the thick, watery ones that won't focus right and only come from a broken heart. I don't know if it was my words or the look in my eye, but he laid his wife's head down on the couch after kissing her forehead, and he walked out. I heard him break down outside the front door. I would have thought differently of him if he hadn't broken down. I let him get what I guessed was a few yards away before I holstered my pistol and walked over to the fireplace. Peter kept his Beretta on the poor bastard in the process of reanimating as I grabbed a poker. I lined it up and drove it down into the eye socket of the guy before he fully came back. I heard and felt his skull crunch and give way enough to stop his erratic spasms. I bent the rod of the poker in the process. I left it in his skull. Peter, the two Spring Meadow people, and I stood in the living room, watching Annie's body for almost fifteen minutes, waiting for it to show signs of coming back, but it didn't. After some time, Peter covered me, and I used the ash shovel to move her head. She'd taken a round to the throat, and I think it severed her spine, preventing her from coming back. I think. She went quick. I can't say it was painless, but any suffering she experienced didn't last long. You can imagine the chaos this has sown since that night. All of our old fears have returned, and all of those fears have brought out the little monsters inside us. The scared, angry people who had gone away are back, and that scares me just as much as the two zombies I killed. The three people Gerald bit died and turned within the half hour. One of them turned in less than a couple minutes, faster than before. Everything must change, and we need to figure out what to do next and do it fast. We had meetings all day yesterday about it with all the people in high places, but right now I need to rest. I'll talk about what the plan is as soon as I wrap my head around all of what's happened. As I write this, all of the British-European immigrants are under armed guard. 
If they die, it appears they can come back. And we can't risk one of them dying and setting this all off again. This world is getting ugly again, and I hate it. Adrian May 10th, 2014 Hal is British. Becky and her daughter Shelby are British. And by line of blood, little Gavin and Chloe are too. I'm... I'm just done. I'm hurt and scared and floored by everything. I don't know where to start, and I need to. I just don't want to write about anything this ugly, this bad. Okay. Clear the decks. I'm going in. I returned from Spring Meadow yesterday. I wish I'd come back sooner. I'll keep it short, though, because... Oh, fuck, I'm rambling already. Short sentences. Short bus. Stay focused. Three more people died at Spring Meadow. That brings the total loss of life to seven there. Four on the night of the fifth and three since. The three that died after the first night of violence passed away from flu complications or sickness. All three were European and all three came back to life after a very short incubation period. I know that's not the right word, but fuck you, Mr. Journal. It used to be when someone died, we'd have an hour, sometimes three or four before they reanimated, but these guys are all on short fuses, five minutes tops, and in reality it appears to be more like one. We had armed guards at the ready, and we were able to nip that in the bud before any of the three did any damage. If a European or British person dies, they will reanimate quickly and be very dangerous, as they also seem to move around faster than our dead ever did. Not runners, per se, but still far too agile and coordinated for my tastes. We confirmed the night of the 5th that if a British or European person bites or kills an American, that American will reanimate as well. They will reanimate quickly as well. We also confirmed that if an American dies from normal means, they stay dead. Let me copy-paste this for you once more. How Becky and Shelby are British, and by line of blood, little Gavin and Chloe, too. Hal is in self-imposed isolation. He's moved into one of the classrooms in the main school building. The reasoning is that the school has good fire doors and he won't be in a building with others that are sleeping. We have no idea what'll happen if he dies. He could reanimate or not. He was here when it ended, and he might have gotten, I guess, purified by that moment? Or maybe not. Maybe all this time he's carried the taint that his fellow countrymen do. I don't know. None of us do. All this time, he might have still been a risk to restart the whole thing. Hal's never alone, by his request. Another armed person is with him at all times in case something happens, as unlikely as that is. He has forbidden Abby from this, and he can't stand that idea. So, right now, it's a rotation of Patty, Mike, Kevin, and Ethan. All of his best friends and in-laws. Hal is the least of our problems. He's not going to suddenly drop dead on us. The real issue is that Michelle and I have been, for lack of a better term, railroaded by the NVC since the return of the undead. They've come in heavy, and there's little I can fucking do about it. I should have... God. Calm down, big guy. It's time to write, not get angry. Think of the safety of the walls you want to punch. They didn't do anything to you. After hearing the reports of the return, they locked down Calendar Mountain and then sent a doubling of their soldiers down to help us secure our new arrivals. Team AAA and Spring Meadow wanted maybe two or three extra guns for security, but they got another full squad of ten dudes and... Those dudes came with orders to lock shit down. Everyone over there is moving on the NVC say-so, and it's not looking good. Morale was already shit, and now it's like a concentration camp, or well on its way to feeling like one. 
We're getting all this information via innuendo-laced radio transmissions. They can't say much live on the air, so it's all in lame code. When I was there helping for a day to settle things, they sent another dozen men and women here, too. They tried to enforce what amounts to martial law here at Bastion, but Michelle somehow got them to back off that idea. I wasn't here for the conversation between her and Lieutenant Dana, but I'm told he put up a fight against her, but she held her ground and got them to stand down. I'm glad they backed off. I don't think I need to tell you just how badly I want to hurt someone, Mr. Journal. They've posted guards at almost every building 24 hours a day, and they're trying to control how we move outside the wire, too. Kevin's almost gotten into fist fights three or four times now, and someone has been there to break it up before it's gotten out of hand. Luckily, the person breaking it up hasn't been me, because I'd jump in like Jimmy Superfly Snooker and beat some fucking ass from the top rope. I'm pissed, and I'm ready for a fight. I've got old man Peter White and his family on call through a civvy channel from MGR should we need some shooters they don't know about. It'll take them time to get here, but if something does go south, we've got four more shooters to bring to a fight. That'll tip the scales a little. Michelle says she's getting heat from Calendar Mountain to relocate Hal and Gavin to a safer place, likely up north where they can be observed over my dead body. Michelle has cried herself to sleep in my arms more than once in the past three nights. It's the first time I've ever seen her like this, and it shakes me. She's suffering because she sees our people scared and hungry and angry. She's in complete doubt over the NBC alliance now and feels like she's made an enormous mistake. She's unsure of herself. She's scared she's doing and or done the wrong thing. She's afraid she'll get people killed. She's worried about the people from Europe and what their presence here in the States means. In short, she's feeling what it's like when things go really fucking wrong when you're in charge. She's strong, stronger than most, and I get to make her stronger by standing beside her the same way she makes me stronger. We're a team in this. She loves me, and I love her, no matter what happens— we will do the best we can to make it better for those around us. We're trying to build a better world. We will make mistakes, but we will fix them, and we'll be honest about it. And sometimes, that fucking sucks, and it makes you cry yourself to sleep at night. She doesn't know that I cry too after she falls asleep. Adrian May 15th, 2014 It's an uneasy place to be, here. Further, it ain't easy being me right now. I've got a target on my back, and wherever I go, one of the NBC guys is mean-mugging me, waiting for me to do something like I'm a villain. I so want to prove them right. They're still here in doubled numbers. They're still at Spring Meadow in doubled numbers, too, and from what little they can say over the radio, I think Team AAA over there is unhappy as fuck about it, just like us. The NBC people are being polite, but every day or so, one of their people takes another little step towards trying to be in charge. It might be stepping in front of someone in the cafeteria to get their food first, or it might be telling someone they need to put out their cigarette and go inside after dark, but I'm telling you, they're pushing. And we can't push back. There's just too much at stake to start a fight. Nearly 30 of them are inside the walls here now, and that's a huge chunk of bodies to take out in the event of a confrontation. I'm waiting for them to tell us they have to collect our guns, for our safety, of course. Wouldn't want something bad to happen by accident. I don't think trying to take our guns would be safe for them. We've had a massive upsurge in arguments and fistfights the past few days. Everyone on our side is at each other's throats from tension and anger, and God forbid one of the NBC guys gets lippy. We've had two near brawls that almost pulled into aimed guns between our people and theirs. We're a sarcastic remark away from a gunfight. Michelle has been confronted daily by a rotation of pissed-off Bastion citizens about it. Kevin's the first one at her in the morning 
politely suggesting that she start planning on an ouster by force of them. Not long after that, it's Abby wanting her to do something about Hal. Then it's the new kid Jason and his sister Sharon, who already hate the NVC for what they think they did to their parents. Then it's five other people. Every day. Oh, and then people are still begging for food. Speaking of Abby, she's heartbroken. She sees Hal daily, but Hal keeps pushing her away because he's petrified of dying or infecting her, irrational as that is. She's written two newsletters about the change in our world due to the arrival of the foreigners, and people are ramping up in their own irrational fears despite having not seen any new zombies. We are safe. We know that. All of us are Americans here, except for Hal, Shelby, and Becky, and maybe Gavin and Chloe. And we cannot turn unless we're bitten by someone from not here. We still have the river, the walls, the gate, and the guard towers. They're still scared. I don't know. Ollie and Melissa are worried. The last truck that left here heading north to Calendar Mountain, they think, had several cases of stolen food in it. Meaning the soldiers raided our storage and sent some of our meager supplies back to their home without our say-so. I'm going to see if our cameras caught anything and recorded it, but I don't think I'll have any luck. We don't have any cameras pointed that way, unless I'm mistaken. Michelle is planning on talking to Lieutenant Dana about it tomorrow after I check. We'll see how that goes. I sense a fart in church coming on. At some point here, the balance of power shifted, and it shouldn't have. When they rolled in with a dozen more people, they took the initiative, and since then we've been allowing them to pretend to be in charge. We've allowed it long enough that they believe they're in charge, and enough of the people here think they're in charge now, too. I'm not sure if that's an asset we can bring to bear or not. So long as they think they're making all the decisions unimpeded, we can do things behind their back, give them a false sense of security. I should say that the only cool kid from the NVC is that Sergeant Rodriguez. Ever since the NVC people took over here, he's been increasingly more nervous around Kevin and me. I think he knows they've overstepped their bounds and that it's a matter of time before something bad happens. He's been super polite and very helpful to everyone. And if shit goes bad... He dies last. These assholes shouldn't even be here. I'm never going to forgive myself for not fighting harder against them coming. This is my fault. Fuck. Oh, I'm so angry. I need to relax. I'll go hunting tomorrow. After Michelle talks to Lieutenant Dana, because I need to be around if that goes bad. Not so much because I want to prevent anything from happening, but because I want to leap off the top rope and drop an elbow on someone. Adrian. May 16th, 2014. As expected, Lieutenant Dana denied knowledge of any thefts by his people. I was there when Michelle talked to him about it, and he got heated when she asked him about it genuinely angry that his people were being accused of it. I think he's legit. That being said, I think the people who left here for Calendar Mountain weren't part of his original unit. I think they were part of the second group that came down while I was gone, and they might not be answering to him like his people do. He might be on the level about his crew, but the others? Michelle asked for everything to be inventoried and tagged today, and four or five people are still at it at this late hour. I bitch about us not having much, but we do have quite a bit. It's just not enough for the amount of people we have. Anyway, we want to account for everything, and if anything has gone missing, we talk to the good lieutenant again. She requested that one of our security cameras either be pointed at the cafeteria where we store our food, or that another camera be installed for the same purpose. We're getting in touch with Andy to get something rolling. I didn't go hunting after all. I spent the day helping count shit and working on not seething all the time. Adrian May 21st, 2014 They're definitely taking food. 
Our count this morning came up short after one of the breakfast cooks came in to get things started. She'd set aside everything she needed for the morning meal, and when she started to cook, she noticed things missing. Some eggs, some flour, etc. Nothing in great quantity, but little things here and there. She reported it to Melissa, who came right over to Hall E and told us. It was about then I wanted to go confront Sylvia, our previous food thief, but I thought better. I scampered right the hell over to the main computer that services the Wi-Fi cameras and dug into the files from the previous night. Andy, tech nerd extraordinaire, had set up a new infrared camera in the tree pointing straight at the cafeteria, and it caught everything. Four in the morning, one of the NVC Humvees pulled over to the cafeteria, and three of their soldiers let themselves into the building and then left with two boxes of food. The Humvee departed Bastion at dawn for Calendar Mountain as part of their normal routine. The fuckers stole from us. It took Michelle and Abby both to keep me from walking across the campus to Lieutenant Dana with my Kimber in hand. I swear to fucking God, I was about to ruin it for all of us over two boxes of food. Of course, Michelle dragged me along five minutes after. We blindsided Dana as he walked outside of his assigned house with a cup of instant coffee in hand. Our instant coffee, most likely. Mr. Lomanowitz, she said, all pissed off. I need to speak with you in private, please. His eyebrows shot up and he looked left and right like he hoped someone else with his last name would step up. No one did. He said, okay, and we walked inside to his first floor room in the back end of campus, right beside where their big radio setup is. His room was impeccable, clean enough to eat off the floor. Food has gone missing from the cafeteria again, she started. Dana interrupted. We're able to help with security. She shook her head and I laughed. No, I think we'll be fine with that. The food was taken by three of your soldiers. His turn to laugh. I don't think so. My men and women aren't thieves. Our security cameras show a different reality. Sobered his skinny ass right up. I beg your pardon? What cameras? We have a camera pointed at the cafeteria entrance now, and when we saw food missing this morning, we watched last night's tapes, and we have video proof of three of your people letting themselves in and liberating us of several boxes of food. I don't need to point out that we are still very short on food here and cannot spare anything for anyone, especially without permission first. I'm gonna call bullshit, Miss Lewis. I don't think so, he said. She's telling the truth, Dana. This is not cool, I said to him. We wouldn't accuse your people without proof. There's nothing to gain out of it, but we have proof, and now we need answers. He looked at me, and after a few seconds of trying to figure out what to say, he gave up and exhaled, tired. I'll need to see the tape. Was it one of my people or someone from another unit? Another unit, I said. That's strange. They must be operating on their own, stealing shit for themselves. Rogues, not on my orders, not on the NVC orders. If this is all true, I assure you they'll be held accountable. Not on NVC orders you're aware of, Michelle said. They could have been told by someone up north to liberate our supplies without your knowledge. That's a finger pointed you can't take back, Dana said, more than a little hostile. They wouldn't do that without telling me. Have they done that kind of shit before? I asked him. He didn't answer immediately, and I knew he was trying to figure out a way to say they hadn't when they had. You know what? Don't bother lying, I said. We'll need answers straight from Mazaki, period. Show me the damn tape, Dana said. And look, you know I can't promise you anything with him. With the zombies back in the city, everyone is acting strange. Mazaki is taking a very harsh course with this, not taking any risks. He's petrified they'll spread like wildfire again. I can't say what he's doing or what his plan is or how he'll respond to this if you come at him. But he is taking our fucking food. Stealing. You ever heard of it? This is a bit of a deal breaker, Dana. I threw in for good measure. Michelle looked at me a little disappointed. I guess I was trying to start a fight. Anyway, before we even went over to confront him, I had burned the video of the theft onto a CD-ROM, and we threw it into his laptop. 
It played, and he saw the proof. He agreed with me and said it wasn't his people, but it was NVC people. He asked for some time to get in touch with Mazaki on the radio, and we conceded. Of course, his entire radio conversation was on full broadcast to anyone with a military radio. I have a military radio. Here's the short story. Mazaki greenlit the appropriation of small quantities of food for Calendar Mountain in the event of a full-blown second outbreak of zombies. He was diplomatic, read cold, about it on the radio, but the cocksucker basically said he had to take care of his people and that we, Bastion, had to understand it was for the betterment of all that they had more food up there, that it was better for them to have food in storage for a possible crisis than it was for us to eat tonight. Yeah. No. Mazaki went on to express concern about Hal being here, and that he had been considering relocating Hal, whether we were on board with the idea or not. He was also wondering if we had any other Europeans on site that might be compromising our security. He seemed hesitant about it, but the fact that he said it aloud put ice in my veins. If he or any of his people touch a hair on Hal's head... Dana met us at the Hall A porch about an hour later and had no idea we'd listened to the whole gig. We played dumb and let him tell us the spinned version for us. Michelle, man, I have never seen her get angry like that. Of course, Michelle angry is her calm as fuck. She just smiled and nodded as Dana told her that Mizaki gave the go-ahead to relocate stuff and that we had to understand that Calendar Mountain was much larger than us and that a consolidation of supplies really was in the best interest of the most amount of people and blah-fucking-blah-blah. Blah. When he finished, she smiled at him and simply said, No. I'm sorry? He replied back to her. No, she repeated. No, I do not understand why he would take food from our children. No, he may no longer take anything from our children. No, you do not have my permission or understanding of this. Further, we will not tolerate it. We will be posting our own guards on our supplies effective immediately, and if one soul of yours tries to take so much as a rock from the ground here at Bastion, we will kick their butts straight across the bridge and send them north never to return. The kick their butts part of it really took away from the badass nature of her stand, but I gotta hand it to her. She stood her ground fearlessly and put the man on his heels. Are you in agreement with her? Dana asked me. Dana, I'll be a little more diplomatic than her right now, and... I need you to understand that when I'm the one being gentle, the world has gone up shit creek with no paddle to the docks of Port Crazy Town. Your people are becoming, have become, an occupying force. Your people are now thieves, looters. They took food from hungry people. If word of that gets out beyond the handful who already know, your men will suffer as a result. Mob justice, and I guarantee it. What happens when one of your kids wearing a uniform thinks he's going to tell someone here to stop doing something? Or that he deserves a kiss from one of our pretty girls? Because you're well on the way to being those kind of people. You know what'll happen? Mothers and fathers here will light up their torches and scoop up their pitchforks and have themselves a good old witch hunt. You are in danger because of what your boss decided to do. Understand that. This isn't a threat, but if you don't see to it that this appropriation program is halted five minutes after we all walk away, it will get ugly, and then it will get real ugly. He sighed and leaned over in the porch swing, putting his forehead in his palms. Okay, I'll do what I can. Then he left. We'll see what that means. If the Jinx fairy were to start flapping her wings, now would be the worst possible time. Adrian May 23rd, 2014 Lieutenant Dana told the NVC that we would not condone their theft of supplies. 
He used different, kinder words, but the end result was an escalation that seems to have put us on a collision course with them. Maybe not fighting, but definitely not good. Mazaki sent another ten soldiers south to Bastion to shore up their compliment here. On the radio, he used language like, in case of an outbreak and for the good of the children, but in reality, he's getting ready to pull a fast one like Hitler in Poland circa 1939. We are now walking around our own home in small groups, and those of us who don't carry firearms or aren't martial by trade are putting their nose to the grindstone and working constantly or staying indoors. North Korea is best Korea. We don't know what to do. Things are untenable like this. We've sacrificed our freedom and are staring down overwhelming forces and violence of unimaginable levels to get it back. Violence isn't the only answer to problems, but right now, I can't see any diplomatic way to tell Mazaki and his NVC occupiers to change their ways. They have no reason to. They have the upper hand and they know it. Who relinquishes control? They had their helicopter fly over this morning, nice and low, with a door gunner looking down at us. They were so low I could see the asshole pilot and his mirrored aviator sunglasses. I swear he was smiling down at us, arrogant as fuck. Huge waste of fuel, but the effect of seeing an armed helicopter fly directly above the cafeteria in the halls where we sleep at night was powerful. We can take them on the ground, I think, but that helicopter? I've got no solution for it. Yet. I don't know what the last straw will be, but the camel is starting to wobble, and when it goes down, it's taken the whole caravan with it. Abby is stirring the pot, too. She put out a newsletter across the locations more or less insinuating that the NVC stole from Bastion and that they are violating the principle of the agreement. She used clever words and lots of historical examples to flower it up, but she might as well have used exclamation points to draw a big middle finger on the back page. She also talked about the irony that a Japanese guy wants to relocate people to what amounts to an internment camp. I can't imagine that won't somehow draw heat if Mazaki gets word of it. She's thrown down a glove and challenged the man in the ivory tower. I hope he's a bigger man than I am, because I'd do something stupid were I in his shoes. How did things get like this? I should have been firmer, put up more of a fight. Did this before it got to where it is now. We never should have allied with them. <sighs> Maybe I need to talk to Kevin and Ethan and Mike and Abby and Hal about making a plan. I think I'll bring old man White and his crew of shooters into it, too. He's a wily one, if I can get him to stop doing that shit with his tongue all the time. Cluck, cluck, duck. Anyway, we need to do this on our terms, taking them out somehow. Take the initiative back. But that helicopter... In other news, the sickness that tore through our immigrants at Spring Meadow has run its course with no other fatalities. The NVC security people there are still keeping all the Brits and foreign nationals under lock and key, restricting their movement at all times and keeping them under what amounts to quarantine. I object to this. I understand their logic, but for some reason it seems like overkill to me. We lived for years with every single one of us being a risk, just like they are now, and to keep them all locked away like that makes my skin crawl. Of course, the realist in me says, well, Adrian, what if one of them dies and bites enough people to turn the whole settlement? And what if they break free and find more people and start the whole fucking apocalypse again? Doesn't it make sense to keep them isolated? I'm conflicted. I'm scared, too. Otis is acting very strange again. He's been upstairs with Abby and Gavin all day and night, and when I tried to get him to come to the room here earlier, he ignored me. He never ignores me. Not like that. Eh, whatever. He's a cat, doing cat things. Plus, it's not like he doesn't love Abby. She's got just as much litter in her sheets as we do. Next few days, I'm gonna reach out to the people I listed above and see if we can't start solving the riddle of what to do if we want to boot these ass munchers out of here. How we can do it with no violence, preferably, and if violence does need to be brought to bear...
how we do it with minimal loss of life. Well, minimal loss of life on our side. How to do it and deal with their fucking code words on the radio. We can't even take out the group here to buy us time to take out NVC headquarters. I think it's high time I got in touch with Captain Maria and see if I can get her two cents on this. But how do I do that without using the radio and tipping the NVC off? Maybe on horseback. Just ride up to their old National Guard base like a cowboy at sunset and pray to God they don't dome me with a bolt action as I do so. You remember how Dan McGreevy bought the farm, right? Then I'll try to talk them into helping me stage a massive civil war with the people they wanted nothing to do with against the people they wanted nothing to do with. That'll go well. Fuck. Oh, and our transplants, Caroline and Roger, had their baby this morning. Six and a half pound boy. I don't remember the name. Mom and baby are well, under the circumstances. Adrian. May 25th, 2014. Abby's letter roused the dragon. Mazaki got a copy of it delivered to him by some asshole at the factory, we think, and his response was to send even more people south. Of course, the clever bastard did it in a way that slipped by us, kind of. He sent another six bodies to Spring Meadow to fully lock them down as his territory, again under the thin cover of securing the immigrants for safety. He sent another four bodies to the factory to lock that place down. He tried to garrison five more troops and a Humvee at MGR, but they turned them away with weapons in hand, and that same Humvee came here, only to be turned away at the gate by Kevin and a compliment of our people. This all went down with Lieutenant Dana holding his dick in his hand, waiting for the shit to hit the fan and to have to take a side. The driver of the Humvee met with Michelle, and they agreed on a compromise. They'd relieve six of Lemanowitz's men so they could go home. Michelle thought this was okay, and the switch was on. What she didn't clarify was who was switching out with who. They pulled Lieutenant Dana and replaced him with a different officer. Picarillo. That meatball-dragging, sauce-dripping, nasty little prick is back. We were promised he was out of the equation, but now he's back, and furthermore, that anus is inside the wall here. They didn't send him this way without knowing exactly how I'd react when I found out. My feelings for him were crystal fucking clear. I'm not sleeping tonight. Maybe never again. I can't let this slide anymore. I can't sit here and let these goddamn people muscle us around. One more switcheroo like this, or one strafing run by that helicopter, and we won't be able to fight back ever again. It'll be over. Bastion ceases to exist as Bastion, as what we fought to make, and it's taken over by a bunch of expansionistic pricks that do what they want to whoever they want. We have to take a stand, and soon. We have to. I talked to Kevin a half hour ago. He and I are taken off at dawn to head south to Maria's place to see if we can get some kind of aid when shit goes down. We figure it's two hours by horse, maybe three. Fucking Picarillo. He smiled at me when he walked over the bridge. Smiled at me. What the fuck is it with people smiling at me? Is there something funny going on I don't know about? No one smiles at me. Not like that, they don't. Adrian. May 26th, 2014. This'll sound strange to you, Mr. Journal, but something happened tonight that shook me more than seeing the undead return. Something worse than big old Gerald eating his bandmate over at Spring Meadow. I know I said I wouldn't sleep, but I did. I got all my gear ready for the trip this morning with Kevin and then slipped into bed with Michelle, exhausted. I was out before I knew it and had dreams of my old buddy Gilbert. He and I were sitting on his porch during a beautiful summer day, rocking slowly, sipping Blue Label and watching kids I didn't recognize run around in his front yard. I remember talking with him, but I don't recall what we said to each other, but the dream felt calming, relaxing. 
It was good to see him again, even if it was only in a dream. I woke up to the sound of five or six gunshots. I opened my eyes and sat up, wired and ready to rock. Before I got my pants on, I heard two or three more shots, and when I had my boots on, I could hear a full-blown firefight breaking out, and it wasn't a hundred yards from Hall E. The radio blew up. People at the wall and gates were trying to figure out what was going on, and the people on our guard towers were trying to get lights on the action. It was Abby's voice that did it for me. Galvanized is the word. Her voice galvanized me. With less emotion than a turtle on New Year's Day in Canada, she came on and said, The NVC just tried to kill Hal, Gavin, and me. That's all I needed to hear. My blood boiled and my ability to make rational decisions cooked off. Gone the way of the dodo. I grabbed my gunfighter gear as Michelle got dressed and I went out the dorm via the side entrance near the river. Didn't want to walk out the door and get plugged. I saw Kevin running and I ran to catch up with him. If what Abby said was true, we had seconds before they radioed north to let them know something had happened, if they hadn't already. I didn't have time to grab my throat mic to try and get the PJs on it, so I knew it was up to me, and with Kevin right there, him too. I told him what we had to do, and he joined me without question. If Abby was talking on the mic, she and Gavin were safe for the moment. We ran fast, and we ran toward the sounds of gunfire. Rifle fire from M4s or ARs or M16s, but also the sound of a shotgun and a handgun. At least one handgun, maybe two. Kevin and I got close, and luckily I had my NVGs on me. Thank God for the failed packing to meet Maria, so I popped it down and let the world come into focus. The staff house the NVC guys lived in was obscured by their Humvee and the Bradley APC. I could see a few lights on inside and some motion, but... My main concern was making sure no one was inside the tank or Humvee or trying to get inside them. I swept the area and had Kevin come up to me to make sure no one slipped out and around the vehicles. Gunfire kept up inside. I went in the front door. Several of the NVC guys were shot right there, dead as doornails, guts blown apart by a shotgun. Gory mess, but a dead bad guy is a dead bad guy. From the crowded living room, I went into the empty kitchen, then the first two-floor bedrooms. Upstairs, I heard more gunfire, but I secured the radio in the bedroom that Lieutenant Dan slept in. I grabbed the handset right off it and tucked it in my back pants pocket. We'd managed to prevent them from making a broadcast. Upstairs, I heard a familiar voice begging for mercy, and then I heard another familiar voice screaming obscenities. Jason. The son from the junkyard, the young man who lost his family to the NVC, or so we think. I bolted to the stairs and ran up, screaming that a friendly approached. The screaming upstairs abated some, and I moved forward down the hall towards where I heard the yelling, my M4 up and my willingness to shoot as high as could be. My hands felt like static. I could hear distant gunfire from the center of canvas. I felt a little afraid, a lot afraid. Inside the last bedroom, I saw Sharon and Jason standing over a kneeling Sergeant Rodriguez. He wore nothing more than his skivvies and had his hands on his head. His face was bloodied, his eyes ran with tears, and he looked at me. They were going to kill him in cold blood, and I almost didn't care. This fucker was there that day, Jason blurted, his voice breaking. He clutched at a bloody smear on his jacket below the ribs. He deserves to die. I needed him alive. I knew I needed him. We all deserve a death, Jason. I'm not sure his needs to be right now. He's in his underwear, for Christ's sake. Leave him be. We can get information from him. Really hurt the NVC. What do you say, Sergeant? You willing to work for the good guys for a change? Absolutely. I'm sorry. Please, let me live. I have a wife. We want kids, Rodriguez pleaded. Snot ran down his face, mixing with the tears. What about my fucking mom and dad? Sharon screamed at him as she raised a pistol at his face. A small automatic, maybe a three eighty, Enough to pop his gourd. I... Picarillo did it. He went crazy when someone shot at him and Picarillo killed them. It's all his fault, Rodriguez said, his mouth trembling. I'm sorry, he's crazy. The truth stopped everyone cold. Jason and Sharon's guns both dropped down, and 
Rodriguez continued. He told the story of how a trade meeting went bad, how the NVC surprised them with an annexation and it turned into bloodshed. All because Piccarillo was an asshole. The story bought him his life. I found some zip ties in their gear and we secured him. Our local radio chatter came back to life as I searched and secured the rest of the house. In each of the rooms, I found at least one NVC body. In some rooms, two. In door jams, in the bathroom on the shitter. Sharon and Jason were here first, and they gave no mercy. I don't think I want to know how they got here so fast, armed. All I know is that they saved us for a few minutes. Hours, it turned into. We regrouped and locked Bastion down. I found my girl with Michelle back in Hall E with Hal and her baby as Kevin made sure everyone was safe. I just went to her and hugged her and kissed her and hugged Hal and kissed him too. I kept touching little Gavin's head over and over to make sure he was safe and real. They were alive. Shaken, bloodied, but alive. I can't sit here and write it all down because I just can't. I can't. Abby went to visit Hal with the baby late at night because Gavin was crying. I didn't even hear him crying, that's how hard I slept. She took the baby to his father because Hal's good at soothing the kid, and on her way she ran into Piccarillo and three of the NBC goons that rotated into the group the other day. They were armed and heading straight to the school building. Abby surprised them and a panicked Piccarillo told them to take her out. You don't take Abby out. Wrong fucking woman. And you certainly don't fucking achieve that by telling someone else to do it while she's armed and holding her infant son. A mama bear protecting her cub has fuck all on Abby. And my girl showed them exactly what I mean. Abby drew down on the four of them before they digested Pasta's command to kill a woman and her kid and lit them up. She plugged the goons, but Piccarillo got to cover as she killed the assassins. She got inside the building before he could return fire. She retrieved Hal, and with him playing Hold'em was Texas Rich. When she told them what happened, all hell broke loose. They busted out and started hunting down anyone wearing a uniform, and not a minute later, Jason and Sharon were headed to the staff house where the NVC lived. They won't admit to it, but I think they were heading up there to kill him anyway, or at least were sitting in the woods waiting for a convenient chance to have a late-night hunting accident or about 15 late-night hunting accidents. I'm chalking it up to good fortune, and I'm not asking any questions. If I ask them anything about what they were doing, then I have to go back and talk to Kevin and our Ginger Reaper and Amanda and Eddie about their execution of Angela's killers. Abby went on the radio sometime around then, and that turned us all on to him. There were 26 NVC people here when the sun went down. Picarillo is either hiding or gone. Rodriguez is in custody, and the other 24 are going to push up daisies after we burn their ashes. In the gun battle, we lost three people. Texas Rich took two rounds to the chest and died. I'm really pissed about that. He was a good man. Hal reports that Rich took out two guys before checking out and definitely saved Hal's life. We'll honor him appropriately, that I promise. We also lost two other people I don't think you know about. They came from the newest wave of refugees we took in. Same group Caroline and Roger came in, and Tom, the pilot we have yet to get a helicopter for. In addition to deaths, we had eight other people catch rounds. Quan and James both took wounds to the legs, and Ethan took a round to the left arm. Worst of all, a stray round busted a window in Hall B, and Ollie caught it in the fucking gut. Ethan and Joel had to surgically repair his bowel, but say he'll pull through. Not the best injury to suffer to the man who feeds us. He's in rough shape from pain, but will survive. If Ollie dies... Jesus, just writing that made me start crying. I fucking love that guy. Man, Ollie. Not fucking Ollie. Not my ginger brother. What about Melissa and their daughters? God damn. The other four wounded are in the clinic under the wounded Ethan and the not wounded Joel's care. They're expected to survive. For how long? Well, 
we need to figure that out. We have a town hall meeting in two hours, and we are figuring it out. You know, I just remembered something Gilbert said to me in my dream. <laughs> Weird. Is that an epiphany? Right before I woke up, when Abby went dirty Harriet on their traitorous asses, Gilbert turned to me and chuckled. I said, what's so funny? And he said back, time to get to work. There's no rest for the wicked, son. Ain't nobody wicked on this porch, you old fart, and no work to do. Oh, Adrian, you and me, we're the wickedest of them all, the best of the worst, sent to do what must be done, to protect the innocence of others, I suppose. We may be righteous in what we do, but never forget, we have done horrible things in the service of trying to make a better world. It's time for you to do some horrible things, I suspect. And I woke up. I'm starting to think that dream may have been a little more real than most of the others I've had of late. My hands feel like static again. Adrian. Terrible Things in Your Name Beneath the pervasive smells of sweat, drawing blood, and spent gunpowder, the cafeteria smelled of food. Rifles, pistols, and shotguns that hadn't yet been cleaned from the prior night's mayhem, coupled with the residue coating many of the men and women who had shot them, made the room stink of murder and war. Briefed by a harried Michelle to prepare a larger lunch than usual, the cooks had put together the best meal they could on short notice, and that meal fought the battle to fill the room with something pleasant for the noses of the people of Bastion. Once the nervous populace of Bastion had eaten their baked chicken reluctantly, the meeting, she called, began. The rectangular tables covered in faux wooden lamination had all been dragged to the painted concrete walls of the room and folded away when possible. Above them, faded sayings painted on the walls by teachers long dead tried to motivate hungry students that were just as likely dead. The old and young used the few tables alongside the wounded, but everyone else stood. Everyone. The entire population of Bastion, save those manning the towers and gates, and the entire population of MGR were in the cafeteria to hear what happened, and to hear what would happen next. Their bodies were stiff, their faces racked with grief and worry. They looked to the center of the room for guidance and hope. At the center of it all stood their leader, Michelle Lewis. At her side was Adrian, and at their side were Kevin and his love, Becky, as well as Abby and her love, Harold. Becky held her and Kevin's daughter, and Shelby clung to Kevin's leg, trying to hide from the crowd that looked at the man that became her dad and his friends. In Abby's arms were their son, Gavin. She clutched the quiet little boy with the bright blue eyes close and kissed his forehead over and over. Hal watched her and the baby with eyes filled with a father's love and tuned out the stares from the nervous people surrounding him. I'm ready, Michelle said to Adrian. No, you're not. None of us are, but that's never stopped us before. They shared a smile, a laugh, then a quick kiss. Adrian stood back and whistled once. The sharp, piercing noise halted the tremor in the room and brought the focus to him. He waited a moment, then stepped back and let Michelle take the stage. She spoke clearly and without hesitation. I'm sure you've all gathered the majority of facts about what happened. Late last night, we were betrayed by our supposed allies with the Northern Valley Cooperative. A small group of their soldiers attacked Abby as she held her son, as they were on their way to either capture or kill Harold. She paused and let everyone gasp and sigh. The sounds of shock turned after a fashion and became angrier. She picked up before the momentum of discord grew too powerful. As you can see, we were able to prevent them from carrying out their grisly task, though it was not without loss. We suffered three dead last night and eight wounded, though the men and women who took up arms were able to defeat the NVC soldiers who were stationed here, 
Can we please give them a round of applause? Men, women, please step forward and let us recognize what you did for us last night. A group of people stepped forward into the open space as raucous applause erupted. They looked around, sheepish and embarrassed at Michelle's request. Most slipped back into the crowd within seconds and tried to be forgotten. Jason and Sharon lingered a bit, and the look of vindication on their faces was powerful. But now we are faced with the aftermath of the horrors of what happened. We may have survived the night, but now we must develop a plan to move forward, and that's why we're all here today. We need to negotiate, a man called out. Adrian recognized him as Tim Bord, the Vegas magician. There's no way we can confront them. They have tanks and helicopters. We took one of their tanks last night, Jason answered him, and we have the Trinity here. They saved the world. They can figure this out. Adrian laughed out loud, and Kevin joined in. What? Jason asked Adrian, the crowd watching. Some of us traveled a very long way to be near you three. There are people here who drove through hell from Texas to park their asses on a seat near where you eat. Some people here don't pray to God anymore, Adrian. They pray to you guys. They may not admit it out loud, but they do. Rich did. He was afraid to say anything about it, but he did. Do you get that? No, not really. There's a lot I don't get, though. I pity the idiots who say a prayer asking for my help. I'm no God, no Jesus, no Buddha. I will deliver no one from sin, and if you're looking for forgiveness, too, you're barking up the wrong fucking tree. I'm just a dude trying to figure this shit out one day at a time, Adrian said, almost scowling. I was drafted for what happened. I didn't enlist. There's a big difference. That's not what it's about, man. You're a fucking icon, bro. You three do shit people write comic books about like it's your job. Because it is. Stop trying to be humble about it, Jason challenged. Murmurs agreed with him across the room. Michelle broke in. Jason, if you could give us a few minutes. Tim, I hear your concern, and we need to make sure we are all aware of the consequences of our decision here today. The way we make decisions here is strange on a good day, and I need us all to be present for this. While we don't vote normally, I am suggesting that perhaps we do just that. Vote for what? Kevin asked her. Vote for a plan to make peace or perhaps go to war, she said, somber. Kevin looked at Adrian, then back to her. There aren't enough people here to go to war. We could hamstring them, maybe, do some damage to buy us time and get them to forget about attacking us, but there's no winning a war against them. Not without a lot more than what we got. We still need to figure out how to get past their all-safe radio check, which is coming up soon, hours away. Michelle showed him her palms and a shrug. Maybe I should rephrase it. Let's say we must decide on whether or not to pursue a diplomatic solution or whether we pursue a course of confrontation. I'm working out of my element, Kevin. Help me. He laughed again and nodded. So, with that said, I've brought this cardboard box here and a few hundred slips of paper. I'm going to ask you all to write down whether or not you want to fight the NVC or whether or not you want us to try to make peace. Michelle lifted the stale brown box up from the floor and looked around for a place to set up her impromptu voting booth. No, Adrian said, stepping to her. No voting. She looked at him, confused. What? Why not? I would think people would want their voice heard. A fair way to make such an important decision would be to vote democratically. Yeah, that's a great idea. It'd be a greater idea if we were actually a democracy, but we aren't. We're a benevolent dictatorship that pretends to be a democracy most days. Today is not the day to pretend to be what we aren't anymore. Today, you, as our leader, get to make the decision. You know the facts better than everyone around us. You know the stakes. You know what's to be gained and what can be lost. Time to not be humble, right? I say, you tell us what's going to happen. Is this the last resort?
The room remained silent, save for a few nervous coughs. Adrian, I don't know. I'm uncomfortable with sending people to fight. What if there's a way for us to make peace with them? What if we... I know, he said, interrupting her. That's why I think you need to make the decision. Because you know what can be said. You know them, you've met them, you've been happy with them, and you've been angry with them. Because you have a horse in that race, whether you run it or not, and because if you decide to do it, you know you have to. You'll know there's no other choice. If we fight, it would mean you'd go, wouldn't it? She asked him, already knowing the answer. I wouldn't ask anyone to go in my place, he said back to her. I'm your horse, my dear. I don't know if I'm prepared for that. She sighed and turned from him. Michelle wiped a lock of blonde hair from her eyes and looked at the people of Bastion. Tired, scared, and hungry, they watched as the Trinity stood before them, human and fragile, scared and still there, still strong. They stole from us. They sent assassins here. They could have been diplomatic. They could have asked us to do something differently, but they didn't. They've sent more and more power here to help us, but clearly now it's a ruse to gain greater power over us. They aren't even being honest with the people they've sent here, she thought out loud into a room filled with silence. Right, Adrian said. So what would you say to them to make them give up the idea that they still need to handle Hal, Becky, Shelby, and maybe Gavin and Chloe? What would we say to them to make them move beyond the fact that we just slaughtered two dozen of their best? They'll never trust us again, she said. No, Kevin replied, they never trusted us, and we never really trusted them in the first place either. We allowed them in because we thought we couldn't beat them if it came to violence. We capitulated to avoid a fight. Can you beat them? she asked Adrian. In a fair fight? Hell no. But I don't know. I know that if we don't do something to them before they do something to us, we won't be able to beat them. And by beat them, I mean do enough strategic damage immediately to make attacking us seem impossible. Are you willing to do it? They tried to kill my Abby. I'm only in this cafeteria because you asked me to be here. Abby and I would be halfway up Calendar Mountain with chainsaws and hand grenades right now if I had my way. The room laughed, but... Neither Adrian nor Abby did. Will you do it? Michelle asked him directly. I can't do it alone. I'll need some help. Who? How many people? She asked him. Kevin? Maybe a few other shooters. Small numbers, so if we're taken out, the rest can still make a stand here. That or feign ignorance, and you can throw us under the bus after we die. We're just a bunch of rogue operatives if we fail, but we can hurt them bad if we're clever. We'll come at him sideways. Sideways? What will you do? She asked him. Adrian started to say something, but stopped. He looked to a slate-faced Kevin, then into the crowd. He sought out familiar faces. The faces of friends who he had gone to battle with before. Faces he trusted. He saw old faces like Quan and Ethan and Joel, and new faces like Hawaii Dave and the odd old man Mr. White and his crew of policemen family. The old man from Virginia matched Adrian's gaze, and Adrian felt a flush of confidence come towards him. Adrian, what will you do? He sighed and spoke with deliberate words, chosen with pain. I will do terrible things, Michelle. I will kill, I will murder, I will blow shit up, and I will do all of it in the name of the people of Bastion for a better chance at a future for our people and the way of life we're trying to rebuild here, but make no mistake, I will do awful, awful things in your name, in our name. I don't want to do it, but I'll do it because I'm good at it, and because if I do it, others won't have to bear the burdens that come with it. Michelle looked to the floor, overcome with a flood of emotions. In the crowd, multiple people suffered the same fate. Crying came, then sobbing as the crushing weight of Adrian's words pressed down on them. Just tell me it's what you think we need to survive, and I'll see it done, or die trying.
the big man said without fanfare. I... I don't know. He stepped to her and put his broad hands on her shoulders. This is the way it should be. For far too long, old men sent kids to war to die without ever meeting them and without having to pay the price. You can make this decision knowing full well it is what must be done and knowing that you could also share in the burden of the cost that could be paid. This is the way, and these are the reasons to go to war. She looked up with wet eyes that turned angry after she blinked the tears away. Enough is enough. Do it. They'll never listen to us, and they'll just attack us with their tanks and that damned helicopter until we're all dead. We're not running, and we're not going to take it anymore. I won't watch us suffer under their heel another day, and if there's anyone in the world that can work the miracle we need, it's you. Adrian's face twitched into a grimace, but he stifled the expression. He smiled and nodded. The people of Bastion stood in shock. Their entire civilization had just declared war on a larger, better armed, and trained enemy, and they had no idea what to do or what to say. Adrian turned to Kevin, then faced Becky. I'm sorry, but I need him. I know. I couldn't stop him anyway, Becky said with a shrug as she wiped the tears from her face. Once more? Kevin asked, extending a hand to his best friend. Adrian took it, and they shook. Once more. What about Hal and me? We're two of the best shooters you have, Abby said, pissed Adrian hadn't come to her yet. You're a mother. He's a father. I'll figure out how best to use your skills when I have time to think about it. Calm your tits for now. Abby glared at him, but a coup from Gavin pulled her anger away. Adrian looked away from her and into the crowd. He looked for another face, a specific face. When he found her, he exhaled and took two steps in her direction. What? Mallory asked. Still got your trimmers? Of course. I can't do much with scissors and only one arm. Go get them. I'm gonna need a haircut for this. May 26th. 2014, second entry. We're going at them. I don't know exactly how, but we are. Kevin and I, if I have my way. I might bring a few others into it if I absolutely have to for help here and there, but we're doing it. I'm writing this on my laptop in one of the spare rooms in the medical clinic. I called together a meeting of the war minds to get a better idea of what we can do and how to do it. Mission planning. I couldn't pull both of them out of the clinic with so many wounded, so we're here and we're about to start. We have Hal, Abby, Michelle, Caleb, Quan, James, Ethan, and Joel, Kevin and myself, Blake, old man Peter White and one of his nephews, a guy named Phil, which was not lost on me, plus Kate and Nick. We're going to go over our plans in the event we're attacked, too. We have to be ready. I'm going to take notes and then Kevin and I'll figure it out. We've abandoned the idea of trying to get help from Captain Maria and her people. We can't afford to spend the time with so many balls in the air, and there's a very low chance she'll offer to help anyway. It'd be like the Washington generals begging the crowd for help at halftime versus the Harlem Globetrotters. Everyone knows how that game will end. Right now, we have two priorities that won't last more than four hours. The first is figuring out what the NVC radio all-clear message is for the day so we don't get invaded, and the second is tracking down Piccarillo before he gets to Calendar Mountain. Mike and Patty took that job on, and they're scouring the world between here and there looking for him. If they don't find him, they might at least slow him down. I'm not angry right now. I'm happy. My pulse is slow and my breathing steady. We've got a job, war, and... Now we're putting the handbook together to get it done. I'm in my happy place in many ways, I guess. I don't want to kill people, I really don't. I thought my days of that were long over, but I was wrong. Maybe my days of that will never be over. Maybe this is just how it is now. How it always will be. Sad. But 
I will do what must be done because my loved ones need protecting, and I am a protector. That's just a pleasant way of saying murderer, I suppose. Maybe that's why Kevin is the warden, the actual protector. I should also add that my, let's say, polite but dickish nudging of Michelle to make the call to do this has resulted in her being very quiet. She's withdrawn, sad, and I am positive she's racking up gray hairs five an hour. We've barely kissed, let alone hugged, since the meeting. I suspect it'll be that way for some time. Oh, and the mohawk is back. What? It gave me pretty good luck back in the day. I could use some luck right now. Oh, and now that I think about it, I haven't had a dream with people in it in days. Mostly, it's just me doing stuff on my own. Like, always all alone. Not even a sign of Otis. Come to think of it, it's been like that since... Since the zombies came back. Not again. Please, no. Not again. Adrian May 28, 2014 I don't think this could get much more fucking complicated. I need to move as Kevin and I are heading out to pull the toilet paper curtain open on this shit show. People are running around everywhere as we prepare for war, and exhaustion is the norm. As you can see, I'm alive and that's good. The Jinx Fairy flutters about, but as yet she hasn't landed on us and sprinkled us with her fuck you dust. That won't last until noon tomorrow. Good news first. We secured the radio codes for the remainder of the month of May, so Calendar Mountain doesn't know what's happened at Bastion unless they drive here or fly over here. Sergeant Rodriguez tried to help us by finding Lieutenant Dana's code book. Apparently, there's a little spiral-bound notebook filled with dates and random safe words, but that code book went back to the mountain when Dana was pulled. The immediate conclusion was that Picarillo brought new codes, so Rodriguez helped us search for Picarillo's shit, and lo and behold, we found a tiny spiral-bound notebook and a backpack with five days' worth of codes in it. The codes were Cherokee, Sioux, Mohawk, Iroquois, and Custer. Not sure what the deal is on Custer. As it turns out, Quan, the Vietnamese guy with the thickest Asian accent imaginable, does the best Picarillo impersonation, like dead-on Joe Pesci watered down just enough to sound like pasta actual on the horn. Mazaki himself called the morning of the 26th, not two hours after we met to make the plan to take these fuckers out, and not ten minutes after we'd found the codes. Had Quan not been spot on and right there when Mazaki called, man, I don't know. Anyway, King Shit of Turd Hill North asked if the rogue had been secured after being fake and pleasant for like ten seconds. The sound of irritation in his voice was unmistakable. It got worse when Quan said, and I quote, Not yet. They moved him. I'm searching. You'll note Quan chose words with no L in them. He fucks up L's worse than crack addicts spill drinks when they're fiending for rock. Anyway, Mazaki said to keep at it, and Quan said, Yes, sir. Time purchased. We turned our planning to Picarillo. If he made it to the factory and made contact, we'd be fucked hard. As we saw it, that meant two things. Block off his ability to get to the factory and or find out where he'd go if that wasn't his destination. Obviously, he'd try to secure a vehicle, but we've already looked at every vehicle in a 20-mile radius of here. Like, every vehicle, literally. They're either non-operational due to dead batteries, flat tires, or squirrels, or they're seized up or drained of fuel. Blake and his garage gang have stripped so many parts off of them right where they were left, it's not even funny. Well, actually, it's pretty funny. Anyway, Pasta isn't getting a car. He might have stolen a bicycle. There are plenty of those he'd ride out of town on. The good news is that our cameras at the corner of Route 18 and Auburn Lake Road caught him on foot, moving towards town, which means he's headed where we'd expect him to. He was also carrying an M4 and had minimal gear on him. Enough to survive, I'm sure, but he's not loaded for war like Rambo. 
So Mike and Patty are borrowing horses, and we've dedicated multiple people to searching hard. Peter White and his two nephews and nieces are the core of that group. I should mention that during our meeting the other day, White didn't say anything. Didn't offer advice or speak, like, at all. Not even one of his weird tongue clucks, which he has done whenever he was thinking around me. He did, however, watch Kevin with something approaching fatherly love, which was weird, but then again a lot of people look at us strangely now. We should be used to it. Anyway, we're hopeful we find pasta and turn him into sauce before he gets into an operating car or if he reaches the factory before we do, which is where I'm headed tonight with Kevin, James, Blake, and Caleb as a breaching team. We're also bringing six more shooters to secure the perimeter to stop squirters when we go in. Andy is disabling their cameras remotely with his laptop when we approach, so they don't know what's coming. This might be the worst part of it all. Hector and Celeste went behind our backs to ally with the NVC, and when we get there tonight, Kevin and I are going inside that factory with suppressed weapons, and we are killing the NVC soldiers if they don't lay down arms immediately. If Hector or Celeste so much as reach for a gun, we will kill them too. They've been friends for a long time, and there are many people in that building I care about, but things are a little different now. It breaks my heart to think I'll point a gun at someone who had my back for so long. We've come too far and been through too much to be doing this to each other. If all goes well, we will secure the NVC people, any of the factory people who still want to throw in with the counselors from Camp Ass Fuck Your Neighbors, and we'll replace them with our folks for when Picarillo finds his way there. Gotta run. Kevin said we're leaving. Shit, there's so much more to write. Later, maybe. Adrian. May 29th, 2014. Sixteen dead, seven wounded. Blake took a round to his side armor, breaking a couple of ribs in the process, but he'll survive. I shot my friend Hector in the face when we got to his bedroom. No sense wasting time talking around it. The shame, I feel, is deep. I breached his room wearing full head-to-toe armor, and when I identified myself and told him not to move, he moved for something on his bedstand. I couldn't risk it and double-tapped him with my rifle. One round hit his upper chest and the other entered his face straight through the lower teeth. He died quickly. He was reaching for a pistol. There's a tiny bit of solace in that. Not enough. Celeste was shot, but she survived. She and about half of the people at the factory are locked up right now at the police station downtown, same one we got the HRT from so long ago. It's crowded in the cells, but that's what you get for siding with douchebags. We'll convince her and the others of the error of their ways when we have time. Right now, we've so little. We have the NVC radio codes for the factory until the end of June, so we're good there. Still not sure what to do about the codes for Bastion, though. They run out on the 31st. I meant to write about capabilities before we left to hit the factory, but ran out of time. Long story short, there are two massive variables we have to solve for before we can even think about direct action against Calendar Mountain. We have appropriated a Humvee and one Bradley from what was left at Bastion. At the factory, we confiscated one more Humvee and two diesel pickups they used for transport. Last I knew, the NVC had stationed two Humvees, one up-armored HEMTT, and one more Bradley at Spring Meadow. Now, we know that when they visited us at the factory, they showed us four up-armored Humvees, two up-armored HEMTTs, three M113 Bradleys, a deuce and a half, and the helicopter. Now, none of the Humvees we have are up-armored which means they still have four unaccounted for. The HEMTT at Spring Meadow was up-armored, which is likely one of the two we've seen, and I just can't fucking imagine that these assholes have more than three Bradleys still in operation. We have one, and there's one at Spring Meadow leaving one accounted for. My money is on that last one being Mizaki's personal limo. We also don't know where the deuce and a half is. I wish I'd been more cognizant the day we met them at the factory. I could have memorized or at least told someone to mark down what the vehicle plates or markings were so 
we'd have a better idea what's going on with them. Give me a second while I wipe these tears away over all that spilled milk. We do know that the other Humvees that have come to visit us, the same ones they stole food from us with, were up-armored. We have five AT-4 anti-tank weapons left. If you do the math, we're totally fucked. Well, I guess we're like 40% remaining fucked. But I suck at math, so you do the math for me, Mr. Journal. I guess looking at the bright side, we've picked up an MK-19 automatic grenade launcher, an M2, 50 cal, and a brand new saw. Tons of ammo for each weapon, relatively speaking. Finding the vehicles and destroying them are the first variable. Second variable is that motherfucking helicopter, but we might have a solution on it. Do you remember when Kevin said he was planning on going to the airport? Uh, back in March, I think. Well, when the NVC wagged their dick above us the other day, flying overhead so low to intimidate us or whatever, Ethan was able to grab the tail number off the chopper. I suppose he could have grabbed it when the thing landed here to show off, too. If we can make it to the airport, Ethan thinks we can find the FAA records of registered aircraft in the area. That should tell us who the owner of the helicopter was before that day. That might lead us to the name of the pilot and perhaps their address or the owner's address or where it was might still be parked. Hangered? Landed? Docked? Stored? I don't know what exactly we'll get, but we hope to find something that'll lead us to where they park the fucker at night or where the shades-wearing jizz stain of a pilot might live. If we can take the pilot out, then we theoretically take the bird out of the sky, too, assuming they don't have multiple pilots. Now, maybe we can get our hands on the chopper ourselves and get our own flight crew up in the sky. If they lose air superiority, that'll be a big blow against them, if only for morale purposes. Sometimes, all you gotta do to beat the champ is ring his bell hard enough in the first round. So then we have to retake Spring Meadow from the asshats they have stored there for security, which is a much larger project than the factory. We're talking about a massive gated luxury home community filled with houses plus several businesses a block or two away. Blah. That's a large-scale attack we wouldn't have attempted without air support and at least two dozen Humvees and an Abrams or two in Iraq. We're going to do it with a few pickup trucks and some slingshots, all while hoping we don't plug one of the refugees so they turn into fucking zombies and make it a whole lot more complicated for us. Actually, we'll probably bring their Bradley and... Holy shit. That's it. We'll Trojan horse ass rape them with their own tank. They'll never know what hit them if we work it right. I gotta talk to Kevin before we leave for the airport. Peace, Mr. Journal. That's what's not for dinner. Adrian May 30th, 2014 Still no sign of Picarello. I never thought I'd write that we had a safe journey into the city. Like, for years, every time I talked about the city, it was in fear-laden terms and half-measures. The place scared me, and for good reason. Empty of zombies now, it's a hell of a lot less scary. Granted, the survivors trying to scratch out a living on their own out that way can be real assholes from time to time. See orphaned Danny McGreevy Jr., but really, the city isn't that scary anymore. We took a route that skirted far out of the vicinity of both the factory and Spring Meadow should the NVC be traveling to or from either of those areas. Kevin and I went with Joel, Hal, I made him go. He needed to get out and be useful, regardless of whether or not he might turn if he died. My brother Caleb and Kate. It made sense to bring one of our pilots to the airport, plus Kate's a good shooter. Everyone else, well, no explanation is needed. We opted for a quieter, faster set of vehicles for this. We took two fairly beat-up SUVs and drove like bats out of hell to the airport, heading towards the FAA building on site. We encountered no one on the way, and the airport was empty too. Gutted, really. The FAA building was a small two-story brick affair built in the 60s. Large square windows and blocky architecture growing out of massively overgrown grass made it look like an old middle school that desperately needed updating. The glass front doors were smashed open, and 
We entered, expecting resistance. Other than spooking a few squirrels, rats, and birds, we didn't have to deal with anything. Well, searching. It took us several hours of going through file cabinet after file cabinet looking for the paperwork we needed. All of the planes in the registration area had paperwork filled out for them. We just had to find the file cabinet that had them. We had to smash apart multiple locked drawers for nothing, but eventually we hit pay dirt. Kate found it, and we danced for joy. The bird in question is registered to a company with its headquarters just a few miles from Calendar Mountain. The company was a biotech company called Talbot Labs. Now, once I heard the name, it assembled itself for me. The guy who owned the company was an eccentric billionaire named Rick Talbot, who flew back and forth to work over the mountains in his brand new helicopter. He was on the news more than once for announcing some crazy fucking invention sure to change the world or for saying something weird. I remember what he looked like, and I'll be damned if it wasn't Shades the pilot, clear as day. So, a rich prick like that joins up with the NBC, right? Makes sense. They've got power, he's got a chopper, and they can scratch each other's backs until kingdom come if they shack up with each other. Now, a rich prick like that isn't going to relocate from his multi-million dollar mountain home to the ski resort. He just isn't. I would also argue that he's got mad security at his home, up to and including fences, walls, and armed guards. This guy had more money than brains, and he was one of those super geniuses. We just need to figure out where Ricky's home is, but I'd bet my left nut, that's the big one, so you know I'm serious, that if we broke into his old business and raided the HR department, we'd find his personnel file, and then we'd get his address. That's tonight. Kevin and I already decided he and I were doing it alone in a black Prius, decapitation strike style with a low profile. And while that's happening, a second major force is heading to Spring Meadow to take it back. We're heading out with the entire NVC vehicle complement we have. Two Humvees and a Bradley, and the group is heading into the front gate as if they're there to visit legitimately. A mile away, we'll have another four or five vehicles filled with shooters who'll zip in to reinforce. As soon as they're inside, all hell will break loose. It's far more complicated than that, but the general idea is that they'll hit all the locations in the gated community simultaneously. We are sending 28 shooters. I'm so fucking nervous for them. We should be there, Kevin and I, but we have to hit the helicopter first, and in the event something goes wrong with us, they need to take out Spring Meadow's occupying force. A lot of people are going to be dead come sunup. I gotta try to spend a few hours with Michelle. She and I have lost our connection the past few days, and I love her too much to let this awkward silence keep up. She and I both deserve better than that. Then I need to get some sleep to be fresh. Not looking forward to any dreams I might have. Adrian May 30th, 2014 Second Entry Kevin and I just got back from up north. We have officially reached the point of no return. I feel terrible. You'll see why in a bit, Mr. Journal. I need more sleep. It's almost dawn, and Mazaki is guaranteed to call within a few hours, and today is the last code we have to keep them out of here. We're almost out of time, and we don't need much to really make a run at them. Kevin and I rode out just after lunch north to Talbot Labs. Finding it wasn't hard. Signs everywhere once we got close. We made sure to time our arrival up north after sunset during evening so anyone would have a harder time seeing and identifying us. Makes me wish I hadn't gotten a mohawk cut, but oh well. The building was a massive facility set at the back end of an equally massive parking lot. It sat at the base of a very steep mountain less than a 20-minute drive from the exit that would take you to Calendar Mountain. We scoped it out driving under 20 to stay on electric and with the headlamps extinguished. No lights on at the plant, no smoke rising. It looked empty. Kevin drove us around the back of the building to the warehouse docks, and after checking the perimeter on foot and scaring away a black bear that came within 50 yards, I used my trusty Halligan to pry open one of the rear emergency exits. 
God, I love that tool. I'm so glad I bring one with me wherever I go. Once inside, we moved through the pitch-black interior using our NVGs. We wanted the advantage if anyone was inside, and moving around in the dark seemed like a good idea. Inside the warehouse, we found almost nothing. I mean, the place had been cleared out, leaving empty pallets stacked up on the floors. Wall signs explained what industrial chemicals belonged where, and as we moved from bay to bay, we saw the massive hall Calendar Mountain made here. Mazaki and Thorpe had years of chemistry in stock, and they were putting it to good use. Pissed we didn't get to raid it, we left the manufacturing and warehouse area and made our way upstairs in the offices to the HR department. We had to pry open numerous doors on the way. Tons of security everywhere, but with no power, it was all inert and no more than locked doors. Kevin covered me while I muscled him open one after another with the Halligan. No dead bodies, and the place seemed sterile, like no one was in the building on the 23rd of June when it went to shit. That, or maybe someone cleaned it out after the fact. It was weird. Most of the places we clear are either already raided or have dead bodies and garbage in it. Human resources provided us no threats, but it did waste our time, just the same as the cabinets at the FAA office. After an hour or two of searching, we did find the personnel files, and we were able to get an address on Mr. Shades. Then, of course, I had to see his office. Locked, I busted it in the same as every other door. He had a corner to himself the size of Cassie's in my condo. Widescreen television on one wall, a desk big enough to have an orgy on, and expensive modern art paintings all over. He had an empty mini-fridge and a fully stocked bar. We took his top-shelf stuff. I felt like we had to steal something if they happened to look at the place. Mostly because it was hella good booze. Guy had some thirty- and forty-year-old scotches that would have set you back the big bucks back in the day. Sitting in his office, Kevin and I looked at an old road map we brought, thank you, Rand McNally, and made the call to scout Rick Talbot's place. It was five miles over the mountain heading away from Calendar Mountain, and we could make it there easily with the Prius. We drove in the dark with severely puckered assholes two-thirds of the distance, and then parked the Prius hidden away. We found an old rest stop in the mountains at a scenic overlook, and drove the car around the backside of a toilet where it couldn't be seen from the road. After fluffing the overgrown grass back to standing and covering the car with branches and debris, we grabbed all our gear and hiked the rest of the distance through the woods. Talbot's home was a guarded joke. Just like I guessed, the entire place was surrounded by an eight-foot wall topped with ornate wrought iron decorations that were probably sharp as a motherfucker. Of course, we approached from elevation and with our night vision and rifle scopes, plus the lights they had on so we knew he had electricity, we could see the whole compound from a quarter mile away, negating any cover the wall would offer. The house was contemporary. Square walls, lots of windows, and sharp angles on the roof. Through the sides of the house, made mostly of glass, you could see a three-story tall fireplace with a fire going. May and warm, but I guess when you're rich you keep wasting shit straight through the apocalypse. Roaming the grounds, Kevin and I observed four armed, uniformed NVC guards, and we saw Rick, plus a woman that was either his wife or girlfriend. No kids, no dogs, no strays other than that. Sitting on a steel landing pad that hung on the edge of the mountain the house was built on the side of sat the same fucking helicopter that flew over and landed at Bastion. It looked tiny and unthreatening sitting there on the ground, but there it was, sitting on the ground. We could see one saw still on the mount on the helicopter, which was dumb and bad for the weapon. I immediately wished we'd brought Tom, the Coast Guard pilot that we inherited. Maybe six souls stood between us and taking off with the fucking thing and claiming it as our own. They weren't ready for an attack. They weren't even paying attention, just... Wandering around, kicking rocks, bullshitting with each other when they crossed paths, and generally passing the time as if they had nothing to worry about. As if Kevin and I weren't watching them and planning their death. Such power in that moment. Whether you live and love or die is my decision. It took us five minutes to devise a plan to take the house. 
With our special operations radio set, we knew we'd be off their comms grid, and with our throat mics, we could communicate almost silently. Kevin could tune into their radio channel up the hill, and we'd be aware of their transmissions if they made any. They'd never know what hit them if we were careful. Bold, but careful. Kevin provided overwatch while I infiltrated down the mountain to the ground. He had a 300 Win Mag rifle, and I had my Halligan and my M4A1 with the suppressor affixed. I nearly shit and pissed myself from nervousness. From the high elevation, we saw that there was an easy-to-scale spot on the wall near the cliff. I could tie myself to a rope and literally swing around to the end of the wall over the space in the valley and be inside within seconds. Kevin covered me while I did just that. I went when he called me clear. I ran across the mowed grass to the back edge of the four-car garage and took a knee in the dark. Kevin told me two guards came, and when they were out in the open, no more than thirty feet away, I leaned around the edge of the garage and put my red dot on the first of them and put two rounds in each person's chest. The suppressed rifle made noise. We've got the best suppressors Uncle Sam could buy, but they still make noise. Bangs instead of loud cracks. Hell, the two of them and their gear hitting the ground made almost as much noise. With half of the armed guards dead, I had to move. If the others heard me shooting and the chance they heard the rifle firing or the bodies hitting the ground was good, they'd be after me or even worse, be calling Calendar Mountain for help. Kevin called me clear and I backed up to the front of the house where he could observe me and I waited for the other guards to come back around. The first one trotted around the corner investigating the noises I'd made. The guy was oblivious to me standing there. I had tucked away inside a dark spot at the corner of the house in the garage, just behind a bush that sported a fresh trim to stay flat on the top. Mostly, I wanted to catch my breath and still my hands. He coughed and scratched his ass as he walked by me, looking to see what made the noise he'd heard. As soon as he had his back to me, I pulled the trigger and put a round between his shoulder blades. He went down, grunting and wheezing in pain, and I stepped out from behind the bush. I put another round into the base of his skull as he rolled around, trying to find a way to ask someone for help. He never saw me. He died alone and confused, another fucking victim of someone's idiocy. The fourth guy also heard the gunshot and was maybe fifty feet away around the far corner of the home. He didn't see me, well, I think he didn't, but he certainly knew that his buddy went down and he started shooting in my general direction, screaming at his fallen buddy. All I had to do was dive back away into the corner I'd hidden in, and I stayed out of the way of his shots. Within seconds, the idiot was at his fallen friend, and as he took a knee to render aid, I put my red dot on his chest and put two into him. I later saw that it was the kid who pointed his rifle at me the first time I met Picarillo at the factory, the one who stood at attention and looked at me with awe. Never meet your heroes, kid. I shot out a window that led to the living room at the base of the fireplace and entered the house. I couldn't give them time. I had the initiative, and I had to maintain my violence. I had to keep them scared and panicking. The woman and Rick Talbot were both yelling and screaming as they scampered up the wide, open, and central stairs to get to the second-level mezzanine that overlooked the whole open house. Freeze, I screamed. Down on the fucking floor. I'd had enough bloodshed. I'd hoped they would comply. She did. Talbot kept running down the elevated area above the living room towards a door that was probably a bedroom. Might have been a gun in there. Maybe. Maybe not. I shouldered my rifle again and squeezed off maybe half a dozen shots up at his legs. A couple of the rounds hit home, and he went down on his face, screaming in pain. She matched his volume, and I ran up to where she stood at the top of the stairs, she got zip-tied and sat on the stairs, and I went to Shades. He begged for his life, and I told him to shut the fuck up. I grabbed my blowout bag and spiked him with morphine. His leg wounds weren't bad. I mean, they were bad. I put holes in the fucker's limbs, but he wouldn't die from it, unless it got infected. I tossed him a bandage and took a few steps back. Holy shit, you, you're the guy from Bastion. What do you want from me? the older guy asked. He half slurred his words from the morphine and half stuttered them out through god-awful pain. Please, don't kill me. 
I'll give you whatever you want. Calm down, asshole, I said. You're alive because I want you to be alive. You'd be dead if I wanted that. Use your fucking head. I just wasted a painkiller and bandages on you. Sit still or you'll be worse off. Did you kill them? He asked me as he tried to hold the bandages on the two holes in both of his legs. I watched as his eyes grew glossy from the opioid. My guards? Yeah. Sorry, not sorry. Look, I need to destroy your helicopter. No hard feelings. What? You, you can't do that. There are too few left. It's priceless, he pleaded, looked over his shoulder at the window that probably overlooked the bird. Yeah, don't care. I need to remove it from the equation. I'll fly it for you. I swear I'll do it. I don't care about them. They just protect me. If you protect me, I'll do whatever you need me to do. I already have a pilot, two, actually, and I trust the two of them a whole lot more than some rich dickface that's willing to switch sides to save his skin. Here's the deal. I don't want to kill you, but if you so much as move an inch, or if you contact the NVC within the five days after tonight, a man hiding in the woods will shoot you with a very big rifle. Morphine won't matter if he does that. You don't have enough bandages to plug the hole he'll put in you. Then, he'll set this house on fire and cook a hot dog. No warning shots, just fade to black and roll credits. You understand? He looked to the windows again and swallowed hard. I understand. He will kill you. Same goes for her. I put a thumb over my shoulder at the woman. Either of you so much as reach for a radio or a phone, or if we hear anything over the air, you both get plugged. Nothing personal. She cried when I said that. He did too. We understand, he finally said. Good. I'm sorry, really, I said. This is how we all get along, I added, then left. Part of me wanted to look for more booze. I went to the back of the house where the helicopter sat and used the halligan to pry open the engine covers. I smashed the shit inside to pieces with the fireman's tool, yanking out hoses and destroying anything I could pry out with the hook. I went to the tail rotor and beat the fucking thing like it owed me money, smashing apart two of the blades. That done, I pried the cockpit door open and went to town smashing everything inside as Kevin told me from cover I was safe and that the radio was silent. I did that for ten minutes, busting the canopy and every single gauge and dial. When I was finished, the chopper was unable to lift off and at best would need weeks' worth of work to get back to flying condition. Then Kevin's rifle went off, loud as fuck. It echoed through the valley below us. I froze, and it went off again. One of the massive windows on the side of the house behind me smashed apart, and I knew what had happened. They went for the radio, Kevin said. I told him I figured, and I got the fuck out after pilfering the dead guard's gear and ammo. I also grabbed a saw off the helicopter, plus all four cases of belted ammo. In his garage, I stole a four-wheeler to help me carry all the shit, and I drove right out the gate of his place after I opened it. I met up with Kevin on the road, and we got out. He rode bitch on the ATV all the way back to our ride. We drove the Prius to Spring Meadow as fast as we could on side roads, backseat covered in scotch, ammunition, a light machine gun, and rifles, and prayed to God that everyone who hit Spring Meadow earlier was safe. I felt like garbage, still do. I killed four people. I have no idea if they were good people or bad people. Just people in the way of me keeping my people safe. I'm sorry. Our Trojan horse attack has turned into a bit of a siege. The trick worked well enough for our people to get the jump on them, taking out their entire gate crew and seize their vehicles, negating their heavy weapon advantage. It should also be noted that taking the vehicles removes two of their radios as well. The initial minutes of violence were heavy, and losses stacked up on both sides quickly. Fortunately, our losses weren't nearly as heavy as theirs. Of course, that's like talking shit that you only lost four toes while they lost five. Three of their guys made it inside one of the houses with four hostages. The entire Cartwright family was taken captive in their house. 
You might remember Adeline Cartwright, the woman who stray shot the night the undead returned fucked things up. Hey, she tried. Her family. When Kevin and I got to Spring Meadow, our people were licking our wounds and taking cover while keeping the three NBC guys pinned inside the house they were in. We couldn't breach safely, and they weren't giving us anything to shoot at, so it was a standoff. Jinx Ferry be damned, we had them pinned with no radio. If they didn't have the cart rights, I would have said to let them starve or to burn the house down around them, fire in this instance being a very effective means of victory. But they did have the family, and there was no way I was going to let a mom, dad, and two young kids die if I could stop it. Hell, being held captive has to suck balls. As of right now, almost dawn on the 31st, I'm home, and the three NVC guys are still there. Kevin and I passed control of the situation back to them. We're communicating with them via a bullhorn, and given a few more hours, we'll get them out. Adam, guy from Texas, and Agnes are working them. The NVC guys don't want to die, and they know if they hurt the Cartwrights, they're dead meat. We're optimistic about it. I'm shocked Agnes is doing it. She lost Anders in the firefight, her husband. Man, tough. I am very numb to our losses right now. I'm focused heavily on trying to keep Michelle positive and held together. She's taking our losses far heavier than I am. It's all on her in her eyes. I've been there. I'm there right now. It's hell. Before Mazaki calls, I need to make a plan on what to do next and try to catch some shut-eye. But before I do that, I will list off our dead and injured. I'll mourn them more fully when my soul lets me. Dead. Texas Rich. Hector. Sarah Reynolds. Anders. Marigold Danvers. Dave Ward. New guy, the selfish one I didn't like. Turns out he wasn't all that selfish. Nell Turner, new woman. Joe Fleischman, another new kid, 19 years old. Mom worked at Old Navy. He was going to go to college before all this. Bliss Adams. Texas Colton, and three of our British refugees. All three of the Brits died and returned as zombies, but they were handled by the people around them. Thank God for that. There might be more dead than that. Probably is. That's my headcount for the moment. Injured. Quan, James, Ethan, Ollie, Eddie Smith, took a round to the thigh taking Spring Meadow. I chalked that up as karma for taking part in the execution before all this. Ray Bridge caught a round in the knee and might never walk again, assuming he keeps the leg at all. Alex, George would kill me if he knew Alex got shot. Blake, Celeste, Jimmy Viertrick, new kid that came with Tim the Magician, and three more Brits slash Europeans who were caught in the crossfire. That's 13 dead and 13 wounded. A general would look at those numbers and think, we're doing really well on casualties. I am not a general, and those numbers horrify me. I know those people, maybe not well, but I know them. I at least know Ethan and Joel and the few other nurses we have, and I see what they're doing to fix these people up. They're saving lives, and I'm out there taking them. Doesn't make sense. I guess killing other humans shouldn't. Shouldn't ever. Rack time. Then Mazaki calls, and we see what's next. We have to make a plan to hit them fast before they realize the factory, Spring Meadow, and their helicopter have all shit the bed on them. Won't be long before they're on to us. Still no sign of Picarillo. Adrian June 2014 June 2nd, 2014 just as we played them, they played us. Fucking cunt. Kevin and I are rolling out of here as soon as I can finish this. He's saying goodbye to Becky, Shelby, and Chloe, and I'm here writing this fucking journal, and scared as hell to say goodbye to my cat and to Michelle. I will. I don't have all the details, but here's the short version. Mazaki knew it wasn't Picarillo on the radio and took the time to prepare a full-scale assault on Bastion while we thought we had time to prepare to do it to him. 
while we were sitting at the radio waiting for him to call, making a plan to continue tearing them apart in small chunks, they hit us. Mid-morning. Fucker. We saw them coming on the security camera near the old burnt-out gas station. Two Bradleys, an up-armored HEMTT, the deuce and a half filled with troops, and four up-armored Humvees. If they drove like a bat out of hell up Auburn Lake Road, we had two minutes, five at the most, to get ready. Thank God Hal was on the monitors and paying attention. He came over the radios and started screaming that they were hitting us and we jumped. I wish we'd done something to lay traps in the road or something. Made some of those IEDs I talked about a long time ago. Might have helped. I don't remember much of the details. Our cameras filmed a lot of it, and if I live through the end of this, I'll go back and watch as much as I can stomach. It won't be much. We had a plan to defend our family and our home, and we put it to work without much discussion or thought. It's all just reaction, muscle memory. Kevin and I went to the AT-4s and took up positions apart from one another. He's the more experienced user of the weapon system, and he took the harder shot. Basic idea is to cut the lead vehicle off, then take down the furthest vehicle possible to jam the middle ones in. Pin them on the X. I took the first shot at the closest Bradley as it smashed through the outer gate and crossed the bridge barreling towards us, fifty cal on the top firing as fast as it could. The gun made mincemeat of the gate doors and shredded the gun towers we built. It took five seconds to undo five weeks of work. Luckily, we had no one in the towers when they hit us. I lifted up enough off the top of the berm, taking a knee, despite hearing their MK-19 grenade launchers firing at us. They shoot slower than the 50, with a much louder impact as the grenades go off. So fucking loud. Luckily, their early moments of fire were aimed at the gate and the two guard towers we built flanking the bridge, and we emptied all of those, save for a few wooden cutouts of saws and or 50 cals we placed as bait. Decoys for the win. Anyway, as 40 millimeter grenades soared overhead as thick as a swarm of bees into the depths of home, I fired my weapon straight into the front left quadrant of the Bradley's tracks. There's no foosh and rocket flying through the air with an AT-4. Just a loud fucking bang in your ear followed by the impact of the warhead on target almost instantaneously. My shot was like a foot low, hitting the ground and track at the same time. Had I hit flush, I might have killed the crew, but instead, all I did was disable the rig right in the middle of the bridge. The vehicles behind it came to a stop as the tank collided with our inner gate, blocking it shut. Two seconds later, Kevin launched his AT-4 at their last vehicle, one of the slow-rolling up-armored HEMTTs. His shot hit dead nuts and the middle of the truck exploded from the warhead. Something caught fire at the back and armed troops started jumping out of it and a deuce and a half right in front of it. Kevin's and my heavy weapons shots froze them, startled them, bought us a second. I screamed to open fire. Everyone we had on the wall opened fire. Right about the same moment everyone they had in the trees across the river did the same. Next few minutes are messy for me. I had my M4A1 and put rounds into the crowd of NVC on the bridge and beyond. I kept the gunner in the lead Bradley off his M2, eventually taking him out when he reached up to fire his weapon. I traversed the length of the bridge and shot anyone I saw moving. I hit most of the time, I think. I shot people who were shooting at us, and I shot more than a few people who were trying to get away or get to cover. Merciless. I had to be merciless. Just because you're running away doesn't mean you're not going to turn around and try to shoot me in a few seconds. You came here to kill. You knew the risk you took. Fuck you. Fuck all of you. For that, I am not sorry. Someone, Joel, I think, though it might have been Blake. No, I think Blake was in the infirmary hurt. I don't know who it was. Got a saw going right into the crowd of troops that dismounted from the deuce. Tore them right to shreds in ten seconds. While all that was going down, they had their shooters deep in the woods across the river, and they were taking selective shots at us. I heard more than a few snaps right over my little row of hair, and I had to displace more than once to keep whoever shooting at me guessing. I called out for someone, anyone, to try and take the cunts out in the woods, and over the radio, Abby said she was on it. I hadn't heard it in a long time, but that 270 I gave her came to life in the distance, loud, steady, and booming. 
She had an elevated shooting position from a window in Hall E. Maybe ten shots from her and the gunfire in the woods slowed down. Either she hit a few of them or got them to duck long enough to break their spirit for the fight. At that point, I remember looking over and seeing little Danny McGreevy Jr. ten feet away, the ginger reaper laying on his belly shooting his dad's rifle. I watched as the orange bangs hanging over his forehead shook with every recoil. He calmly tried to kill the people who came to hurt him and the few people he had left. Fucking teenager. So fucked. At that point, the driver of the deuce threw it into reverse as they quintupled their rate of fire to suppress us. He backed out and around the burning ATMTT and up and over the hill past Prospect Circle where Gilbert's house is. A dozen of their foot soldiers ran out as fast as they could to hitch a ride before he left them behind. As their Humvees continued to fire grenades deep into Bastion and along the berm wall keeping us down, they backed out too. Kevin said later that he threw grenades over the wall at them, and I know he fired a third AT-4 at them, taking out one of the Humvees. I didn't see the shot or the hit, but I heard the explosion and later on the ammo cooking off. I also heard the men and women inside the vehicle screaming for far too long. <sighs> When the world went quiet enough for everyone to hear me yelling cease fire, I called out for medical assistance to the wall and gathered a half dozen able-bodied shooters to check on the wreckage. As I did that, I got on the radio and let MGR, the factory in Spring Meadow, know that the NVC were headed back through after attacking us and that if they felt threatened, to call for help. I also told them to use the anti-tank weapons liberally. We don't have any anti-tank weapons anywhere but here, but the NVC didn't know that. I did this on a frequency the people fleeing could hear me on. We found eleven wounded NVC soldiers on the bridge in their vehicles and on the road. We found eighteen dead. None of the survivors wanted to fight, and we helped them. I put tourniquets on nearly severed limbs, put compression bandages on gushing gunshot wounds, and I know I saved at least three lives. Four. Definitely four. That felt good. Didn't make the reality of me having killed their people easier, but it was something. With the bridge secured, I took Kevin up and into the woods to scour for their shooters. After twenty minutes of looking around, we found piles of 762 and 3030 brass and smears of blood at multiple spots, but no bodies. I didn't want to pursue, so we headed back to help the wounded and figure out where to go from there. About then, Peter White came over the radio with gunfire in the background. Mike and Patty are plinking at them as they ride by. They're not engaging back. Oh, wait, they are, he said, and I heard a booming response in the distance. Just as he went dark, I heard him make that tongue-clucking noise, and I laughed. I shouldn't have laughed. Then, no joke, Kevin stops walking and asks, Is that the old fucker Pete White, the one you stationed at MGR from Virginia? I said, yeah. His face was crazy. He knew something about White. I need to get face time with him. He reminds me of... No, he's someone I know. I asked him who, and he said we'd worry about it later. It's later, and we haven't gotten around to worrying about it. We will. Later. Today is the 2nd of June. The weather is beautiful, and Bastion is blown apart. All of those grenades their MK-19s hurled over my head landed somewhere, and, good lord, the destruction is pervasive. Most of Hall A, administration, the medical clinic, and Hall E were hit by numerous grenades and 50 cal pass-throughs. In fact, the former staff offices, now the med clinic, and Hall A are, well, they need to be torn down. They're not salvageable. The window that Abby shot out of took at least 50 rounds during the fight, the sill is busted, the window is history, the walls are fucked. Gavin's crib took a dozen rounds. Thank God she put him in the basement. Many of the wounded from the other night are now more wounded or were downgraded from wounded to dead. More on my dead friends later. The remainder of campus took at least a hundred grenades. Roofs are fucked, doors and walls are fucked, and almost every single window is shattered. 
The gymnasium, cafeteria, and main school building were all hammered, too. Rounds landed all the way to the back end of Bastion, back where the NVC people were originally stored in staff housing. Generators took hits, vehicles took hits, the fucking barn almost burnt down. Our berm wall held up better than we could have hoped, and the back berm wall and gate did as well. Luckily, they didn't try to make it through the woods to hit us that way. It's harder to get to, but harder to defend as well. Fuck. Rebuilding. It'll be a year, if we can find the shit to do it with. Or the people to do it. James Halwitz died in the gun battle. Shrapnel, I think. He was in bed in the infirmary when a grenade went through a window. He was in bed next to Ollie, and Ollie died as well. Took a direct hit from something explosive. It took a long time for us to figure out the smears on the wall were him. That's how little there was left. Ollie. A few others died here during the fight, but beyond those two, it doesn't matter to me. I, I can't find enough sorrow for them, too, after James and Ollie. God, Melissa and the girls. Jesus, shit. Hawaii Dave died fighting on the wall, and his kid and wife were wounded. Archer, the kid with Downs, and Ginny, the older lady who kept up with him, were both killed in the fray. More. So many more. I'm most worried about Abby right now. When the NVC people passed by the apartments downtown, MGR took pot shots at the convoy. They drew 50 cal fire as a result, and if you know anything about that gun, you don't take cover from it unless you can get behind a boulder or a few houses. It just kills you. Patty and Mike shot from the roof at the armored Humvees with M4s and hunting rifles. When the 50s came back at them, they had no chance. Patty's dead. Mike's so fucked up he won't last more than a day or two unless a goddamn miracle happens. Joel's been picking concrete out of Mike's chest and face for hours, and there's no end. They shouldn't have shot at them. They, they just shouldn't have. I don't need to tell you how this is affecting Abby. She's... She's an orphan now. Mom and Dad, little brother too, stepdad is knocking on death's door. I'm about to be the only family she has left, and I'm preparing to march off to certain doom to give her, her man, and baby a better shot at a peaceful life. All I ever wanted was to give our kids a safe place to sleep at night and food to eat. Fuck. I'm crying. A dozen more are wounded. Michelle took something to the side of her head and nearly lost the top of her left ear. She's doing okay, but she's scared. I'm not going to bother listing everyone else off. I have to go. Kevin and I are headed north with Abby and Hal, plus old man Peter White and his two nephews. The four of us are going to try to hit Calendar Mountain in a way that will prevent them from ever doing anything like this to anyone else ever again. I don't know if we have enough power to get it done, but... We don't have much else in the way of resources to spare, and we have to do something. Everyone else is hurt or must stay behind to help protect the settlements if they're attacked while we're away. Wish the seven of us luck. We're gonna need it. I'm gonna go tell Michelle I love her dearly, tell her that this was the right thing to do, and tell her I'm proud of her, and I'm going to squish Otis until he claws me. I'm gonna kiss baby Gavin on the forehead and watch Abby's heart break as... She leaves him with Michelle while we do this. Then I'm going to see a Japanese man about some bad decisions he's made. Maybe he's about to say the same about a white guy. Adrian. June 5th, 2014. I just don't know. I hope what we did was enough because... Things have yet again taken a turn that I didn't see coming. Am I that blind to what's going on around me? Or are people being that deceptive? More on that later. Jesus, what a mess. I'm alive. I'm so tired, but alive. Kevin, Hal, Abby, Peter White, or so he said his name was, and the two guys he brought up from Virginia are all alive. We made it. No wounds, no deaths. We fought smart, barely fought at all. 
Shot a whole hell of a lot, blew some shit up, but didn't fight much. We jetted right after I wrote the above entry, Mr. Journal. After we pushed the disabled Bradley over the bridge with the snowplow and a tractor. Blake had to run the tractor with fucked up ribs because Ollie died. Still not over that. Won't be for a while. I can't stop thinking about Melissa and the girls. Two Humvees, seven souls heading north. Kevin asked me to make sure he and I were in the lead Humvee with Abby and Peter White. He wanted Hal with the other two for some reason. Once White got into the back seat, I knew what happened. Kevin turns in his seat next to me and looks at White. White nods at him and smiles but says nothing. Director Lancaster, Kevin says, flat as can be. White just grinned and nodded. Kevin, nice to meet you, officially, he says, and does the tongue cluck. Kevin had his Glock in his hand and his finger over the trigger the whole conversation, but get this, Lancaster White is the old manhandler at State that held Kevin's hand during the end of days as they departed Jerusalem and wound their way to Mildenhall in England. He helped get them around and is sort of responsible for Kevin being alive right now. Half the drive up, Lancaster explained why he was here and what he was doing. Turns out, that C-5 galaxy we saw flying one day, he was on board and landed at an airport a few hours away. His nephews aren't cops at all, they're army rangers, and his nieces are also military. Lancaster himself has Company Guy written all over him. That little Beretta? Just enough to do some people in the dark with. Lancaster is here to vet us. For a bigger project. I'll explain more after. Suffice to say, it was a mindfuck that he is who he is and that he isn't who he wasn't. Back to the story at hand. A frontal assault on them, like what they tried on us, was suicide. They had enough guns to turn back our meager assault from a good distance, and we had no idea what heavier shit they had. If they had AT-4s like we did, even worse. So that immediately went out the window. I also knew Mizaki wouldn't show his face for me to shoot it. He's a general. He tells other people how they're going to die for him. So hiding in the woods with a sniper rifle and hoping to take him out was a dumb idea. We didn't have that kind of time, and... God forbid they tried to mount another assault on us while we waited. We had to hit their infrastructure and their resources. We had to make it an impossible venture for them to even think about going at us or someone else. I wanted to do it in a way that would minimally affect their civilians. If all of what we heard about them was true, I didn't want to make them suffer for the transgressions of their respected leader anymore. That being said... This is war. Infrastructure targets I considered viable. Vehicles, fuel, food, roads, the bridge specifically, military-aged and uniformed people, electricity generators and power lines, communication equipment and weapons and armories. I was on the fence about food, and we crossed it off. We had three AT-4s, a handful of grenades, Gasoline, supplies for Molotov cocktails, and some leftover Semtex with detonators they brought from overseas. That's the most powerful tool in the box. Now, we knew they'd be hopped up on security. They had to be after what happened to them, and after what they sent Picarillo to do. Lancaster's boys were armed with similar gear, and, most notably, they handed us four thermite grenades. So sneaking in or up would be a serious task. We'd need the cover of darkness to do anything, and perhaps better yet, we'd need the cover of chaos. We had to sow discord to disable their ability to defend all their locations all at once. We had to trick them into thinking they were being hit by a massive force that they couldn't defend against. We drove a lot of miles out of way to stay out of their line of sight. We drove almost an hour north and an hour to the west before heading east and south to the vicinity. It stood to reason they'd be defending harder south. We hit two locations simultaneously because we reasoned they'd be soft. Rick Talbot's house and Talbot Labs. We set that shit on fire like it was our fucking job and then dissolved into the woods a few miles west of Calendar Mountain. We drove the Humvees far into the woods until they were entirely invisible, 
and used that site as a base of operations to strike out from. About then, we heard over their radio channels that they saw the fire and knew what burned. Someone higher up made the call to not respond. Over the next couple of hours, the fires didn't draw any of their forces away, which sucked. With scoped rifles from a quarter mile away, we watched one Humvee eventually head out with maybe five souls on board. No radio traffic to say what for. I thought it was conspicuous, though, that they sent just one vehicle to do anything. I'd never want to roll out alone, especially like that. Oh, and we totally saw that they had two armored Humvees blocking the interior end of their bridge, and they had armed guards on the outer edge of the bridge. No chance of an easy approach, and we could see that multiples of their guards had binoculars and were actively looking for attackers. When night came, we watched them with our night vision equipment and saw they couldn't see us. Their radio chatter was nervous, but they verbalized that they couldn't see shit. Idiots. Kevin and I hiked north for a mile or two before crossing the road and getting down into the riverbed their bridge crossed. The water was high, it's been a pretty rainy month at night, and we were able to either float or wade through the water to stay out of view. As we departed, Lancaster did the same with his men heading south. From the opposite mountainside, Hal and Abby called us clear to move on the special operations comms, and we were able to get to the base of their bridge. They never expected anyone to hit the bridge. It was their best protective feature, not a target in their mind. As Talbot Labs continued to burn over the top of the ridge, lighting the distant sky with orange and red, I helped Kevin set a half dozen charges of Semtex on two bridge supports. We floated down river a mile or so before cutting back across and setting up a southern shooting position far from Abbey and Hal. Lancaster and his two men were set up south of the town at a third location with their own agenda. I'll never forget the little toenail of a moon in the sky above. I don't know why, but the image of that white sliver above as we ran and hid soaking wet, scared shitless and exhausted, will stick with me forever. Kevin and I set up near the condo complexes that they took over and filled with their inner circle flunkies. Far from the core of the resort and the bulk of the security, we knew it was a soft target, especially at range. Plus, if we hit it, we might draw out another vehicle or two we could hit. It worked. We called out to Lancaster, and he and his two boys started to shoot the generators, transformers, and any guards they saw in their AO. They all had M4A1s, just like Kevin and me, and they had suppressors to keep their location under wraps. It's fun when your friends bring toys. Kevin and I started to take shots at the few guards we saw, some shots suppressed, others not for shock value, and blew out some generators and transformers, too. Kill shots on people, I should say. No fucking around. I couldn't see what color uniforms they wore through the green-colored NVGs, but if they had a weapon or if they wore what looked like helmets, fatigues, or body armor, I shot at them. I pretended like I was playing siphon filter and I needed to rack up the high score on a night level. I probably killed six people, shot at least ten. Shot at three times that. Fucking terrible. That done, we displaced and moved through tree cover to another condo complex and repeated. Mind you, we shot from the woods, deep behind cover where we were entirely hidden, and we did it in the dark. We might as well have been ghosts swooping in and slashing souls away. They had no chance, even when they started opening fire randomly into the world. Their cries for help over their radios ramped up and grew in intensity as their wounded became more and more critical. When the cries became too much, Mizaki himself came on and ordered for help. Abby and Hal pounced. As the two Humvee QRF wound its way around the Jersey barriers they had on the bridge, Abby and Hal called out to Kevin, and Kevin blew the Semtex. We were like a mile away, maybe, and the explosion was loud enough to feel in our chest. Crazy powerful, just like when we dropped the two parking garages when I went to the city looking for Cassie. The bridge didn't collapse, but it did shift, causing three feet of the road surface to buckle and fall away. One of the Humvees steered into the crack that opened and smashed against the barriers blocking the way out. In a genius and ballsy, borderline idiotic move, Hal got one of the AT-4s up and running and somehow managed to send the warhead straight into the second Humvee to the rear, 
blowing out the motor and shutting the entire bridge down without doubt. Well, at least until they cleared the two busted-ass vehicles off of it, patched the hole we made, and declared it safe to drive over. Hal and Abby had to displace, as his shooting the AT-4 gave away their position. They took heavy small arms fire as they evaded to a second firing position across the mountainside under concealment. From there, we maneuvered in the dark to a better vantage point, where we could see the interior of the Calendar Mountain facility enough to take shots at anyone moving. As Kevin and I took up shooting positions a few dozen yards apart, Lancaster and his crew hoofed it north to do the same, and Abby and Hal picked up a third shooting location after a half-hour ruck. Within an hour, all seven of us were in hidden locations, taking long-distance pot shots at anyone and anything we saw. Some shots were suppressed, others not. We had become the ultimate force multipliers and managed to pin the entire place down. Listening to their radio chatter about us was one of the best feelings ever. We'd put them on their knees. Then, as dawn approached, after hours and hours of us putting it to them, Mazaki pipes up. Attacking forces, please identify yourself. This is General Mazaki of the Northern Valley Cooperative. I grabbed my handset off my hip and got to talking. Hey, prick, it's Adrian Ring. Mr. Ring, this escalation of force is dramatic and unfounded. Many people have been hurt or killed tonight needlessly. We need to bring this to an end. I laughed. That was the point of weeks of preventative diplomacy, asshat. Remember when we discussed terms, signed your bullshit papers, then you sent that Italian prick down to kill or capture one of my friends because he was British? Remember sending troops without our asking for it? You recall doing that? Your chance for a better way was then. Now we do it my way. Adrian, the world has changed since we agreed to those terms, and I had to make difficult decisions. I had to think of what was best for the NBC and its people. And I for mine, especially in the wake of your expansionistic colonial aggressive ways. You're a fucking liar, Mazaki. We'll have to agree to disagree. Things have changed now that the dead have returned to life yet again. How do we resolve this in the here and now? Focus on what's important. He was angry. I could hear it in how he hissed at me. I remained calm and let my patience irritate him. Let's start with me telling you how this'll go. Let's not do that, he said, interrupting me. Let's start peaceful, equal discourse. I stopped being calm. Kiss my ass, you ignorant, backstabbing prick. Fucking listen to me. I have friends dead on slabs right now because you couldn't fucking be patient and trusting and allow for someone else to manage their shit. So you will fucking listen or this peaceful discourse ends and I keep blowing your shit up and killing your people until they're all dead. Tell me if that's important to you. Silence. So I continued. You're going to tell everyone who lives with you that they can walk. I know people are in your wire that don't want to be there, people relocated by force. The Wilson family is missing four people, and I expect to hear that they're moving out. You're done heading south. You're done with Spring Meadow, the factory, MGR, and Bastion. If any of your fucking people come within five miles of any of my people armed, I will be back up here in the worst way imaginable. You and your fucking settlement here are done patrolling beyond your doorstep, done securing other people's shit, and done expanding. Got that? I'm listening, Mizaki said back. You fucking better be. I want you to know that we took all the vehicles and all the heavy guns you had at Bastion, the factory, and Spring Meadow. We have all those guns and all that ammo and plenty of people able and willing to use them. We also have a lot more of the heavy weaponry you've gotten a taste of, and we will not hesitate to use it. You guys are shoot on sight right now with no exceptions. Oh, and your pilot ate a 300 wind mag and we set that fucking helicopter on fire. Adrian, there has to be a different... Shut the fuck up, Mazaki. I'm done negotiating. Somewhere, someone on my team shot at one of their dudes. We technically never called a ceasefire. 
Mazaki, there are kids at both of our places. Kids, dude. Parents. Moms and dads who want to raise their children in peace and safety. We had that before you fuckers came around, and you fuckers ruined it for us. Dozens dead and wounded, orphans everywhere. I won't have a single death happen again by your hands, or by God, I'll fucking end you with my bare hands. That's a hollow threat, he said back to me, almost laughing. Motherfucker, I ended the apocalypse. What makes you think I can't end you? I dropped a microphone right around Ben, and I think he did too, because he didn't say anything back. In my ear, over the special operations comms, I heard Lancaster. Adrian, they are not in contact with any actual federal forces. I know they said they were, but they aren't. I would know, because there are damned few of them left. Put him in his place. So I did. And don't even tell me you're a good guy here. You're not in charge of shit beyond that fucking river you're hiding behind. The feds you claim to be coordinating with? Not even a real story, and I know people who are connected. You're blustering and you're bullshitting, and now it's time to eat your shit sandwich and lick your wounds, you unsanitary fuck. You all stand down? Stop shooting at my people, leave town, and never come back. We'll be watching you, Mizaki. Halfway. Every way you could come. If you want to talk to us, you send Thorpe and only Thorpe. And rest assured, if we see you doing anything we don't like, we'll be back here with a hundred more shooters, and we'll kill everyone we see moving. I'll burn this place down on top of you. Got a burning desire to make more orphans, do you? He jabbed. At least I'll take care of the kids after. Give them food, water, clothes, and an education. What the fuck was your plan, rolling in with grenade launchers and machine guns to a fucking school? Look around. You see any kids hurt tonight? I gave him a second. I didn't think so. I'm done talking to you. Make your decision and you can either be a good fucking example of how it's done right, or a horrible fucking warning to every other cocksucker out there. We sat in the woods until dawn, watching them through our scopes, and not one person moved behind their wall. I guess Mazaki made his decision. I gotta sleep. Lots to talk about, Lancaster mostly. He made us a pretty interesting offer that I am... <sighs> frightened by. Michelle's pretty happy with how it ended. It could have dragged out and been far worse, but... It might not be. Assuming, of course, that ball-scratching ass-eater does what he needs to do to keep a lid on this. <sighs> Crashing hard. Before I go, I'm scared to sleep. The last few hours of sleep I've stolen, I've been left alone in. Just me. Alone. But now I'm afraid I'll dream of the friends I just lost. After all, right now, once more... The dead are all we can dream of. At least, it's all I can dream of. Otis is happy to see me, though he wouldn't stop rubbing up on Michelle. I think he senses her anxiety over it all and just wants to comfort her. When I wake up, we burn the bodies of our friends, pick up the rubbish left from war, and try to figure out what comes next. Adrian June 7th, 2014 I feel so much better. A few meals and a decent night's rest works wonders on the psyche. My dreams were still empty of others, and for that blessing, I'm thankful. I stole a few minutes here to write about some shit. I need to get back outside and get to work helping everyone get Bastion cleaned up. Yesterday, and for what seems like forever, we burned and buried our dead. I say buried because we held a service and buried what remained of Ollie deep beneath the grounds he loved here so much. Melissa felt it was important that he be returned to the land. Martin, who took a round to the leg during the assault, built a simple casket for the man that fed us for so long, and every single person who could make it to the service did. We buried him six feet to the side of where Gilbert is, fitting for him to be there. It's where we bury our heroes now, it appears. Maybe one day I'll figure out how to be a good enough man to earn my rest in that yard. 
Maybe they deserve cleaner earth to lie in, too. God, I miss my friends. I need a break from this. It's hard to type with eyes filled with tears, but I can't. I need to finish and get back. I need to hug Michelle and Abby and Hal and Gavin and Kevin and Caleb and Sophie and little Adam. Lancaster, I need to write about him. He is a freelance operative that is in connection with several of the groups that are trying to reassemble the United States or something that resembles it. A very, very fractured United States. He's in contact with a few of the bunkers in the Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland area, and he's done a lot to unify the survivors in them. A few senators, cabinet members, high-ranking military officers, etc. I guess the president and vice president are history, or at least so far off the grid from his people, they might as well be dead. Anyway, these people are doing a pretty good job of getting things down that way back in order, and they've managed to rebuild some infrastructure. A few power plants are back up and running, some water treatment facilities are doing their job again, roads are being cleared, and peace and security are actually working in a few spots. I'm not going to say they're the future, or the U.S. will return to its former glory, but it's a start. Furthermore, the groups he's been working with knew about Michelle, Kevin, and me, like, in detail. Just like the others who came, the pilgrims in the night, many of them had dreams and knew or at least had a good idea of who we were and what we've done. Lancaster, who knew Kevin through his time at the State Department, volunteered to make the trip up to vet the three of us and our little slice of blown-to-shit heaven. They don't have an army yet. They have managed to secure a bunch of naval and air assets, though, which would have been nice to bring to the NBC, but I'll take what I can get. So why vet us? The Trinity did what it needed to do here. We're just regular, ordinary people now. We have to be. I can't handle the idea of still being a part of that. As it turns out, the refugees from Europe and other places are landing everywhere. A few planes have made the flight here, and more than a few boats, just like the one that brought our little crew of strangers in, too. Thousands of refugees, tens of thousands of people who have brought the plague of undeath back with them. And you see, the people returning here know it's hell on earth back there, millions of undead, but what's crazy is we can't talk to them. Ham radio, cell networks, landlines, nothing. The parts of the world still overrun by the dead are sealed off electronically, spiritually, however. In order to see what's going on there, we have to go there. And the shit the Brits brought with them? It's taking root again. It's faster, more aggressive. Down along the East Coast and over in California, to a lesser degree, foreigners are coming because they've heard the Americas are safe and they're bringing the very thing with them they're trying to flee. Random undead roam the streets again, and settlements that thought they were safe are succumbing to sickness and injuries. One dead body in the middle of the night turns into a hundred zombies, and I've already talked about how our dreams are fucked up again. Lancaster came to vet us because they want the three of us to go to Europe. They think because we were able to end the bullshit here, we'll be able to end the bullshit there. Michelle, Kevin, and I listened to his impassioned, gruff appeal and asked a hundred questions and told him hours of shit that he didn't know about. In the end, everyone left the table here in Hall E far more informed about the world. Oh, and he says my little brother William is alive and his ship is in touch with his group. Crazy happy to hear that if it's true. Caleb and Becca both busted out crying when they heard that news. Michelle thought the idea of heading to Europe was the best idea. If we were the Trinity once, held with the responsibility of the fate of a third of the world, then really, how could we possibly still be the people chosen if we chose to ignore the plight of the rest of the world? Wouldn't we just, in fact, be allowing others to suffer so we could survive more easily? Wasn't that kind of the point of it all? be a better society and culture and to help others as much as we can? Forgive, forget, move on, yada yada? Shit. I need to remember that myself. Kevin said no. He had enough fighting, but if I wanted to go, he'd think about it. 
Then they looked at me. I said I couldn't. Not right then. Not yet. Bastion is a wreck. Dozens of dead and injured and more bruised souls than a world deserves to suffer. It's hell here right now, and I can't leave these people. I told Lancaster that if he could arrange for help to come to Bastion, I'd consider it more strongly, but right now it was a no. I'd like to see my brother, though. Crazy, right? Go over there and do it all again? Hell no. There's no way I'm leaving here. No way I'm walking away from the few friends and family I have left. I just can't. I stopped crying. I'm good. I need to get back at it. We're trying to get Hall A and the medical clinic cleaned out and demolished today. We're hoping to save the foundations so we can build on them again. Maybe even build bigger. Another story for more people. Talk to you soon, maybe. I need to focus on working, not writing. I'm not the scribe anymore, and I'm certainly not the soul. I've got shit to do. Adrian Just Me The early June afternoon warmed his soul as Adrian departed the blasted dorm he called home. The sun was warm, the breeze moved with a gentle caress that flicked the growing green leaves, and if he didn't think about what happened just a few days before, or look over at the lazy columns of smoke that grew up from the charred remains of his friends and fellow citizens, the world was perfect. On all sides, activity bubbled. The sounds of power tools buzzed away as wood was cut, holes were drilled and concrete mixed. He watched as children picked up sharp chunks of debris at the base of buildings that were shot through with massive weapons of war, and he watched how they laughed and looked away from the scars the adults left on their home. He didn't recognize some of the kids. New faces that came in over the spring had yet to become familiar. Some had already come and gone, all in the name of standing near the Trinity. He looked ahead to the tattered, scorched skeleton of Alpa's Hall A. The side of the dorm facing the river had been obliterated by incoming enemy fire. The NVC's 40 millimeter grenade barrage had eaten away at the siding, framing and interior walls until the interior lay exposed. The floors were blown up and out, and the roof hung sideways, crushing down the side of the dwelling like the sagging, muted face of a stroke victim. On the campus side of the ruined home, a dozen men and women worked diligently to clean up the wreckage. Adrian's eyes plucked Michelle's dirty but golden hair from the crowd, and he made his way to her, smiling and thanking everyone as he wound his way between them. They looked to him with appreciation and near reverence. He tried to ignore it. Hey, babe, welcome back. How was your break? Did you eat something? Michelle asked him. Good. I ate a can of something that might have been a vegetable once. I got some writing done, too. Adrian said and kissed her on the cheek. The small gesture of love was one of the few they'd exchanged in recent memory. The two had grown distant as the outer strife pushed on them. The pushing had abated. I'm proud that you're writing again, that is. I think you do better with stress when you're venting it like that. You're different. I like it. You're also excited to hear about your brother, she smiled. I am. I'm glad William is well, and, uh, are you saying you didn't like me as much when I wasn't writing? Adrian joked, stepping in behind her and wrapping his big arms around her midsection. He felt great love for her. They had survived the Northern Valley Cooperative, and their people, their way of life, didn't break in the process. She leaned into his warmth, and others watched. Shush, there are some heavy things here. We are waiting for you to lift them, what with you being so big and all. You know, I'm more than just a big guy. I can think heavy things sometimes, too. I remember this one time I thought about stuff. It was amazing. Adrian kissed her head and let her go. She held a moment longer, and he walked towards the dorm where his friend Kevin stood beside his older brother Caleb and the white-haired man named Lancaster. Ugly, Kevin greeted Adrian. Stupid, Adrian responded to him. How we doing? I see you guys got that roof part ripped off. I assume you got the backhoe going then? Yeah, Caleb responded. 
I talked to Blake, and he walked me through it. I mean, I wouldn't want to run the thing around a house that we didn't want destroyed, but I think we're all set to tear this place down. Awesome. Thank you. What's the plan after this? Kevin asked. If you think we can spare the manpower, I'd like to rotate into the patrols on the interstate. You think they're going to come at us? Adrian asked his best friend. Already? I would if it were up to me. Kevin's right, a dirty-faced Lancaster said. If they can solve the bridge and get their remaining vehicles down here, I'd sit a few thousand meters back and shell your settlements with their grenade launchers. If they have an 81-millimeter mortar or, shit, just a 61-millimeter, they could stick and move on you for a whole day before you could get back at them. It'd be devastating. I hate you people, Adrian said, kicking a busted piece of siding on the ground. I really thought I scared the shit out of Mazaki with my threats. Am I just not that scary? I'll never sleep with such paranoid people around me. You know I'm right, Kevin said, and Lancaster is too. We're only still here because we actually scared them away for a few minutes or because they're taking the time to rally for a second massive assault. Something like he said, something long-range. You know, we need to talk to Rodriguez and see if he knows about mortars or anything like artillery. And we need to get his wife and the rest of the junkyard people here somehow. Hey, Michelle, Adrian called to the woman who led them, and she left the side of Sylvia, who sprinted off to be helpful somewhere else. Adrian smiled at the girl's back. She'd come so far since they found her, stealing from their stores and feral as a barn cat. Yeah? Michelle asked. Kevin and Lancaster here both think we should be patrolling heavier north, in case the dick faces decide to retaliate. I know we need to dedicate manpower here for the cleanup, but they're right. You okay with freeing up, like, five or six people to head out that way? Kevin, is that enough? He thought about it and nodded. Yeah, I think about six people would work. Two vehicles in tandem, maybe make a showing if we see any of their people. Any chance your contacts down south can help? Kevin asked Lancaster. He clucked his tongue. I'm working on it. Larry and Gina headed south on two of our horses this morning to try and get within radio range. They're going to ask for a rededication of assets to here, but who knows? They've got their own fires to fight, and resources are slim. Adrian sighed. We need to meet up with Captain Maria. She's good people, and I think we could get some support from her if she finds out the NVC got their nose bloodied by us. Anyone remember when we were supposed to meet with her again? Take the people, Michelle said. If they try and attack us again, there will have been no point in cleaning all this up anyway. I'll talk to Rodriguez and see if he's willing to share information about those guns you just talked about. I think he will. As far as Maria goes, I don't remember. We can send a missive soon. Hey, do we think it might be a good idea to relocate? Temporarily. Find a different place to move the whole group for a few weeks? Just until we're sure this'll pass over? That's a lot of work, Adrian said after exhaling some unsure feelings. I think it sends the wrong message, too. That we went to war, lost a lot of people, arguably won, and then we still have to leave like refugees. These people are hurt, but they're proud. We fought the big guy and sent him away with a fat lip. We can't skulk around now. Stand proud, act like winners, and be ready for another hit. What do you two think? She asked Lancaster and Kevin. I think Abby needs to churn out a few of her newsletters, Kevin said. We need good news right now alongside a dose of reality. She's found her voice if we can get her to write again. Could be helpful, Lancaster added. I'll talk to her. It might be tough with Mike and Patty gone. She's been off. Angry, Michelle said. Angry is not off for Abby, Adrian quipped. Ha, huh, funny. But thank you for the ideas. Kevin, do what you gotta do. I trust your gut. It has served us well in the past. Adrian, could you... A distant boom sounded, and a split second later a snap broke the air between the chatting men and women. Shoot her! Adrian barked and dove for the ground. Everyone around went down to the dirt around him. The vicious buzz of the bullet cutting through the air told him the projectile had been aimed for the group that stood together. His primitive brain told him the shot came from across the river beyond the bridge, through the ruined gate and past the cleared forest that gave no cover to approaching enemies. 
He drew his pistol and kept low behind the ruins of the dorm. I'm okay, Kevin said as he drew his Glock. Everyone else, sound off. Let's get some people to the top of the berm for suppressing fire. I'm fine, Adrian said as he kept low and looked from person to person for wounds or dead bodies. I'm good, Lancaster said as he palmed his small Beretta. Several other voices called out. Frightened, they called out that they were safe and sound. One voice was absent. Adrian spun on his stomach and searched for Michelle. She lay on her back only a few feet away, clutching at a bright red stain spreading out beneath the palms of her hand. The center of the blood emanated from just below her ribs. Adrian's heart and brain froze as he watched her chest rise and fall in uneven stutters. She looked straight up to the bright blue sky and the wisps of clouds, paying no mind to her worldly surroundings or her plight. Bile rose in Adrian's throat, and he crawled, scrambled madly to her side. Let me see, he said, looking into her eyes as he pried her hands away from the wound. He looked down from her lethargic face and watched as a pool of blood formed on her flat tummy. He put her hands back on the wound and pressed hard as his eyes overflowed with tears. He grabbed her free hand and pushed it down hard. Medic! Adrian bellowed. She nodded, her head uncoordinated, moving around as if she were connected by only a dream. Adrian? She whispered. Shh, save your strength. You're hurt. Bad. I know. She whispered at him, smiling. Her other hand reached up and brushed his cheek, leaving a bright red smear of blood. She frowned at the mark she left, then smiled as if she remembered something sweet and nostalgic. Honey? Adrian? Go. No. He pressed harder on her stomach and looked around feverish to find someone to help, anyone with help. You have to save them. They can't help themselves all the time. They'll be okay. Go. Just go. Come back when you're done, she said and smiled. When her mouth closed, blood welled out from the corners and she coughed. No, I'm staying right here, the man said through gritted teeth and a sob that made him drop his pistol in the dirt. I'll be fine, she said after coughing a thick wad of blood into the air. Take care of this, promise me. I'll be here when you're done. Something in Adrian's head clicked. I'll go. Yeah, I promise. I'll take care of the shooter. Press hard here, hard as you can. Good start, she sighed. Michelle nodded and put her second hand on the wound. Adrian felt her press down, and it wasn't nearly hard enough. He snatched his pistol up and looked to the closest person, little Danny McGreevy. The teenager watched Michelle bleed out through his own tear-filled eyes. Danny, please help. Press here, Adrian pleaded as another shot zipped by overhead. Somewhere, a shooter on Bastion's side started to fire back. They had no target, but bullets out at least felt good. The red-headed boy nodded and crawled over. After wiping his eyes free of tears, he crawled over and put his entire upper body's weight on Michelle's midsection. She looked up from the blood-soaked dirt with marvel and love as he aided her. She struggled to breathe as another shot snapped by just a foot above their heads. It impacted a metal light pole a few yards away and made a hollow pinging noise. Adrian, Kevin said as he readied the M4A1 he grabbed from a stone bench nearby. There's one shooter, one gun, one angle of fire. We'll cover you. You grab a vehicle and blast over the bridge, then move into the forest. We'll get a few shooters up right behind you. I think I know about where the shots are coming from. That fucking gray boulder on the hill we talked about a year ago. It's the only cover out there. Adrian didn't even respond to Kevin. He leaned over Michelle and kissed her on the head. I love you. I'll be right back. I know, she said.
Adrian got to his feet and bolted. He ran as another heavy slug tore through the air and perforated his khaki pants through the pocket. As he ran, Kevin and Lancaster fired blindly through the gate and over the berm wall into the forest at the shooter that had them pinned down. The big man with the strange haircut ran deeper into the campus towards the parking lot that flanked the cafeteria. He knew the school's vans were there with the keys in them. They had been using them to move debris all morning. He ran to the driver's side of the first vehicle he came to and ripped the door open. He jumped into the seat of the retired school bus and turned the ignition. The vehicle lumbered twice, then came to life, sputtering as all their cars seemed to now. With pistol in hand, he yanked the column shifter down to D3 and floored it. The sluggish van steered around the road that circled the center of Bastion and launched towards the turn to the gate and the bridge that crossed the river that protected them from the undead for so long. As he made the turn for the bridge, the windshield blossomed as the shot passed through the center of it. The spiderwebbed glass obscured his view, and he ducked out of instinct. All he had to cover was a few hundred yards. He saw the boulder and aimed the van up the road to reach a spot where he could launch into the open area they'd cleared of trees and brush. He had to get close. He had to use the vehicle as cover. He'd never cover the distance between on foot fast enough. Incoming gunfire grew in intensity and the windshield disintegrated from a dozen entry holes. Michelle's face flashed in his mind's eye and he willed the vehicle to go faster. He had to get back to her. He promised. Another round smashed the front of the vehicle, piercing the hood with a loud thunk. Adrian yanked the wheel to the right and sent the beaten van into the uneven terrain. The right front tire blew out immediately and the van listed to the side, threatening to pull him down the gentle slope of the hill towards the river. He fought hard with both hands to steer the wheels towards the boulder that the shots were coming from and keep it on four wheels. A low stump hidden in the grass stopped his drive hard and Adrian smashed into the busted windshield. The world went black for a second, then came back into sharp, vivid focus. He watched the wind twist a distant branch and smelled something sweet in the air. Get going, he tripped, Michelle said to him from the passenger seat. Adrian looked over to her, utterly confused and lost. What? How did... Go, get him now so he doesn't hurt anyone else. A smiling, unhurt Michelle prodded from the faux leather seat beside him. The world dimmed again and Adrian found himself stumbling through the grasses and mushrooms of the forest edge, gun in hand. Trees ahead would give who he pursued a chance to duck and cover, and in his addled state he held on to the idea that he had to stop whoever shot at them right now. A man wearing fatigues popped up out of a depression and snapped off several shots with a pistol at Adrian. Adrian's side erupted in a flare of white-hot pain, but being shot wasn't enough to stop him. He saw the man, knew his caliber. He had his number. Picarillo, Adrian bellowed and raised his kimber with both hands. He pulled the trigger twice as he walked and watched as the man who'd shot his love and shot him too crumpled back into the depression and out of sight. Adrian approached the fallen man as the pain in his side grew hotter, bigger, and began to throb. Stars swam in his field of vision as he tried to focus on the front post of his weapon. No. God, no. Not like this. Fuck! Piccarillo muttered through pain in the ditch. Adrian crested the top of the natural trench and looked down at the man. Both of Adrian's shots hit center mass. The bastard was covered in his own blood. No, God, Adrian spat, his chest heaving, as he pointed his weapon down at the fallen man. Picarillo jerked and raised his gun hand up to aim at Adrian. Adrian fired once more into the man, striking his shoulder and rendering the arm useless. The man's pistol dropped. Fuck you, Picarillo squeaked as he gasped in agony. Then his motions slowed and his head leaned back into the earth. He looked up to the sky the same way Michelle did. God, please help me. Look up. Look at me. No God here, no God, just me, Adrian growled. I thought you, you were supposed to be the good guy, Picarillo said, then laughed weakly. 
I am, or maybe I was, Adrian said, and shot the man in the face. Adrian turned and looked down the small hill opposite Bastion as his hands spasmed, clenching the grip of his pistol in one hand and the air in the other. Inside the distant earthen wall that bordered the river and protected them somewhat from the attacks that just struck them, he saw thirty, maybe forty men and women standing around where Michelle had fallen. None looked on at any who rendered aid. They looked at a dead body. Lancaster and Kevin walked up the hill, guns in hand towards a bleeding, disconsolate Adrian Ring. Adrian's pistol hand had fallen to his side where the gunshot was and pressed against it. The pain grew, flared, and ate away at him. His entire body ran a river of sweat, and he felt the weakness returning. His legs were about to betray him. Brother, a frightened Kevin said to Adrian, you okay? Adrian tore his eyes away from the group of mourners inside the wall and looked at Kevin. Just like he was, Kevin cried. Talk to me, please. How bad are you hit? Kevin asked, taking another dangerous step towards the wounded animal of a man. I'll live, Adrian said. She died. Yeah, Kevin said, his voice cracking as tears ran down his cheeks. I'm so sorry. Let me get you to Joel. You're hit pretty bad. Yeah, Adrian said, succumbing to his grief. He dropped his pistol and fell to a crouch, covering his face with his hands and smearing his own blood on the cheek opposite the one Michelle had smeared hers on. Lancaster and Kevin watched as Adrian fell apart. The shattered man dropped to his knees and cried for minutes, long enough for ignorant clouds to pass above and long enough for the birds to talk to one another about whatever it was the things of nature did. Maybe they talked about him. When he was ready, Adrian reached into the dirt and grabbed his pistol with filthy, bloody, crusted fingers. He looked at the pistol, the thing of murder, for a long time, then up at Lancaster with reddened, weary eyes. Yes? Lancaster asked. You're up, huh? Adrian asked through a grimace. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation of The Last Resort, Adrian's March, Part 2, Adrian's Undead Diary, Book 10, written by Chris Philbrook, performed for you by James Anderson Foster, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Copyright 2018 by Chris Philbrook. Production Copyright 2019 by Chris Philbrook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.